Her First Last Dance by Melanie Jacobson. Narrated by Lorena Hoops. Audio copyright 2022. Chapter 1. No Way. No Way. Tessa watched the tall guy coming through the lobby doors into the BBMJ Industries foyer, a space as bland as the company name. It was Ethan Bedford, but Ethan 2.0. She ran a quick eye over him before he noticed her. She'd been expecting him, of course. She was the one who'd recruited Ethan to join her engineering team at BBMJ which was why she was waiting in the lobby to welcome him to his first day on the job. But she hadn't expected him to have changed so much in six years. She hadn't seen him since they'd graduated from the grueling Georgia Tech Mechanical Engineering Program. And, wow, those six years had been very good to him. He wasn't any taller, thank goodness because he was already a few inches over six feet. But his gawky frame had filled out, and he'd traded the college hoodie and mesh basketball shorts he'd practically lived in for a crisp blue-checked button-down shirt and gray work slacks. His perpetually shaggy dark hair had been tamed with a professional haircut, but his smile was exactly the same when his warm brown eyes finally found her. Tessa? Oops, she hoped her ogling hadn't been too obvious. Ethan! She hurried forward to meet him with a hug, a short, friendly one like the dozen they'd shared before. But even that short contact was enough to tell her that his bony angles had been majorly upgraded with layers of hard muscle. Whoa, talk about a system redesign. So good to see you. She stepped back so she didn't give the receptionist or security guard anything to wonder about. You really should have called me when you got in last night. I could have treated you to dinner or helped you unload. This morning, he corrected her. I got in close to one, threw a sleeping bag down on the floor, and crashed. She winced. I feel so bad for dragging you in without more time to settle, but we kind of don't have a choice. Don't feel bad at all. Six hours of sleep is plenty for me. I'm ready to jump in. Great. She pivoted and led him to the receptionist's desk. Sign in here. Let's get you cleared, and I'll bring you in to meet the team. The receptionist handed Ethan his security badge, and Tessa immediately shepherded him through the first secure door. I can't believe how efficient you are here. It took forever to onboard at my last job, he said, hitching his nylon messenger bag over his shoulder and hurrying after her. She approved the choice. Canvas might look better, but it was so impractical. She slowed slightly while he caught up. You sound surprised. I guess I shouldn't have been after how quickly the office processed everything this week, but I got kind of nervous when I pulled in. She smiled as his voice trailed off, a mannerism that she remembered well. He'd often done that right when he was on the verge of saying something too blunt. In a graduating cohort of mostly male engineers, he was one of the few who seemed to sense that sometimes there were more diplomatic ways to say things. Let me guess, the flagship BBMJ campus doesn't look like the headquarters of the leading manufacturing and design outfit in North America? Well, no. Her smile widened. To the uninitiated eye, the company's site looked like a half dozen bland stucco and glass buildings, like a thousand other business parks in any town USA. They save all the bells and whistles for the research and design facilities in the secure parts of the complex. Visualize the buildings you saw when you drove up, 
and then picture them going three times as deep underground. It'll take you a little longer to get access to the more secure buildings, but trust me, BBMJ is far more impressive behind steel doors. She was glad for the small talk. Maybe it would cover up the fact that she was still off balance from Ethan's reappearance. Or rather, just Ethan's appearance. The hair, the clothes. Not that his clothes were unusual. Button-downs and work slacks were pretty much the uniform for everyone on her team. It was just his... everything, really. The way he held himself, his easy, direct gaze. He was so different than she remembered. Back then, he'd been as awkward and gangly as all the other guys in her program. But he'd grown up. Nicely. Ethan was talking to her, she realized. She forced herself to focus on his words. So, do you? Shoot, she hadn't focused fast enough. Sorry, my mind was already jumping ahead to the... project. Do I what? Like working for a conglomerate. I hadn't realized you were working here until you offered me the consulting gig. It's kind of off-brand for you, isn't it? There was no judgment in his tone, just curiosity. And she understood his surprise. Because I was on a crusade in college to change the world with alternative energy solutions, she smiled, even more anxious now to pull back the curtain on the project she'd recruited him for. Being here is less off-brand than you think, and now that you're officially cleared, I can give you all the details that matter. But first, an elevator ride. She couldn't wait to show him the lab. It was equipped with state-of-the-art machines from CNC routers to 3D printers. She'd nearly drooled when they'd been moved out of the applications workshop, the cramped workspace in their old building, and into their new digs. You're going to flip when you see this place. Ethan was the only person she knew who was as capable of falling in love with industrial manufacturing machines as she was. They'd been inseparable in the Georgia Tech machine shop, booking time to tinker far beyond their program requirements. I can't believe Standard Labs let you go. They didn't really have a choice, he said. They've been jerks ever since I got the nod for Kleber. And since I start that in six weeks anyway, he shrugged. Besides, their break room coffee sucked. Everyone complains about my coffee, but the rest of the facility will make up for it. I can't wait to see it. I'm dying to show it to you. And full disclosure, I'm hoping you'll be so wowed that you'll decide to abandon Kleber and stay here permanently. He laughed, and she joined him. The idea of anyone turning down Kleber was definitely a joke. The European design firm was tiny in comparison to BBMJ, but they had been at the forefront of every major new energy solution in Europe for the last five years. Heck, if BBMJ pulled the funding on her prototype, she might even go banging on the Swiss firm's door and beg to be hired. But first, she realized, as Ethan's subtle woodsy-smelling shower gel or shampoo or something tickled her nose, she was going to have to survive this reintroduction to him. She was staring at his shoulders. Again. She pretended to look for something in her work bag while she refocused. They'd almost had a thing in college. Sort of. Maybe? She hadn't had much experience dating, especially not after her one and only boyfriend, Dylan, turned out to be the lowest sort of rat before she'd transferred to Georgia Tech. But even then, she'd sensed interest from Ethan. Maybe it was the way he'd always sought her out in the lab, or the way she'd caught him looking at her sometimes, a mixture of hope and curiosity when he studied her and then the red flush that would darken his ears when she caught him. She'd been pulled in, too. 
easy with him in a way that she hadn't been with anyone. Ever. Then, one night, he'd leaned toward her with a soft look in his eye and... Well, she'd bolted that night. And from that point on, she created a space between them just in case. Choosing other partners, hurrying out of class so he didn't try to walk her to the next one. He'd backed off, and late in their final semester, she'd spotted him kissing a willowy brunette in front of the engineering building before class one day. She glanced casually now at his ring finger, but it was bare. It didn't necessarily mean he was single, but the only social media he maintained was his work link profile, and those didn't list personal details. Not that it mattered. At all. He was leaving the country in six weeks, and even if he wasn't, she'd worked too hard to get to this moment, standing on the verge of a revolutionary new technology, to risk a distraction like dating a coworker. The only ring she needed to worry about was the elevator bell letting them know they'd reached the lab. She shifted her eyes to the front and kept them on the doors, waiting for them to slide open so she could introduce Ethan to her favorite space on the planet. Chapter 2 Ethan kept his eyes on the elevator panel watching the floors tick down while he listened to Tessa's breezy monologue about the lab and everything that awaited them there. It shouldn't have been so hard to concentrate on her light chatter, but he'd known this was a possibility. He'd always been like this around her in college, tongue-tied to the point of muteness by the raging crush he'd harbored their senior year. Well, until Sarah. He pushed away the familiar pang that accompanied the thought of her, the memory of her, and concentrated on Tessa again. Tessa, who he did not have a barely concealed crush on any longer. I grew up, he reminded himself. In his head, he said it in the stern voice of Professor Quaid, the most feared teacher in the mechanical engineering program, because he suffered exactly no nonsense. Ethan forced himself to release the tension he'd been carrying in his shoulders since pulling into the BBMJ parking lot. He'd chalked that up to first-day jitters, but the second he'd seen Tessa, he'd realized how much of it had been nerves about seeing her. If she'd changed at all, it was only to acquire a new layer of polish. Her dark brown hair hung in a straight, shiny sheet past her shoulders. She wore a little makeup now, and she'd traded her borderline inappropriate funny t-shirts for a soft-looking shirt covered with, he looked closer, little flowers. It brushed his arm as she turned slightly toward him, and he was surprised when goosebumps broke out where it touched. Really, Ethan? Professor Quaid's voice said. Sorry, what did you say? The tips of his ears heated. He'd lost focus while he spent all his mental energy on trying to act normal around her. She answered with a laugh. I know, I know. I could talk about this forever. I've been dying to bring you on board, and now I'm going to overwhelm you with my nonstop monologues about why you're going to love it. The elevator dinged to announce that they had reached their floor. Well, as my seventh grade English teacher used to say, how about if I show instead of tell? The doors slid open and she stepped out, waving her arms in a welcome gesture and grinning again. He stepped out too and his eyebrows shot up. Tessa hadn't been kidding about how well equipped his new workspace would be. It was large, 3,000 square feet at least, with industrial polished concrete floors and crisp white walls. People talked about new car smell, but it had nothing on the faint metal and paint tang of newly delivered lab equipment, fresh from the factory, oiled and ready to cut out prototypes and three-dimensional parts that turn the concepts drawn in CAD into reality. 
His fingers twitched to explore the features of the shiny CNC router. But he couldn't just walk into someone else's lab and start playing with their toys. There was a protocol, and he slid his restless hands into his pockets to still them. The lab was quiet, the handful of people inside it having paused their work to glance over at them. But when the machines ran, it was as soothing to him as the lap of the Chesapeake against his grandparents' dock. Tessa touched his arm to indicate he should follow her into the lab. Come on, I'll introduce you to everyone and then give you the tour. Everyone was only three people. Sanjay, an Indian guy a few years older than them, glanced up, then right back down at the circuit board he was fiddling with. A black guy, Darius, turned from the CAD program on his monitor to give him a small wave and mumble hi before he dove back into his work. Tessa led him past them to stop in front of a middle-aged white woman with a liberal sprinkling of gray in her hair. She rose to shake his hand and introduced herself before Tessa could. I'm Mary Beal, the project manager on Helios. He smiled at the project name. Helios, huh? Fitting name for a solar project. We think so. I hope you're able to help us bring it home. Tessa says you were the only guy smarter than her in her senior seminar. If that's true, we're glad to have you. Wow, high praise. Guess she didn't tell you that she took highest honors in our class. By a point, Tessa said. Either way, we're glad for another set of hands, Mary said. I hope you prove to be as useful as she says you are. Management gives us all the technology resources we need, but they are stingy with their human resources. Tessa assures me we made the most efficient choice possible. You did. Tessa quirked her head to indicate they should move on, and Mary went back to her work and appeared to forget him as completely as Darius and Sanjay had. Do I need to apologize for anyone? She asked him quietly when they reached the far side of the room where the CNC router sat. He rolled his eyes. Come on, I've been working with engineers since I was a teenager. She nodded and let it drop. We call the desks over there Think Quad. The machines here are Make Quad. She waved at a stack of something covered in canvas in the third section. That's Test Quad. Now you're oriented. He nodded at the empty section on the opposite side of the space. What's that one? Nothing yet, but quad sounds cool, so that's what we stick with. She patted the machine beside them. Have you worked on a Bailey before? No, we had a Genon, but I've heard these cut with a whole new level of precision. It does, and it's fast. She patted it the way his older brother patted the roof of his BMW, a clear affection in her touch. It's amazing, and it's only my second favorite child. You have to see our 3D printer. And then we'll talk about the project, he asked, as he followed her to the next machine. Try to get me to stop. This time, her grin was wide enough to show the slight dimple to the right of her mouth. He'd had a thing for that dimple in college. It pulled an answering smile from him. After your tour here, she continued, I'm going to walk you over to HR so you can get your final security clearances. That'll get you logins and PINs so you can use all the machines. But I just wanted you to know what resources you're going to have as we work on this thing. Can't wait to find out what the thing is. Is that it? He nodded toward Test Quad and the canvas-colored rectangular lump the size and shape of a pallet of top ramen at Costco. The only food he bought in bulk because he lived on it, pretty much. That and bananas. Some things hadn't changed since college. That's it, she said. The game changer that green technology has been waiting for. The modification that is going to make Elon Musk question his whole existence. 
and you can see it right after you jump through all the HR hoops today. I'll whip that cover off first thing tomorrow for you, and you're going to help me solve the final inefficiency. His pulse rate ticked up, and only a little, because he'd caught a whiff of her distinct Tessa scent as she led him back to the elevator. A vanilla and honey smell that brought him straight back to their hours-long study sessions, when her nearness drove him half crazy. But his excitement now wasn't about old memories. It was about her passion for the project, obviously. The idea of throwing himself into something new and difficult with a team so absorbed in their work. He glanced at the rest of the team as the elevator door slid closed, each engineer hunched over or leaning into their work in a way that crackled with engagement, not boredom. Tessa leaned past him to hit the correct floor button, and a ghost of vanilla tickled his nose again. He almost leaned forward to breathe it a little deeper. He didn't, but he wanted to. And want was a feeling he hadn't experienced since Sarah had trashed his heart, like it was high-carb leftovers. This Palm Valley move was turning out to be one of the most surprising he'd ever made. Uh, because of the project, of course. Chapter 3 The flat brown paint of Tessa's townhouse door had never looked so welcoming to her. She'd worked until well past dinner time, not hungry enough to stop. But now, as she slipped inside, her stomach seemed intent on devouring itself. She didn't even bother rummaging through her fridge or small pantry. She hadn't kept her kitchen properly stocked for two weeks. This was going to be a grub mate's kind of night. Most nights were, lately. She pulled her phone out to place an order, but tapped out a quick text to Ethan instead. She hadn't seen him after she parked him in HR and hurried back to the lab, but the poor guy was probably exhausted from moving, then reporting to work less than eight hours later. Going to order some dinner. Care to join me? Instead of an answer, he sent a picture of several pieces of Ikea furniture scattered on his carpet. Whoa. Among engineers, sending pics of unassembled parts was practically a booty call. Her fingers already twitched to pick up one of the tiny Allen wrenches and impose order on chaos. She typed out a reply. Just got home. We'll change and be right over. She hadn't even gotten upstairs to her bedroom when his answer came in. I wasn't trying to trick you into putting my stuff together. She snorted. You show me all those freshly unpacked components and expect me to let you have all the fun? He sent back a short message. Fair enough. She changed out of her work clothes and into comfy jeans and a t-shirt, then ordered Thai food delivered to Ethan's unit, which was across the parking lot in the same complex as hers. She'd called the leasing office at just the right moment to find him the spot, a rarity in the tight Palm Valley rental market. Ten minutes later, she knocked on Ethan's door. He opened it, and once again she had a split second of paralysis. He was back in the basketball shorts and Georgia t-shirts he'd lived in during their senior year, but they fit him much, much differently. When he looked at her with a slight touch of confusion, beginning to wrinkle his forehead, she realized she was staring again and stepped past him into the living room. This is even better than I'd hoped. She eyed the flat cardboard boxes leaning against his walls in addition to the project he'd already started. Can I build my own thing? Sure, he said. I'm working on my bed frame so I can use it in a couple of hours, but I wouldn't mind having a table to eat off of for breakfast. I figure that's all I'll really need for the next six weeks. Speaking of food, I'm having the food delivered here. If you're not hungry, bring it for lunch tomorrow. This is way too much, he protested. You got me a job, found me a condo, and now you're building my furniture and buying me dinner? I'm racking up a favor deficit. 
No way. She opened the furniture box as she talked. First of all, you have no idea how hard we're about to work you. Secondly, we needed someone badly for two months now. If we have a prayer of making our deadline, you're a lifesaver. All debts are zeroed out. She slid the table from the box and reconsidered. Well, maybe you owe me a little for finding you this place. They never have vacancies. But I was relentless with the leasing office until they promised on their firstborn children to tell me about the next available opening. Sorry it isn't a two-bedroom, though. This is great, he said. I don't need much room. So, no girlfriend, huh? She sent up a little prayer of thanks for finding a natural opening. No, I was... no. Was. The word was loaded with the freight of a short-fused bomb, and as a shadow flitted through his eyes, Tessa didn't dare light it by asking what he meant. Sorry, wasn't trying to get in your business. What a lie. No big deal, he said. It was another symptom of stagnation. A sly smile tugged at the corner of his mouth. She recognized the warning signs. You're about to make a really dumb pun. Don't. I guess you could say I was ready to move on from stagnant labs and relationships. She stopped unwrapping the nuts and screws for the table. Get it? he asked. Stagnant labs instead of standard labs? I got it, but I'm going to need a second to collect myself so I don't accidentally throw these screws at your head. He went back to work on his bed frame, his expression looking like he'd just solved a fluid dynamics equation in his head which she'd seen him do before. The doorbell rang a half hour later, and Ethan returned with a plastic bag wafting spicy flavors ahead of him. I'm so disappointed, he said, frowning down at her. I thought an ace engineer would have built my whole table by now. She narrowed her eyes and glared up at him. I know you're just messing with me, but there's no way I'm letting that slide. You'll have your table in five minutes. No way. Set your watch. He nodded, set it, and nodded again. She flew, not needing the directions, assembling the table in a way that made intuitive sense. Four minutes, twelve seconds, he said in a tone of respect when she yelled, Done! I'm super impressed. Don't be impressed. Be scared because we need to build two chairs, and I'm about to beat you so bad you'll want to drive back to Denver. You're on. He grabbed a boxed chair for each of them, and when Tessa called go, they tore them open. They worked like lunatics, hands flying, plastic wrap flung about, several curses free-flowing, though only one of those was from Ethan. But in the end, it was Tessa who sat in her chair and unpacked the delivery food, while Ethan worked for another 30 seconds to tighten his final two screws. He scowled at her as he secured the last one, but she felt the smile beneath it in a way she couldn't explain. This is why I recruited you so hard, she said, as he rose and took his own seat, opening the container of pad thai. Because I'm slow at building chairs? Because you've always given me a competitive edge. I don't think I've worked as hard to beat anyone as I had to work to keep up with you at school. He nodded. Yeah, I get that. We were always one and two, huh? If by one you mean me and by two you mean you, then yes. That's not how I remember it. His grin was back. Actually, I'm just going to sit here remembering all the times I beat you and feel better about losing the chair race. Go right ahead, but I'm going to eat all your food, she said, fishing out chopsticks. Nope. He scooped up the noodles and dug in. Can we talk about the project now? And I mean that in the capital letter sense of the word. That's how it sounds every time you mention it. 
We call it Helios because we're crazy enough to think we can harness the sun, and the company is giving us until March 1st to get a working prototype to prove it. You mentioned you were working on energy storage? Food first. When she finished off her curry, she was ready to talk for real. Did you ever see that video that went around a couple of years ago about drivable solar highways? His forehead wrinkle reappeared. Yeah. Wait, the one where the roads of the future will be made of solar panels that automatically charge any electric vehicle traveling on it? Yes, we've almost got the panels figured out. He set his food down and stared at her, his jaw moving but no sound coming out. Finally, he said, Seriously? Seriously, we're almost there, Ethan. We've almost got a durable enough panel to withstand a high vehicle load. This was maybe the last thing I was expecting, he admitted. BBMJ isn't... I know. The company had a reputation as a powerhouse in traditional manufacturing systems, from software to the automated machines the software ran. But when they recruited me out of Caltech, it was... Wait, what? Caltech? Did you go do a master's? I'm ABD, baby. All but dissertation, and she didn't care about hiding the pride in her voice. Focus? Materials science. He shook his head. Should have guessed. Are you going to finish? Depends on corporate's feasibility study of Helios. If I can't prove that these road panels are a viable investment by the deadline... They're going to pull the funding and reassign me. And you don't want that. They pay so well. But they don't have any other energy solution divisions. I'd go back to Caltech so I can work on green tech. But if I can convince BBMJ that green tech can make their shareholders happy, I may be able to run a permanent tab on their research and development funds. Instead of spending half your time writing grants he finished. I see why that's so tempting. No, you don't. Not with Kleber waiting for you. That's like saying you're tempted by a strawberry when you already have a strawberry cheesecake sitting in front of you. He grinned. Good analogy, but there's a trade-off, you know. Kleber will let me pursue any projects I want, but even though they're well-funded, they don't have nearly the kind of resources BBMJ does. Deep down, I'm dreaming of the best of both worlds. If BBMJ greenlights a new division, then maybe we'll revolutionize the industry. Freedom to innovate, bottomless funds. She realized how arrogant it sounded and studied him from the corner of her eye to see if he would laugh at her. Wow, that's huge. He wore a dazed expression. But you're right, you have to crack this. As she watched the wonder slowly unfolding on his face, she was more sure than ever that she'd made the right call in bringing him in for the end of this project, even if they only got him for a month. He patted his chest, then his leg, and she realized he was looking for a pin. He rose and fished one out of his messenger bag. Taking his seat and grabbing a napkin from the plastic delivery sack, he mumbled about coefficients and sketched. This was going to work, she realized. She'd worked with a handful of people as smart as Ethan in the year since college, but she'd never worked with anyone who reached his level of excitement when he was into a project. She needed that kind of passion to re-energize their team as the deadline approached and their stress deepened. Ethan was the perfect guy. She answered his questions as he took notes on what their current obstacles were, and she kept herself busy building his other two chairs, as she answered and he scribbled. It was past ten when her phone buzzed, startling her. Ethan blinked and looked up. What time is it? Too late for anyone to be calling me. She frowned at the name on her screen, confusion and worry jockeying for the upper hand. Hi, Rachel. Is that you? Is anything wrong? 
Her sister's voice sounded tired, but also infinitely relieved that she'd answered. Yeah, it's me, and no, nothing's wrong, except that I'm standing on your doorstep. Thought I'd surprise you, but I guess I'm the one who's surprised you're not home. Be right there, Tessa said, already heading for the door. Boyfriend? Ethan asked. My sister, Rachel, haven't seen her in two years, but she says she's at my house, which is weird because last I heard she was in Florida. She pinched the bridge of her nose and took a minute to collect herself and breathe deeply, trying to reorient herself to reality. I better get home. See you tomorrow. Sure, you going to be okay? He asked as he walked her to his door. Yeah, just a little surprised. It was the understatement of the decade. She and Rachel hadn't parted on the best terms the last time they'd spoken. Holler if you need anything. She nodded, already distracted, and hurried over to her own place, where Rachel's petite frame rose to meet her. She had an overnight case on the step beside her and wore the look and smell of someone who had spent a few hard days on the road when Tessa leaned in to give her an awkward hug. They'd never been huggers, and it made her sad that it had felt more natural to hug Ethan yesterday than it did to hug her own sister. Hi, so this is a nice surprise. Tessa stepped back to examine her cataloging her lack of makeup and her yoga pants. Two very un like choices. Yeah, um, it was a last-minute trip. An awkward pause fell between them. Sorry it's so late. It's okay, I obviously wasn't asleep. Tessa glanced down at the overnight case. Um, do you want to crash here tonight? Rachel's shoulders slumped slightly. If you don't mind putting us up. Us? Tessa asked, just as the suitcase beside Rachel gave a small grunt. It wasn't a suitcase, she realized, as she squinted at it in the dim porch light. It was a baby carrier, the kind that snapped into a car. Who is that? But she had a sinking feeling she knew. This, Rachel said, hefting the carrier and turning it so Tessa could see the tiny sleeping face inside. Is Calvin. Meet your nephew. My what? She'd half expected the answer, but it still landed like a gut punch. The realization that she'd had a flesh and blood relative come into the world and not known about it that Rachel had chosen not to tell her about. Can we come in? Of course, right, yeah. She fumbled the lock open and led Rachel into the small living room. They settled on the sofa and Rachel perched the baby carrier atop the coffee table. So, um, how old is he? Tessa asked. How was she supposed to address the subject of discovering she suddenly had a nephew? It was her first and only one. Age seemed like a safe place to start. Four months. Sorry I didn't tell you about him. Rachel's voice was defensive, and Tessa realized age hadn't been such a safe subject after all. It wasn't a criticism. It's just, I don't know where to start with questions. Rachel dropped her head against the sofa and closed her eyes. She was quiet so long that Tessa wondered if she had fallen asleep, and she was about to get a blanket to cover her when Rachel sighed and stirred. I was seeing a guy, and we broke up. I didn't find out I was pregnant until after the breakup, and he didn't want anything to do with the baby. So that's been fun. Her tone made it clear that it had been as fun as a root canal, or worse, based on the exhaustion curling around each word. Anyway, I've been working at a resort in Orlando, but I... You got fired? Tessa guessed. Rachel's eyes snapped open. Nice, Tess. Of course you assume I got fired. 
Tessa fought the urge to rub her own suddenly very tired eyes. Sorry, shouldn't have jumped to conclusions. Even if those conclusions fit Rachel's pattern since she was 16. You're working at a resort in Orlando and... I needed a break. This single parent thing is no joke. Can I crash here for a few days? Of course. The baby made another small squeak. I can't take any time off work because we have an insane deadline, but you're welcome to stay. I only have one bedroom, but you can have it, and I'll sleep down here on the sofa. No way. The sofa is fine. An upgrade from my mattress at home, actually. She kicked off her shoes as if she was ready to stretch out and sleep right then. Tessa was surprised Rachel hadn't jumped on the opportunity to take the nicer bed. It was one of the major points of contention between them. Rachel had always complained that Tessa got the best of everything, while she got the raw end of the deal. It had been her refrain growing up in the chaos their alcoholic mother had caused. But Tessa had been dealt the same lemons. The difference was that Rachel sucked on them and Tessa used them for lemonade. But of course, Rachel never saw it that way. Tessa pretty much knew the argument by heart. So if Rachel was going to take the high road for once, Tessa was happy to let her. Does your baby need anything? She didn't know what she could possibly offer a baby, but it seemed like the polite thing to ask. He's fine. Tessa fetched a blanket and pillow for Rachel, who was half asleep when she came back. But she sleepily accepted them and moved the baby carrier to the floor before she lay back down. You're sure the baby doesn't need anything? Tessa asked, eyeing him. He looked like he was asleep, but she wasn't sure if he was supposed to stay in the carrier or if she should figure out how to rig a crib or something for him. She also hated to ask in case she offended Rachel. Everything out of her mouth usually did when she was trying hard not to. No, he's good. But Rachel slurred the last bit, already disappearing into sleep. Tessa turned off the lights and went upstairs to get ready for bed. She had no idea what to make of her sister's visit, but she'd leave her some money for food in the morning and figure it out after work. What would she do if Rachel asked to stay with her? It was the absolute worst time for her professionally, but if Rachel agreed to some ground rules, Tessa would find a way to make it work, starting with looking for a two-bedroom condo upgrade in the morning. Yawn. When she woke before her alarm the next morning, her mind picked up the problem-solving thread immediately. I'll check with the leasing office on my lunch, she thought, as she climbed out of bed. She always worked through her break, eating at her computer if she ate at all. But she'd pause long enough to make that call, and she'd help Rachel look for work. And, whoa, talk to Rachel first, then make plans. But she'd do that after work, which she'd have to find a way to leave on time instead of getting into a discussion with Sanjay about power meters. She crept down the stairs quietly, but the sofa was empty. Rach? Maybe she went for coffee? Tessa should have told Rachel that her coffee pot was programmed to greet her with a perfectly timed cup every morning. Right on schedule, it chirped to let her know her cup was ready. Just as she reached for it, she heard a different, unfamiliar chirp. She paused to listen. What was... wait. It came again. This time, not a chirp, but a short squawk. She rushed into the living room just as the baby, still strapped in his seat, let out a sharper cry. Was Rachel in the guest bathroom? One glance showed the door open, the light off. Rachel? But she knew she wouldn't hear an answer. The baby let out another cry. And though Tessa knew exactly nothing about babies, 
This one sounded more urgent. Um, hi, baby. Where's your mom? He only cried louder. With a touch of panic, she leaned down to figure out how to unbuckle him. But as she moved his thin blanket out of the way, her hand brushed a piece of paper. An acidic pit opened in her stomach as she picked it up. She knew in her gut what it would say, but she unfolded it and read it anyway. Tessa, I'm so sorry, but I can't do this. I'm tired inside my bones, and it's not getting better. I'm sure you think you can't either, but you have a job and a house and a paycheck, so you're way ahead of me. You pretty much raised me, and you did okay. Take care of Calvin for me. I wouldn't trust him with anyone else. Rachel Chapter 4 Should he see if Tessa wanted to carpool to work this morning? No, that was dumb. It was only a 15-minute drive. He could wait a few minutes to meet her at work and start the download from her brain to his. He found his way down to the lab without a problem. But when the elevator doors opened, he discovered that even though he was five minutes early, everyone but Tessa had beaten him there. Sanjay looked up but didn't seem to see him at all before he turned back to his circuit board. And Darius gave him a nod and a smile. Mary, the project manager, actually rose and walked toward him, hand extended for a shake. Welcome to your first official day in the lab. I'm the structural engineer as well as the PM. Sanjay and Darius are our sparkies, but Darius double majored in mechanical engineering too, so he's a good resource. You'll be working with Tessa most directly on solving the storage efficiencies. She wants to test some different materials because of the impacts of cadmium runoff on, on groundwater supplies. In the meantime, I'll show you to your workstation and you can start reading through her documentation. She gave a slight frown and checked her watch. She's always here by now. Wonder what's holding her up. It still wasn't quite eight, but Tessa had been first in, last out at school too. So Ethan understood Mary's surprise. He followed her to his computer and when she was satisfied that his login worked, she left him to read and returned to her own desk. By 8.10, he was already deep into Tessa's thorough notes outlining the project phases since its inception. But a startled noise from Mary turned all three of the other men's head her way. She looked up from her phone and met Darius's eye. Tessa isn't coming in today. She has to. It was the first thing Ethan had heard Sanjay say. Says she's sick and can't make it. Oh no. He wondered if she'd gotten food poisoning. He felt fine, but they hadn't shared their dishes last night. We need her. Can't miss a day when there's only five weeks to go, Darius said. I know that, Mary answered. But if she's too sick to work, she probably wouldn't do us any good today anyway. She'll make up the hours. You know how she is. True. Darius rubbed his neck like it hurt. Guess we don't have a choice. Sanjay scowled but turned back to his work without comment. Ethan slid his phone from his pocket and texted Tessa. You okay? He waited a minute for her response, but when she didn't answer right away, he set his phone on the desk so he wouldn't miss her response when she did. By lunch, she still hadn't answered, so he tried her again. Hey, I'm worried. You okay? Five minutes later, she finally texted him. Fine. That was it. Food poisoning? He tried. A minute later, he got a no and nothing else. Nor did she answer him when he tried calling her mid-afternoon. At five, Mary came to his desk. I know it wouldn't be kosher with HR, but I think Tessa said you're her neighbor now. 
I'm already planning to stop by, he finished for her. I'll make sure she's all right. Mary nodded and went back to her desk. Neither of the other men made a move to leave, even though their contract days had ended. Ethan didn't mind long hours and would have stayed longer too if he weren't worried about Tessa. He gathered up his stuff and left, murmuring a goodbye to each member of his new team. They responded exactly as they had when he arrived. Sanjay ignored him. Darius gave him a nod, and Mary actually said, Bye. He stopped by the fa place he'd noticed on the drive to work and picked up bone broth for Tessa. But when he stopped by her condo, there was no answer to his knock. An uneasy feeling brushed down his spine, but he wasn't sure what to do. He didn't want to ring the doorbell in case she was napping, so he left the soup on her doorstep and walked across the parking lot to his own building, texting her again. Hey, left some food on your doorstep. I'm really worried. Text me soon? She still hadn't responded by the time he went to bed, and when his phone showed no text from her the following morning, he'd maxed out his worrying capacity, so he threw on his clothes and headed straight for her place. The soup was gone, but there was no answer when he knocked. What if something was really wrong? He rang the doorbell. He hated the thought of waking her, but also hated the idea that she was too ill or weak to ask for help. What if she had the flu or something? He rang the doorbell again, waited a full minute, and then a third time. If she didn't answer this time, he would, hey. She cracked the door a few inches, and his worry ratcheted down a gear. He caught a glimpse of pajama bottoms and a crumpled t-shirt and her hair stuck up in a couple of places. But her color was normal, and her eyes were clear. You okay? he asked. Yeah, fine. She was standing at an awkward angle, he realized, like her right hip was cocked as she leaned to the left. You sure? If you need something, I can help. I was worried when you didn't come in yesterday. We all were. Even Sanjay, I think, if I read his blinks right. I promised Mary I'd check on you. Tell her I don't feel well enough to... The distinct sound of a baby cry interrupted her. It was a sound he knew well, even if he hadn't heard it in a very long time. Um, Tessa, what's going on? She sighed and opened the door further to reveal a baby cradled against her side in the football hold that he'd seen his dad use a hundred times on a dozen babies. Tessa was doing a much more awkward version of it. Oh, it was all he could think to say. Yeah, she said. That about sums it up. It's not yours, is it? Seemed like it would have come up before now. It also sounded like something that was none of his business, and he winced at his own question. Not mine, but currently my problem. She didn't explain, and they stood there staring at each other in silence. While silent stares often passed for small talk with engineers, this felt more awkward than two left shoes. Can I do anything? He asked. I don't know. Build a time machine and go back and fix my messed up family history? She sighed. Sorry, not your problem. I didn't sleep much last night. Didn't mean to leave you hanging at work. I'll be in as soon as I can. I'm not worried about that, he said. I came over because I was worried you were sick. Not sick, she said, as the baby whimpered. Maybe drowning. So unless you know something about babies, there's nothing you can do. I do. She gave him a confused look. Know about babies, he clarified. She paused a little longer, then stepped back and waved him in. He stopped inside the door, staring at the chaos in her living room. A few tiny pairs of pajamas lay in bunches on the floor. 
Three bottles sat atop a coffee table barely visible beneath scattered, unused diapers. And the faint but definite odor of dirty diapers floated on the air. She set the baby on the floor. It kicked and stared at the ceiling fan, but Ethan had a feeling it would let out another cry pretty soon. So, what's its name? He didn't know where else to start. Calvin? You aren't sure? This was all weird. Very weird. I am. His name is Calvin. He's my sister's. He knelt down to study the little guy. Nice to meet you, Calvin. Calvin answered with a jerky wave of his fist. Found out Monday night I'm an aunt to a four-month-old and woke up yesterday morning to a note from Rachel saying she couldn't handle him and she was taking off. Now I have six diapers left, and I don't know how many I need, so I ordered some. But I didn't even know what size to get, so I picked size four because he's four months old. But I opened the box, and I think I could fit ten of him in it, so that was wrong, and... He realized his jaw was hanging open, like he was a cartoon cliché. I know, she said catching a glimpse of his face as Calvin fussed, and she hurried to pick him up again. I think he wants to eat. I need to make his formula. She headed toward the kitchen with the baby on her hip to open a can of formula. When she held it against herself and struggled to peel the lid off as the baby squirmed, Ethan leaped into action. I'll do that, he said, taking the can from her. She nodded her thanks and shifted the baby to lay against her shoulder, but his fuss was transitioning into a full-blown cry, his head craning away from her shoulder as he complained. I don't really know what the crying means, but so far it usually means he wants a bottle or a diaper, and I just changed him, so... She nodded at the can in his hands. Just measure one scoop into six ounces of water and shake it up really well, if you don't mind. He did as she asked and tried to process what she just told him. Your sister left her kid with you and took off? Did I understand you right? Yes. The word was almost a hiss. Oh, man. It wasn't helpful, but he didn't know what else to say. She jostled the baby up and down until he handed her the bottle. Then she repositioned Calvin and popped it into his mouth before padding over to collapse on the couch. He took the facing armchair and watched her for a minute. I can understand why you didn't come into work yesterday. And why I can't today. I spent yesterday texting and leaving Rachel voicemails, hoping she'd pull herself together and change her mind. She nodded down at the baby. I finally got a text from her last night, saying she couldn't take care of him. She was sorry, but she wasn't coming back because she needed to do the right thing. Tessa closed her eyes, and a spasm of something rippled across her face. He'd seen that expression once before, when they'd tested their senior seminar project, an air purifier for residential homes near industrial centers and it had failed when Tessa had been sure it wouldn't. The stress on her face made him uneasy. Other people's problems usually did when he didn't feel like he could solve them, so he set to work solving it. He pulled out his phone. Let's try the Department for Children's Services, and then... No! Her voice was so sharp his head snapped up. She took a deep breath. Sorry. But no, I may not know what to do here, but I'm not going to surrender him to the system. I just meant maybe they would know how to track your sister down or have some resources to help you. Tessa shook her head. I don't want to involve them right now because the law might say they have to take him. I need to think this through a little more. Fair enough, but let me do a little research. He did some fast Googling, and for a few minutes the only sound was the soft suckling of Calvin on the bottle and a few of his content grunts. It was a cute noise, but when Ethan glanced over at him, 
Tessa's face looked as tense as ever. He went back to his search. I have some good news, he said softly a few minutes later. Tessa blinked as though she'd been far away. If a child is abandoned or removed in California, the state will try to place them with a family member first. They only go into foster or a group home situation if qualified family can't be located. I'm not qualified, she said. In this case, they mean so long as the temporary guardian doesn't have a criminal record or any clear danger signs, the child can stay with you. But then CPS can start working on a more permanent situation. Rachel will pull herself together and come back. Tessa slumped a little as she said this, changing the angle of the bottle and causing Calvin to protest. She flinched and repositioned the bottle. Ethan did some more research before trying again, forcing himself to think about the problem and not the child. There's no way that CPS is going to remove him. Most foster systems are so overloaded that for someone in your circumstances and with your background, they'll be glad to leave him with you until they have time to look into it further. But in the meantime, my background is that I don't know anything about babies. I'm only three years older than Rachel, and I don't even remember her as a baby. I cleaned houses to make money so I wouldn't have to babysit. She glanced around the living room. Not that you can tell from this disaster zone. Ethan stood and began gathering up the strewn, unused diapers. It looks worse than it is. This'll clean up easy. Ethan. Her voice was quiet but held an unmistakable warning and he straightened immediately. I know we engineers like to fix problems more than we like anything else on this planet, but right now I don't want you to fix anything. I'm overwhelmed, and I'm trying to process everything. Process, he said, eager to latch onto a word that gave him a place to work from. That's what it is, you know. You need a process, and you'll feel better. What if you... She glared at him, and he swallowed the rest of his words. He set the diapers he was holding on the table, sat, and took out his phone. Ethan, still that note of warning. Stop googling. I'm not. He finished typing and looked up. I just texted Mary that I wouldn't be in today either. It might be the exact wrong move for him, but he couldn't leave her with borderline panic all over her face. An emotion flickered across hers now, one he couldn't read, a feeling that always made him anxious. It was like driving blind when he couldn't decode someone's expressions. When she spoke, all she said was, We can't both be gone. You have to go in. Why? I'm supposed to work with you, and you're not there, so it's not going to be a big deal if I keep reading through your notes here instead. In fact, it's better, because I can ask you questions. He tapped out another message to Mary. I just told Mary that. It's fine. It's not fine. She's going to freak out. It'll calm her down if she can at least see you in the lab. Tessa? He sighed, not sure how to make his next offer. I don't want to offend you by saying this, but honestly, I think you need some sleep. And maybe then you'll feel a little better about everything. Kind of put it all in perspective? He trailed off as her eyebrows rose higher with each sentence. Apparently, he had picked the wrong way to phrase his offer. She gave him a smile that looked like she had reached down to pull it up from somewhere painful. I didn't sleep much she admitted, but Rachel left him with me, watching him is my job. Want to know why I know about babies? Her eyes widened for a minute. I can't believe I didn't even ask you that. Yes, why doesn't baby stuff freak you out? My parents fostered from the time I was 12. I think they got tired of waiting for my older sisters to settle down and give them grandkids, so we had a lot of babies come through. It was a long time ago, but I'm pretty sure babies are still kind of the same. 
I can keep an eye on this guy while you take a nap. You can call my mom if you need a reference. I'm not even kidding. She looked between him and Calvin. You sure you're okay with keeping an eye on him? I can get my siblings on the phone to offer testimonials, too, if it'll make you feel better. All three of them have kids. I don't see them much, but I'm good with their kids, too. No, it's okay. She thought for a long minute. All right, I really do need to sleep a little bit. He took a seat next to her, and she carefully handed off the baby, who settled into the crook of his arm without a fuss. His soft milk smell and soft round heft sparked a hundred memories of doing the same thing for his mom while she tried to get dinner on the table or take a shower. Instead of getting up, Tessa sat there watching him with the same expression she used to wear when puzzling through a thorny technical problem. Why are you doing this? She finally asked. Because you came over to my house after a long day of work and put furniture together for hours. Go take a nap. After another hesitation, she nodded, mumbled a tired, thanks, and climbed the stairs. Calvin finished his bottle shortly, and Ethan hunted around for a burp cloth, finally rummaging through a kitchen drawer for a clean dish towel. He hadn't done a ton of burping, but he knew the basics so he gave Calvin's back some rhythmic pats until a little belch escaped him a couple of minutes later. He settled back on the sofa with the baby on his shoulder, and within a minute, the baby's limbs loosened and grew heavy with sleep. Ethan glanced at the ceiling and hoped that Tessa had found sleep as easily. He hadn't heard any stirring for a few minutes. When Tessa woke up, he'd fetch his laptop so they could work. But for now, he did an awkward one-handed login to his new work account from his phone and settled in to read, wishing he could take notes, but not enough to risk disturbing Calvin. Almost an hour had passed when someone knocked on the door, three sharp raps. He tensed, waiting to see if it had woken Calvin, but he didn't move at all. He wanted to ignore the knock, but what if they rang next and woke both the sleepers in the house? Also, what if it was the delinquent sister? Tessa might want her back, but he wasn't at all sure a mom who dumped her kid should be able to waltz back in. He rose as quickly and carefully as he could and touched the knob just as whoever it was knocked again, this time even louder. He yanked the door open on the third knock, prepared to hush whoever it was. Please keep it down. But the words died on his lips. Mary Beale stood on Tessa's doorstep, and she looked mad as hell. Chapter 5 The world always took a minute to make sense to Tessa after a nap, like it was a puzzle reassembling itself as her brain came back online. She sat up and blinked. She'd been so tired when Ethan sent her upstairs that she had collapsed on top of her covers and crashed. Ethan. She blinked again, the last puzzle piece locking into place. Oh boy. She needed to rescue him. She checked her phone for any messages from Rachel. She did it several times an hour, terrified she'd miss her sister's call. Nothing. But the time display told her she'd been asleep for two hours. Nice. She pushed off the bed and went downstairs to find Ethan. Instead, she found her boss sitting on her sofa. Mary? Mary glanced over her shoulder to where Tessa stood at the foot of the stairs. Good, you're here. Um, yes, I live here. What are you doing here? Then, as she realized how quiet it was, a more pressing question occurred to her. Where's the baby? She hurried forward. He's right here, Mary said, just as Tessa spotted him in his baby carrier, sitting at her boss's feet. Ethan went to grab some drinkable coffee, and I've been terrified it would wake up. I'll leave him there until he fusses, but you still haven't said why you're here. 
Not that I'm not delighted to see you, or totally weirded out. None of her co-workers had been inside her home before this morning, and now half of them had. When my lead engineer disappears and then takes my new engineer with her, when we have no time or people to spare, I need to investigate. Although I wasn't supposed to look up your home address. You can report it to HR. I dare them to fire me. Mary sniffed, and Tessa doubted even the HR department in the mighty BBMJ machine would have the guts to take on the older woman. Sorry, I guess we got sucked into a vortex? Mary asked, eyeing the carrier. Baby. The door opened, and Ethan stepped in with a drink carrier. He smiled when he saw her. Feel better? Better? No, definitely as stressed as ever. I feel more rested. It's a start. I got coffee. I have a coffee maker. I told him how bad your coffee is. You're welcome, Mary said to Ethan. Now what are we going to do about this project? Tessa sank down at the other end of the sofa and accepted the drink Ethan gave her, opening a creamer. It has cream in it already, Ethan said. Not enough, she answered, not bothering to take a sip before dumping more in and stirring. I don't know what to do about Helios because I don't know what to do about the baby, she told Mary. My sister left him with me yesterday morning and I can't get a hold of her. And now I have 128 giant diapers I don't need. Ethan got me up to speed. Obviously, either you give him up or you find him a babysitter. I'm not giving him up. Rachel could come to her senses any day now. Tessa had seen enough headlines to know that postpartum depression was a thing. What if Rachel had it? When her sister got back to normal, the last thing she would need was a fight with the system to get her kid back. Mary shrugged. Then you'll need to find a babysitter. Tessa blinked at Mary's matter-of-fact tone. Mary didn't have any kids, so it irked Tessa that the woman gave the order like it was a simple matter of making a phone call. I'm open to suggestions. We live in a gig economy. I'm sure there's an app for that. Do some research while I get Ethan filled in on the rest of this documentation. We can't lose any more time. You want me to hire a total stranger? I don't know, Mary said, her voice flat and dry. You were a stranger to this kid until yesterday, apparently. Is a trained professional babysitter going to do better or worse than you? Point taken, Tessa mumbled. She cradled her coffee against her chest and went to retrieve her laptop from upstairs. Sorry, Ethan mumbled when he caught her eye on the way to the stairs. She shrugged. Unless he'd called Marion, this wasn't his fault. A few minutes later, the first ray of hope and clarity penetrated her fog since finding Rachel's note. Two agencies that provided child care to Palm Valley both with excellent reviews and ratings. Better yet, she couldn't find a single bad news headline or whisper of problems after thoroughly Googling. Maybe this would work out after all. She called the first one and almost wept when they assured her that they accepted infants as young as four months, then almost wept again when they told her they had no available nannies at the moment. Palm Valley is growing so fast that we're having a hard time keeping up with demand, the woman at the agency explained. Sorry about that, but I can put you on a waiting list. I guess so, Tessa said. She hoped Rachel would be back long before she heard from the agency again. Great, I'll start a profile for you. Your name? Tessa Fuller. Child's name and age? Calvin, four months. Same last name? She had no idea what last name Rachel had given him. I'm not sure, she confessed. There was a long pause on the other end. Pardon me? 
I'm his aunt, and I'm still filling in some blanks. I see. There was another long pause before the woman spoke again. Her tone was kind, but her words tied a new knot in Tessa's stomach. We can only contract for care with a parent or legal guardian. Of course, Tessa said. I understand. Please keep me on the waiting list. I'll have this straightened out by the time I hear from you. Sure, the woman said. But Tessa suspected she'd be deleted from their system the second they hung up. The call with the second agency went the same. She hung up and stared into space for another minute or two, trying to figure out what to even Google next. She tapped out, what to do when your sister abandons her kid? But it mostly turned up sad blog posts from people who'd been abandoned by parents as children, plus a few articles by therapists discussing the long-term harmful effects of abandonment. None of it made her feel any better, and they definitely didn't give her any ideas for what to do right at that moment. She had to work, but she also had to take care of the little guy downstairs. As though he sensed her thinking of him, a loud wail rose from the living room, and her heart rate picked up. Figuring out what to do about his crying had been a guessing game each time, and she still never knew exactly where to start. She'd googled baby cries in the wee hours of the morning when he'd had one particularly fussy spell. And while every article assured her all moms developed the skill of discerning which cries meant what, none of the links had explained to her how to figure out what that cry had meant. Tessa hurried to take care of it, but the baby's cry was already subsiding by the time her foot hit the bottom stair. Ethan had retrieved Calvin from the carrier and was softly bouncing him in the kitchen while reading the directions on the formula can. I'll do it. Tessa took the can from him and set it down, filling the bottle with water to precisely the six-ounce mark, then leveling the scoop and stirring in the powder. She gave it a vigorous shake, and Ethan shifted the baby so he was better positioned to drink. Tessa pointed the bottle in the general direction of Calvin's snout. He stopped fretting for a minute to gum the bottle's nipple, but then his face scrunched up, and he jerked his head away with a medium-sized howl of frustration. Ethan tried a few more times with the same result. He must not be hungry, so that means diaper. She and Ethan managed a clumsy handoff, and she marched to the living room to the sound of escalating cries and laid him on the sofa, which caused Mary to scoot to the far end of it. Tessa wiggled a blanket beneath him and laid one hand on his chest to keep him in place while she reached for the diaper stuff. A new line appeared on Mary's forehead with each of his angry cries. Don't worry, Tessa said over the noise. This usually works if the bottle doesn't. But when she peeled open his diaper, it was dry. Uh, what now? It was so hard to think over the crying. The only thing that had worked the day before was letting him cry until he exhausted himself. And then when she'd tried a bottle again, he'd taken it and fallen asleep while eating. Heat the formula, Mary said, looking down at her phone. I don't want to accidentally burn him. Mary shrugged. It says here that heating it will make the baby want to drink it more. I'll try, Ethan said, walking back into the kitchen. Put it in a bowl of hot water for a few minutes, shake it, test it against your wrist, and when it feels body temperature, it's ready, Mary instructed. Tessa resealed the baby's diaper and patted his stomach hesitantly. It didn't help, but it didn't seem to be making the crying any worse, and she didn't know what else to do. Ethan returned a couple of minutes later with the bottle, and this time when he nudged the bottle at the baby's lips, it was accepted. The crying stopped, and Mary breathed a sigh of relief. That was awful. Tessa couldn't disagree. Thanks for coming to help, you guys, but you both should head back to the lab. 
better to be down by one of us, not three of us. We can't afford to be down by any, Mary said. You have to come in. It was too much on top of her sleepless night and the stress of tiny human care. I'm sorry, but I can't. Tessa didn't even care that her tone was much sharper than any she'd ever used with her boss before. I literally can do nothing about this situation at this moment. Neither of the child care agencies in town has spare sitters. I have no idea when my sister is going to come back. I'm not about to take this to the authorities until I have a better idea of what's going on. And now I'm going to have to start exploring my friend networks to see if anyone has the faintest idea of what I can do. And I don't know if I know anyone with babies. Mary wasn't even looking at her, and it broke the last thread of her patience. No matter what, this isn't getting solved today. So again, why don't you two go back, and I'll get there as soon as I get everything here handled. The baby squawked, and she realized she'd been tightening her grip on him as she spoke. She jiggled the bottle a little bit, and his eyes fell back into the half-mast position he wore whenever he ate. Mary stood. Are you done? Since Tessa wasn't at all sure she could meet her boss's eye without snapping again, she kept her gaze on the drowsy baby and limited herself to, Yes. You have to come back to work. That baby will come with you. I checked and BBMJ has on-site child care for employees. Let's start there before you panic. I found a list of what you need to bring with you when you leave the house with a baby, and I'll stop by the store to pick it all up and meet you back at the lab. We'll figure it out there, but you working in fits and starts there is better than you not being able to do anything at all here. Tessa blinked at her, her recently extinguished hope stirring to life again. An on-site daycare? Do you have a car seat? Ethan asked. Tessa blinked at him too. Did your sister leave you anything besides this carrier? He crouched to examine it. No, just that. He turned it over. This is pretty clever, actually. He pointed to notches in the bottom. I think it's supposed to connect to something inside the car. It must be a base, since no car would come with a standard child seat setup. I think... He turned it this way and that, then messed with his phone a bit. Yeah, see these notches here? He pointed to a spot on either side of the carrier handle. You can feed a seatbelt through these to secure it, although the manufacturer recommends using it with the base. But it would be enough for driving around today. Tessa could only stare. Maybe she had forgotten how to use words. She tried to find some. Are you guys insane? I can't bring a baby to work. We need to see if there's room at the daycare. We will, but we all need to be in that lab no matter what, Mary said. Ethan, you help her figure out how to get that thing in her car. The list says you need one diaper for every three hours you plan to be out. Baby wipes, formula and bottle, a comfortable pad to change the baby on, three changes of clothes, a burp cloth, and toys the baby likes. She glanced between the baby and her phone, frowning. All that for one baby? Tessa looked down at the baby who was ignoring them, still half asleep and sucking lazily at the bottle now. He needs a lot. It was the greatest understatement of her life. Do you have any of that? Tessa shook her head. She left enough formula for five days. About six pajama things, a blanket, and now I'm almost out of diapers. The right size diapers, anyway. She glanced toward the large box of useless diapers in her corner. Well, I'll text you this list for stuff you need right now so you pull it all together. I'll stop at the store and get the rest of this stuff, and I'll meet you at the lab in two hours. She headed out the door without verifying that Tessa would comply. Wow, Ethan said. She's a good boss, Tessa said, feeling the need to defend Mary even though she wasn't thrilled with her at the moment. She just doesn't like to get behind on things. 
Oh, that was admiration you heard. She's... wow. Tessa patted the baby's belly a couple more times, so softly she wasn't even sure what the point was. As with everything she'd done since Rachel had appeared with him, she just tried stuff and hoped it worked. I'm terrified to leave the house with him. She said it softly, embarrassed to even being speaking the words aloud. But Ethan heard her. I get it. Ethan set the baby carrier on the coffee table and crouched beside it so he was closer to eye level with her. Mary might be right, though. With your deadline so tight, maybe it's best to bring Calvin to the lab and get some work done instead of not being able to do anything at all here. He cries a lot. She eyed the baby, disconcerted that once again he looked utterly content after raising a huge fuss only minutes before. He's unpredictable. Sanjay won't like it. Darius might not like it either, even though he usually doesn't have opinions about things. What if they can't get their work done because of the crying? It's still going to be more efficient for each of us to each get 10% less work done than it is for you to get 100% less done. It's not a perfect solution, but I don't know if there's a choice right now. She sighed. You don't sound convinced. It's not that, she said, hating that she had to make yet another admission. I'm terrified of even putting this thing in the car and driving over there. Suddenly the road seems like a dangerous place where people are waiting to crash into me, probably on the side with the baby and probably at the point where the force and torque will create the best chance for his car seat to fail. Oh. He thought about that for a minute. She couldn't blame him for coming up short on a solution. Engineers fixed real problems, not irrational fears. Fears that she hadn't even had until 36 hours ago. Let's take my car, and you ride in the back with the baby. Keep an eye on him. That won't improve his safety, Tessa said. But picture yourself doing it. Does it make you feel better than driving him over by yourself? She pictured it. Yes, she admitted. The fact that it made her feel better was even less rational than the worry in the first place. Then let's get going. Can you watch him while I gather up all the stuff? Ethan answered by resting his hand on the baby's stomach, a sign that she could get up and see to business. She did, finding the bag Rachel had left with him, grabbing three of the baby rompers, her last clean dish towel so she could burp him, the formula, diapers, and the other things Mary had put on her list. Except toys. She didn't know what he liked to play with, and Rachel hadn't left him anything. She packed it all, and though it didn't seem possible, it all fit in the baby bag. Ready, she said. Ethan looked at her, a touch of confusion in his expression. You are? His glance flickered down to her ragged pajamas and bare feet. Thank goodness she didn't blush easily. Right, let me get changed. You still okay with him? He nodded, and she hurried to put on clothes more appropriate for work and handle some basic grooming. She wasn't sure when she'd last brushed her teeth, much less brushed her hair. She did it now, wishing she had more time to put on makeup, after realizing that Ethan had observed her in grubby mode. She would have felt better with a little feminine gloss and shine, but she didn't want to cross Mary by taking any longer. Not that she was trying to impress Ethan, exactly. It just would have been nice to prove that she'd grown and changed as much as he had since college. Right now, she felt like the same frazzled girl she had been, the one without any parental support for school, the only one who had to work to pay for food and rent, while the other guys used those extra 20 hours a week to study and cruise through their exams and projects. And now, here she was, six years later, suddenly feeling as inadequate and out of her depth as she had back then. She splashed cold water on her face, trying to calm her nerves, and took a few deep breaths as she studied herself in the mirror 
trying to see the professional woman she'd worked hard to become. Instead, she saw a young woman who looked tired and stressed and worried like crazy that she was going to screw up the work project she'd been entrusted with based on her merits. And worse, far worse, the kid she'd been entrusted with based on nothing at all. Chapter 6 Ethan glanced at the rearview mirror, where he caught Tessa's dark brown hair and the fine angles of her profile as she kept her eyes on the baby riding quietly beside her. Everything okay back there? She didn't take her eyes off Calvin. I think so. He's awake, but not fussy. Maybe he likes riding in the car. Is that a thing? I know babies hating car seats is a thing. My brother always complains about how my niece screams bloody murder the whole time she's buckled in. So maybe it works the other way, too. Tessa didn't respond or say anything for the rest of the drive, and he sensed that she wouldn't welcome small talk. That was fine. He wasn't good at small talk. Engineers were stereotyped as socially awkward for a reason. They could carry on a conversation fine as long as it was a conversation with substance. Mindless chatter? Not so much. He parked in front of their building and unbuckled the baby seat. I'll carry this, if that's okay with you. I haven't gone to the condo gym, and I'll be honest, I'm looking for a bicep workout. He meant it as a joke so that he didn't offend her by making the sexist assumption that she couldn't carry the heavy baby plus contraption. But her eyes darted toward his bicep and away again. Almost... Had she looked guilty for a split second there? For what? Stealing a look at his modest muscles? Suddenly, he felt like grinning, but he fought the impulse. Instead, he lifted Calvin and his carrier from the back seat and waited for Tessa to climb out with the baby bag. They walked into the BBMJ lobby, where the receptionist gave them her usual courteous smile. Until she spotted the baby and her mouth turned to an O oh of surprise. Tessa didn't stop to explain, so he followed her lead all the way down to the lab. When the elevator doors slid open, the movement beyond the doors immediately stopped, Darius and Sanjay both regarding them with astonishment. Did you mention we were coming? Tessa asked Mary. Ethan wondered, too. It didn't look like Sanjay or Darius had expected to see them, much less a baby. Mary snapped out of her temporary paralysis. Of course I did. Ethan, put the baby over there. She pointed to the empty quad that now bristled with boxes and packages. It was the section nearest Tessa's desk, and he walked over to it and set the baby down. What's all this? Tessa asked. Baby stuff, Mary answered, joining them beside the bewildering assortment. I know that in a general sense. I mean, what does this stuff do? Tessa reached out and touched a black and silver thing that looked like a collapsed folding chair. Mary popped it open. That's a frame, Ethan guessed. Yes, I checked the brand of his carrier and it goes in this thing to make a stroller. Snap it in and see. Tessa eyed it the way she had their intake manifold on their senior project right before Ethan had pressed the start button and the whole thing sparked and caught a nearby fast food bag on fire. It's okay, you go ahead and show me, she said. Mary looked a touch trapped for a second. Ethan, go ahead. Why me? He asked. He could see how it was all supposed to work. That didn't mean he wanted to be the first one to attempt snapping the baby's carrier in there, based on his best guesses. Why us? Mary retorted. Because it's a baby and we're women. Dang, he'd walked right into that trap. He shot a look at Tessa, hoping for rescue but she only fluttered her fingers in a get-on-with-it gesture. 
He took a deep breath and shifted the weight of the carrier to his other hand. Although the seat and the baby were each fairly light, carrying them together had tired his arm far more than he'd expected. Maybe his joke about a bicep workout hadn't been a joke. I'll hold the frame steady. Tessa said it like she was doing him a favor, but he shot her a dirty look, and she had the grace to look a tiny bit ashamed of making him do the unnerving part of this operation. She grabbed the handle and gripped it so firmly her knuckles turned white. He stepped up to the frame and positioned the carrier so it looked like the notches beneath it, lined up with the bar of the frame, then eased it down. There was a satisfying click, and when he tugged on the carrier handle again, the whole thing felt secure. It worked. There was always something so pleasing when two pieces snapped so easily into place. Tessa gave the whole thing a tentative push forward, then pulled it back. This part seems to work, too. It's a stroller? Darius asked, coming over to watch. I guess so, Tessa said, walking a few more steps with greater confidence. The baby didn't seem interested, exactly, but he was content to watch the different adults float in and out of his view. Mary had bought everything in black and gray, and as she pointed to more items, the small pile of stuff began to take distinct shape to him instead of looking like a big plastic jumble. This is a swing, she said, pulling something forward, and Darius immediately went to investigate it, turning on different switches. Smart, he said. It looks like a hammock or a swing. That lured Sanjay over, who bent to examine something Mary called a bumbo. Genius, he muttered, and the sound of his voice startled Ethan. Sanjay wasn't loud. Ethan just sort of forgot he could talk. They went through a few more pieces, and although Ethan was used to seeing lots of baby equipment in his siblings' houses, He was still impressed at the number of ways the manufacturers who catered to babies had managed to solve everything, from how to rock them when they fussed, there was a recliner thingy that did that, to how to diaper them, an inflatable mattress-type thing to make the baby comfortable on a hard surface. This was so nice of you to buy, Mary, but it's too much, Tessa said. I don't need it all, and... How do you know? Mary interrupted. What? How do you know you don't need all this stuff? Didn't you say you don't know much about babies? Tessa gave a reluctant nod. That's true. I don't know either, and neither of those guys do. Mary jerked her thumb towards Sanjay and Darius, who were now trying to figure out how to set up a playpen. So let's ask the one person in this room who knows a little about babies. Does the baby need all this stuff, Bedford? I have no idea. Mary shot an impatient look at Tessa. See, we might, so better to have it. But it must have cost a fortune. A baby fortune, Mary agreed. But I'm charging it to our budget as a materials expense because this project can't continue if you are not here, and you can't be here unless that baby is with you, and that means we need this stuff. Does that mean we can't get him into the on-site daycare? Mary gave her head a short shake. Not unless you're his legal guardian, and we can't do anything about that today. So until you get that straightened out, he's hanging out with us here in the lab, and HR can bite me. She hurried back to her desk, as if that had settled the whole argument. Well, Ethan thought, as Tessa surveyed it all again with a bemused look on her face. Maybe it did. Get to work, Mary barked, and they all hurried to their spaces, Tessa rolling the baby's new stroller to rest near her desk. It was quiet for about an hour, other than the clack of keyboards and soft grunts. Those were from the baby and Darius, 
who, Ethan was learning, greeted every insight or frustration in his work with a grunt. The good stuff getting a slightly higher-pitched grunt than the bad stuff. The baby grunts? Those Ethan couldn't interpret. He was surprised by how quiet the lab was beyond that. At Standard, they'd had far more engineers working in one space, and most of them could go on forever about their projects. Not here, though, and not that he could have contributed to break the silence anyway. He was still wading through Tessa's documentation on the project, though he had only the last two months of work left to read. He didn't mind. She took meticulous notes, and he liked slipping inside of them and watching the workings of her engineer brain march out in tidy lines of text. It reminded him of how brilliant she really was. It took him no time at all to adjust to the quiet and to wonder how he'd ever worked in the noisy environment of his last lab, which is why he nearly fell off his chair when a shrill wail split the air. Sanjay clapped his hands over his ears, and Mary and Darius both whipped their heads in Tessa's direction, or, more accurately, to the stroller. It sounded like Calvin was angry and revving up to say so again even louder. Tessa hopped to her feet and reached in to unbuckle him. I'm guessing he needs a diaper, she said. Sorry, guys. Go blow up the diaper-changing pad thing, new guy. This was from Mary, but Ethan would have been happy to help anyway. He hurried to the pile of stuff and found the package with the picture of the inflated diaper-changing surface on the front. He shucked off the plastic, and after a quick examination revealed that it used the same mechanism as inflating a beach ball, he went to work. Two minutes later, he would have been cursing under his breath if he'd had any breath to spare. It took a whole lot more hot air than he'd expected. And since he had none left over for swearing, he put his mind to work designing a better inflation mechanism. Maybe something like those inflatable rafts where you pulled a cord and they... Is it ready? Tessa called over an even fussier Calvin. Ethan held up a finger to indicate almost and blew faster until it felt nice and firm and he sealed the valve. It looked like a mini pool raft, kind of. It's ready. She'd already slung the diaper bag over one shoulder and held the baby over the other. Do you mind just setting it down over there against the wall? I'll change him over there. He did as she asked, then hovered awkwardly feeling gangly and unwelcome, all twiggy limbs and neurosis, while he waited to see if she needed anything else. She lay Calvin down on the pad and glanced up at him. I've got it, thanks. He nodded and went back to his desk, wishing he knew what else to do. Her glance had been the barest moment, but he'd seen exhaustion and uncertainty in her eyes before she turned away. He returned to his computer, trying to find his place in his notes, when a startled yelp broke the new silence and everyone twisted in Tessa's direction. She held her hand in front of her the way his nephews did when he chased them with a super soaker, and for pretty much the same reason. The baby had released a stream of pee that had caught her right in the face, and she was fumbling for a diaper probably to toss on top of the sudden fountain. Gross, Darius said with a touch of awe. Mary looked disgusted. Sanjay just looked, then turned back to whatever he was tinkering with. Ethan got up and walked over, not wanting to intrude, but unwilling to leave without any help. Can I do something? She blinked up at him. Her face was wet. He winced. Sure. Find my sister and solve all my problems. I'm sorry. It's not your fault. I have no idea what I'm doing. She carefully lifted her hand as Calvin kicked his legs, but the stream had stopped. He looked around the lab like he had no cares. Ethan crouched and pulled out a few wipes for her. Baby urine is very clean. 
Mary called helpfully. When they both glanced over their shoulders to stare at this announcement, she shrugged. Google says it's clean, so don't be grossed out. I'm still grossed out, Tessa mumbled. She wiped her hands and face and dabbed at her shirt while Calvin kicked like a frog. He even cooed and Ethan smiled until he caught Tessa's glare and stopped. I'll go back to my desk then. A few minutes later, Tessa returned to hers too. She'd moved Calvin into his swing and Ethan caught a glimpse of him gnawing on his fist before he turned his attention to Tessa. All good? She nodded and woke up her computer without another word. The next hour passed quietly, with the exception of his questions to Tessa clarifying points in her notes. But that was about all they got before Calvin fussed again. It has to be food, right? She stared at Ethan as if pleading for him to make that wish come true. Probably, yeah. Sorry, guys, she said, digging into the bag beside her. He's going to be a little cranky while I make his bottle, but I think this is all he wants. Give me a minute. She rose with the can of formula and an empty bottle and hurried toward the exit that led to the break room across the hall. Calvin's fussing did get louder, and when Ethan heard Darius sigh, he rose and picked Calvin up from the swing unbuckling him and putting him over his shoulder and patting him to soothe him. When that didn't work, he offered him his pinky to suck on, something he'd seen more than one sibling do to appease one of their kids, until a bottle or breast arrived to the rescue. Calvin latched on to him greedily, and Ethan braced for the moment the baby realized he wasn't getting any milk. But Calvin didn't fuss just settled down to suck like Ethan's pinky was a pacifier. He felt stupidly proud that it had worked. Tessa returned a couple of minutes later, and when she reached for the baby, Ethan gave a soft shake of his head. It's okay. Why don't you give me the bottle? I'm still reading the notes, so I don't need my hands for anything. I can hold him while you work. She hesitated, then nodded and handed him the bottle. That makes the most sense. Thanks. He sat at his computer and fed Calvin. He was peering at a particularly complicated sheer equation in Tessa's notes, when he had the distinct feeling of being watched. He blinked and found Darius standing slightly over his left shoulder. It eats fast, the other engineer observed. He does? Ethan didn't know what was fast for a baby. It's only been eating five minutes and the milk's almost gone. Darius pointed at the bottle. Ethan still had no idea if that was fast or not. What he didn't know about babies would fill a 10 terabyte hard drive, he was realizing, ancient foster brother experiences aside. It might be too fast for him, Darius added. What is? the flow rate. I'll investigate. Then he returned to his computer, leaving Ethan to stare after him. Flow rate? He did an anxious check of Calvin, but while he was sucking down the formula at a good clip, he didn't seem to be otherwise distressed. Everything okay? Tessa asked. Yeah. Probably. He hoped. He had no idea except the baby wasn't fussing, and that seemed to be the one and only clue when something was wrong so far. What size nipples do you have, Tessa? Darius called. Excuse me? She sounded appalled. That is none of your business. This says that a four-month-old needs a medium-flow bottled nipple. What size do you have? Ethan watched Tessa's cheeks grow pink and fought with everything he had not to laugh. He'd been thrown by the question, too, but it must have felt even stranger to Tessa. I don't know, she said, her voice calm again, but her cheeks stayed pink. Can you look? The image of Tessa plucking her shirt collar away so she could peer down it did Ethan in even though he knew Darius meant the bottle. 
and this time he had to choke down an actual laugh. It was easy to read murder in Tessa's eyes. Ethan swallowed the rest of it until he could look at her with a straight face. Mary came over to investigate. How are you supposed to tell by looking? Tessa took Calvin from Ethan and popped the bottle out of the baby's mouth. He gave a little fret right away, but she peered closely at the bottle. It has a number three on it, she said, popping it back in. It'll have to do for now, Mary said. Make him slow down. And how exactly am I supposed to do that, Mary? Tessa asked. For the first time, Mary looked uncertain of herself. Then she scowled and said, Google it, and went back to her desk. The next few minutes led to Googling with inconclusive results. But since Calvin finished the bottle and didn't seem too worried about it, Tessa set it on her desk and put the dish towel over her shoulder, before resting Calvin against it and doing a bounce-pat thing with him. You need help? She shook her head and went back to work. But a few minutes later, a huge belch from the little guy had them all staring again. Was that him? Mary asked. Obviously. Did you think it was me? I think it had to be, Mary said, casting the baby a disbelieving glance. That was not me. Mary, looking doubtful, turned back to her desk. It was him, Tessa said to Ethan, the slightest touch of pleading in her voice. I mean, if you say so, he said, adopting Mary's same tone of doubt. Ethan! Fine, it was him, he grinned at her. Ugh, just for that, you have to get the chair thing Mary bought and see if he likes it. I'll set it up. That came from Mary, Darius, and Sanjay all at once. Oh, for pity's sake, Tessa said. But Ethan barely heard her because he was already racing to get to the unopened box first. It had been like this since he was a kid. While his brothers fought over which Hot Wheels cars to race, Ethan was happiest building the track and tinkering with the launch mechanism that sent the cars hurtling down it. A few minutes later, he brought it over to set beside Tessa, who put Calvin inside it and buckled the safety belt around his waist. She flipped the switch at the bottom, and it began a gentle vibration. Calvin blinked up at her and smiled. Tessa looked at Ethan uncertainly. Is that how it's supposed to go? He nodded back at the still smiling baby. I think he likes you. He likes the chair. But Ethan knew what the kid was really thinking. He liked Tessa, and Ethan did too. Chapter 7 You're a genius, Mary, Tessa said an hour later. Always true in a general sense, her boss said. But are you referring to something specific? This chair. She'd been able to disappear into her work focus on the project crowding out her stress over the baby for the first time since she'd realized her sister had left without him. It's magic. He's so quiet. Mary grunted. It's only doing what the online review said it would. Tessa stole another glance at the baby, who was simply watching her. Magic. Does that mean it's a good time to interrupt? Ethan asked. I finished going through your documentation, and now I've got more questions. She glanced over at him. He looked, she wasn't sure of the word, fresher, sharper, crisper, something. Somehow new and improved even over Monday when she'd seen him walking in the lobby. That's what a full night of sleep did for someone, she mused. Lucky guy. Questions, huh? I hope I have answers. Scoot over here and let's talk. He rolled his chair over. Can you pull up the specs on the solar cells? Got them. Great. I'm wondering about the... The baby peeped. Tessa glanced at him, nervous. But he didn't look upset. 
she leaned down slightly to study him closer. He had an expression she didn't recognize. Not distress. More like confusion. And was he turning red? Ethan! She waved him over, growing alarmed as the baby turned an even deeper shade of red, and went from looking confused to downright startled. I think we need to get him out of the chair. She lunged forward to undo the straps, but Ethan caught her arm. A light touch, just enough to check her forward momentum. She paused and looked at him, and he let her go. Warmth lingered where his fingers had touched, and it surprised her. That's, um... She frowned. That's, um, what? That's poop face. He looked a little embarrassed, but also certain of his words. Poop face? She repeated. What are you talking about? My brother-in-law always takes pictures of their kids when they do this. My sister hates it, but he thinks it's hilarious. And he always texts them to me because I might also think it's really funny. Now he looked even more embarrassed. This definitely took her right back to college spending her senior year in the lab with boys who loved potty jokes. I think he might be working on a diaper, as in filling it, he added. Yeah, I got that. What do I do? Either his face will go back to normal, or he'll start crying when he's done. That's kind of a guess. He sat back, and she did too, watching the baby's lower lip quiver and his face edge towards slightly purplish. She was about to reach for him again, alarmed by the color, when suddenly his face relaxed and turned its normal peachy shade. She glanced at Ethan, who returned her look with raised eyebrows. I guess that means he's done? It felt impolite to talk about the kid's intestinal functions, but she guessed he probably didn't understand. I'll go change him. She half hoped Ethan would offer to help this time, because the two dirty diapers she'd changed so far had been worse than the wet ones by orders of magnitude. But Ethan was no dummy, and he kept his mouth shut. She unbuckled the restraint and slid her hand beneath the baby's diapered bum to lift him up, and froze. There was something very warm and mushy beneath him. Oh no. Is he stuck? Ethan asked, half rising as though he'd help. The diaper didn't contain everything. Ethan sat right back down. Guess we know why that list said to pack three changes of clothes, Mary commented. Tessa took a deep breath and held it, then finished scooping the baby up and walking him over to the changing pad, trying to hold him securely while not letting any part of him touch any of her clothes until she set him down. Then she reached for the wipes with her clean hand and crouched to go to work. She gagged once, but didn't puke as she wrangled off his onesie and diaper and cleaned the worst of it off him. But when a bit of the mess got on her finger again, she gagged a second time and heard an echoing gag behind her from Darius's desk. Ignoring him, she held her breath for a final push, slapped the clean diaper on him, and sat back to eye him and the surrounding area to make sure she'd gotten everything. Mary, she called. No, Mary. She turned to glare at her boss. You made me bring him in here. Just come stand here and keep an eye on him while I throw this away and wash my hands. I can't put him in clean clothes with dirty hands. Mary glared back for several seconds. Then, shoulders slumped, she walked over to stare down at the baby. Hurry up! Tessa did, making sure the wipes were closed inside the diaper, which she taped in on itself to keep the mess contained. She was proud of her solution then immediately wondered what had become of her to be admiring the elegance of her diaper disposal. She hurried to the women's restroom outside the lab doors and threw the diaper in the trash before scrubbing off her hands and fingernails with soap. Four times. Then again, just to make sure. 
Back in the lab, she found Mary still looming over the baby, who kicked his feet and looked up at her, all pudgy pink rolls. Thanks, Tessa muttered, fishing out another outfit for him. And by outfit, it was just another onesie. But the lab wasn't so cold, so she hoped it was enough. It's the swing for you, buddy. That chair was contaminated. No more chair for him, even if it had brought her an extra long silence. She put him in his swing and walked away, but he immediately cried. She turned around and lifted him out, dragging the swing to her desk, put him back in where he could see her, and sat. He watched her without comment. So, back to the energy cells, she said to Ethan, when it seemed the baby was going to go along with her plan. They worked steadily with a hiccup or two here or there. Literal hiccups. The baby got them, and she had to pick him up and pat him until they quit, because it distracted her too much. Other than that, she and Ethan moved through his questions quickly. I think you're really close, he said, his eyes sparking with excitement when he asked his last question two hours later. This is going to change everything, she interrupted. Everything. He sat back and blew out a long stream of air. If you could find a more durable panel surface, you're going to reduce carbon emissions by... She watched as he stared into the distance, his eyes losing focus. Darius glanced over. What's he doing? Math. Darius's own eyes widened. Is he trying to calculate the emission reduction in his head? She held her finger to her lips to shush him, but it didn't matter. She'd seen Ethan solve complicated problems a dozen times in school, but it was still remarkable to watch someone do this kind of mental math without even a pencil. Mary watched now too, and Tessa smiled and mouthed, I told you. A moment later, Ethan blinked, and just like that, she sensed that he was all there again. 1.2 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide annually in the U.S. alone. Darius hooted, and Mary shook her head and turned back to her own work. You could have just asked. We already calculated it. But Tessa caught the small smile on her face, and she was glad that Mary had witnessed one more reason that Ethan had been a smart hire. Sanjay chose that moment to walk over, and set a paper cone down on her desk. It looked like he'd made it from the tray for his in-and-out french fries at lunch. Thank you, she said. For pee. Then he went back to his desk without further explanation. Tessa picked it up and examined it, but she had no idea what she was supposed to do with it. Ethan cleared his throat. I think it's like a hat. Her eyebrow rose. He tried again. Or maybe a kind of an umbrella? For Calvin, he said, nodding toward the baby. To keep the stream from hitting you next time, you just strategically place it on the little dude. Her confusion cleared. Oh, smart, Sanjay. Better than my idea, Darius admitted. He reached beneath his desk and pulled out a welding mask. I figured you could just put this on. No way, Mary said. You put that back. Mary likes to do all our welding, Tessa explained to Ethan. We can send it over to the fabrication guys, but she prefers to do it here. It's faster and I'm just as good, Mary sniffed. What Tessa really wanted to say was, thank you guys for helping. But the words got stuck behind a funny lump in her throat. So instead, she said, It's true, Mary's just as good. There was an awkward silence, like they all kind of knew what she meant to say, before Ethan broke it. Can we go look at the panels now? Yes! She jumped to her feet like she was the exclamation point on her own sentence. Let's do that. She was halfway across the lab to the stack of panel prototypes, when a short squawk from the baby drew her up short. Right, the baby. I'll get the stroller, Ethan said. 
Seems like he's happier if he can see you. Once the baby was moved over, they investigated the panels. But Calvin fretted constantly and didn't want a bottle. Tessa flinched each time. The noisy hum and whine of their machines periodically filled the lab, but those were a kind of white noise, a comfortable backdrop to their individual work. Baby squawks were something else entirely, neither rhythmic nor soothing. She rocked the stroller back and forth, but it didn't do much to settle his cries. Finally, when he reached a pitch that forced Ethan to repeat a question twice to make himself heard, Tessa shot Ethan a look that she hoped communicated her apologies and pointed to the door. I'll take him out until he settles down. The baby didn't settle down in the hallway, but Tessa still felt her tension ease the tiniest fraction. The reinforced lab doors and walls meant they wouldn't hear him inside. Maybe they could concentrate at least. She glanced at her watch. It was four o'clock. She stared at the baby. He wouldn't meet her eyes as he fussed more. It wasn't a full bore cry like he'd been doing when he was hungry, but maybe another bottle was in order here? The lab door opened, and Mary poked her head out. We switched the nipple, and Ethan made another bottle. She thrust it at Tessa and disappeared back into the lab. She set the bottle against his lips, but he sealed them up tighter than an O-ring on a gasket. What do you need? She asked him. He answered with a small, tired mule. She crouched beside him and offered her finger for him to suck the way Ethan had. That's the sound my brain makes every time I think about Rachel being gone. Is that what's got you fussing? He accepted her pinky and quieted for a few moments, and the soft draw of his mouth on her finger created an equal tug on her heart. Of course that's what it is, she said softly. They stayed that way for a few minutes before he released her pinky and cried again. But this time when she offered him the bottle, he took it, and she froze, not wanting to change a single thing about the angle of the bottle, not even wanting to breathe too hard and distract the baby from eating. When the lab door opened next, it was Ethan. Is it going okay out here? Yes she whispered. He dropped his voice to a whisper, too. Is he asleep? No, but he's eating and not crying, and I don't want to do anything to distract him. I'm afraid to even change the angle of the bottle. Got it, he said, and disappeared. It frustrated her that him disappearing into the lab affected her differently than when Mary had done it. She felt the impulse to call Ethan back not something that she wanted to do with Mary. Not that she minded Mary. It's just that Ethan... She stifled a sigh. This wasn't good. Not good at all. It shouldn't be any different when he offered help than when Mary did. But somehow it was easier to accept it from Mary, even though it was Ethan she wanted to lean on more. That was exactly the problem, actually the impulse to depend on him. She knew Ethan pretty well, or had, anyway. Even six years after graduation, he seemed as thoughtful and helpful as he always had. But hard experience had also taught her not to ever put herself in the position of needing someone, to the point of not being able to function if they somehow disappeared. That lesson had come courtesy of Rachel, too, in a roundabout way, Rachel plus Tessa's jerk ex-boyfriend. But Tessa had never needed to learn a lesson twice. She didn't depend on people for personal stuff. She'd learned to rely professionally on her co-workers here. They'd all shown the same passion for this project that she had, and she'd known Ethan would be into it too. But she wouldn't make the same mistakes she had with Dylan in viewing Ethan as a soft place to fall while she carried the weight of another human's problems, even if it was a human as tiny as this baby. You're hauling huge problems around with you, little guy, she murmured to him, but he nursed at his bottle and seemed content to ignore her. When he'd fallen fast asleep again several minutes later, she carefully maneuvered the stroller back into the lab, 
parking him against the wall and away from the soft clatter of keyboards and mouse clicks and the low conversation of her lab mates. Mary, she said, stopping by the project manager's desk. I'm sorry about this. I'll just work from... No, Mary said. Don't say home because there's nothing you can do there that will be helpful. You here at 50% with a baby in tow is still better than 0% with you at home. We've got the new filaments coming tomorrow, and we need to figure out if we can make them work. You have to be there for the testing. The kid will be fine in baby quad. Tessa nodded, smiling a little at the baby quad name. There wasn't anything else she could do. She went back to source materials with Ethan, and he smiled when she took her seat next to him. I was thinking about Calvin, and I have an idea. It's okay, she said. I'll figure it out. Uh, Sorry he's been so distracting. It's fine. Not a big deal. I promise. I told you, I'm used to babies. She didn't say anything, but the voice inside her head issued a firm retort. You may be used to babies, but you're the only one, and this is not a sustainable situation. She had to solve it. Her whole focus was sustainability, after all. She allowed herself a tight smile for the grim joke. The baby slept for another hour and a half. But when he woke again fussing, she knew they'd both reached their limits, whatever Mary said. Is it okay if we go? She asked Ethan. Sorry to pull you out early, but now that I have a real car seat set up, you won't have to do it tomorrow. It's after five anyway, he said, already rising. I don't mind. Not now and not tomorrow. It's seriously no problem. I can't make you do that again, Tessa said, and was astonished to see what she could only call disappointment flicker across his face. Let me change his diaper again and I'll be ready. She tried to do it quickly and made sure to use Sanjay's new invention just in case. Ready, she told Ethan. Leaving already? Mary asked. It's after five, Ethan said again. And then he helped her pack up everything she would need to bring home. I really am happy to drive you guys again tomorrow, he said quietly as they worked. She hesitated, then nodded. Thanks. They hauled everything to the elevator in one trip, and the doors had nearly closed on them and Calvin's cries when an arm shot through and the elevator opened. It was Sanjay, thrusting the inflatable changing pad at them. You forgot this. Thanks, but I don't need it at home. A blanket on the carpet works okay. I'm leaving it here so I have it tomorrow. He looked nonplussed for a second then nodded and withdrew. Seriously, thanks, though, she called as the door slid shut. Interesting guy. Tessa glanced up, way up, at Ethan. Dang, he was tall. She wasn't as petite as Rachel, but he made her feel tiny at five foot five. He is, actually. Just gotta get to know him. Does he ever talk enough to do that? Ethan looked doubtful. He talks enough, you'll see. They talked shop over the baby's cries on the ride home. She couldn't concentrate, but the skin around Ethan's eyes tightened with each new gale from the baby, and she hoped talking about work would distract him from the wailing infant. The tight line of his jaw by the time he pulled up to her condo told her she'd failed miserably. Thanks for driving. She nearly flung herself from the car to open the back seat and get the baby out. She didn't want to inconvenience Ethan a second longer than she had to. He turned off the car and went to the trunk, unloading the stroller and other gear. She slung the baby carrier over her arm and hurried to her front door, setting the baby down inside and rushing back out to haul in the rest of his stuff twice as fast as Ethan was moving. She couldn't blame him for his reluctance to be around the baby who was now in full squall. Thanks, she repeated again, when Ethan set the stroller frame down inside. She wondered if she was forgetting all of her words except for thank you and sorry. It felt like those had been 80% of her vocabulary today.
Don't take this the wrong way, Ethan said, and she braced, fully prepared to take it the wrong way. But you look really tired. Thanks. Then she cringed and added, You're not wrong, just to prove that she still knew other words. I was thinking about tomorrow. She couldn't bear to hear him try to let her down gently, so she cut him off. Me too. I really feel fine about driving myself. I'll see you at the lab. That's not what I was going to say. His gaze drifted to her hand on the doorknob, ready to close it behind him. I was going to offer to stay tonight and take a feeding shift with him. Absolutely not. The rejection was automatic. This was a no-brainer. She didn't need anyone else trying to cozy up to her, pretending to be interested in her problems, only to drop her when more important things came up. She would have to figure out how to handle this by herself, and she wouldn't count on him any more than she had to. I'll be fine. Don't sweat it. The baby's cries grew even louder, and she winced and crooked her head in the direction of his car. Better escape while the getting is good. He hesitated, sliding his hands in his pockets before he nodded. Sure, okay. Then he disappeared as she shut the door behind him and turned to stare at the unhappy baby, feeling more lost than she ever had. Once, her mom had disappeared for two weeks with a boyfriend on a gambling spree at a Seminole casino. Tessa felt totally out of her depth then, sneaking the expired food for her and Rachel to eat from the gas station where she cashiered, her panic mounting daily. But even that didn't scare her as much as staring into the red, angry face of the screaming infant in front of her without the first clue about what to do next. Chapter 8 Ethan drove the short distance to his parking spot and fought not to slam his door when he climbed out. It shouldn't bother him that Tessa had pushed him out, but he resented the inefficiency. This was a problem he could help her solve, but she was being as stubborn as he remembered her from college. That had been his one hesitation with taking this consulting gig before he went to Switzerland. Once Tessa had decided on how a problem should be solved, it was nearly impossible to get her to look at it from a different direction. The thing was, she was almost always right. In this case, she wasn't. It was college all over again. She'd been hard to work with on their senior seminar project because she wasn't great at collaboration. She could, and did, outwork everyone. But he and the other guy on their team had had to fight to get any input into it. Well, Ethan had. The other guy had been content to do as told and take the credit for Tessa's work. But ultimately, when Tessa had finally listened to Ethan, they'd figured out together how to make their air purifier work. Calvin wasn't his problem, Ethan knew. But he was here, he was willing to help, and he knew a little more about babies than Tessa did. It's not like he had opinions about what she should do with the kid on a long-term basis but he could at least give Calvin a bottle or two and let her get some sleep. She'd only handled him solo for one night, and she already looked like she was unraveling. It was already affecting her work, and after she'd been so relentless in recruiting him for the final stage of this project, he'd assumed she'd do anything to protect the progress of the project, including letting him help with Calvin so she could get enough sleep. Whatever. If she wanted to become her own personal sleep deprivation project, he couldn't do anything about that. What he could do was figure out a more efficient inverter for the stored energy in the road panels. He walked into his condo and opened his laptop to study the factory specs on the electric vehicle they were adapting for the feasibility study. About an hour later, a knock sounded at his door. 
He opened it, fully expecting to find Tessa. Instead, it was a grub mate's driver. Are you Ethan? She asked. Yeah. This is yours. She thrust a plastic carryout bag at him. He accepted it on reflex. I didn't order anything. There's a note on the receipt. Tip was taken care of. Bye. He closed the door and fished the paper out, reading the typed message in special notes at the bottom. Baby is okay now. Thanks for worrying. I don't cook, but I feel like you were obsessed with ramen in college. This is the grown-up version. See you tomorrow. He opened to find a container of beef pho, and he shook his head. She was right. He'd been about to warm up a cup of noodles. This smelled way better. He texted her a thank you and sat down to eat it, then went right back to his work, shoving aside the twinge of guilt that arose by habit. It had been almost a year since Sarah had walked out on him for good, but he'd listened to so many of her lectures about his workaholicism and how he didn't pay enough attention to her that it had become a reflex to brace himself against them. But he had no reason to feel guilty anymore. He had to remind himself of that. She'd forfeited any claim to his time the minute he'd shown up at her place to surprise her with a spontaneous dinner date and had walked in to find her half-dressed and fully sprawled across the lap of some dude he'd never seen before. The details had come out later, and each one had made him feel like a bigger cliché. Turned out she'd actually given up any claims on his time six months before, when she'd started cheating on him with her trainer. Because, of course, it was her trainer. Ethan wasn't sure why she'd even bothered trying to keep their relationship going during the affair. The only thing he could figure was that he'd become a habit for her. They'd been together since college. It was either that or she preferred his fatter paychecks. Engineering wasn't as glamorous as being a personal trainer, but it definitely paid better. The solution had been obvious. He broke up with her on the spot. But his habit of becoming defensive any time he brought a problem home to solve hadn't faded. A lot of habits from being with Sarah had lingered. It was why he'd been happy to leave Denver a month early to consult for Tessa's project. He'd rather pass the time in Palm Valley and his sparse apartment until his project at Kleber started than stay in the apartment that bore Sarah's fingerprints everywhere. She'd happily spent his money decorating it for him, but it was all to her taste, and when she was gone, he realized he liked it even less than he liked her. This place was smaller and emptier, but maybe that's why he felt like he could breathe easier for the first time in months. And soon, when he was in the alpine air of Switzerland, his head in the literal clouds, while he was neck deep in new engineering problems to solve, he'd breathe freely. A rattle above his head woke him, and he blinked awake, not sure what was happening for a minute, while his eyes adjusted to the darkness. What was... Oh, it was his phone. He grabbed it and noted the time above Tessa's name in the display. 2.12 in the morning. Hi, he said, sitting up and ready to spring into action. I'm sorry to call so late. I just... He heard Calvin wail. Baby isn't sleeping? No. Do you know what I should do? Google has failed. I'll come over. You don't have to. But an angrier wail interrupted her. I can't solve the problem remotely. It's not a big deal to run over. See you in a minute. He hung up and grabbed a t-shirt to throw on with his shorts, slipped on his sneakers without bothering with socks, and headed over to Tessa's. He could hear Calvin from the sidewalk, and he let himself in when he found the door unlocked. 
Tessa was pacing the living room, bouncing the baby and looking faintly panicked again. Nothing's working, she said, raising her voice to be heard above him. What have you tried so far? She gave him a rundown. A bottle, a new diaper, rocking. He won't stop. Can I hold him? She handed him over without any objection and wilted on the sofa. Ethan cradled Calvin, trying to think through what his mother had done when they'd had an inconsolable infant. It happens sometimes when they got a drug-addicted baby who was removed from the mother at birth. Maybe that was the problem here? Is your sister an addict? Tessa's head flew up. Excuse you? I'm just wondering. She may be irresponsible in all other ways, but she's not an addict. Okay. He wasn't going to debate with her when she was clearly exhausted. He fished out his phone and did a search while he softly bounced the baby. The motion made the whales quieter, but they didn't stop. If I read off a list of behaviors to you, can you tell me which of these fit Calvin? Yeah, go ahead. Tremors, sleep problems, irritability, high-pitched crying, tight muscle tone, hyperactive reflexes, seizures, yawning, stuffy nose, diarrhea, dehydration, sweating, unstable temperature. Any of those ring a bell? She stared at him, her eyes bloodshot. At least half of them, but I don't know if it's normal for him or not. What's a high-pitched cry? That's what all his cries sound like. And he doesn't sleep great, but I kind of thought most babies didn't. It's the same with most of those symptoms. She was right. He'd pulled up a list of symptoms of drug-addicted babies, but they had no idea what Calvin's baseline was. So how would they know if this was different? He glanced at the time again. Only five minutes had passed since he'd walked in. But the screaming baby had made it feel like an hour. He wished that were true because it would mean his mom was waking up on the East Coast for her first cup of coffee and he'd be able to ask her. But he didn't want to wake her up early for this, so he'd have to figure it out. It's a list of signs of a drug-addicted baby, he confessed to Tessa. When she got a scary glint in her eye, he held up his free hand in a whoa gesture. It's not an insult to your sister. I'm troubleshooting here, and I know some of the fussiest foster babies we got came from drug addicts, just ruling this out. Tessa pressed her lips into a tight line before she gave a sharp nod. Okay, but no. Even though she's always been a handful, I've never known her to use any kind of drug. I'll ask her, but I'm not sure she'll answer. She hasn't answered any of my texts since last night. Calvin's fretful fusses turned into a sharp, angry wail, then back to fretting again. Tessa's eyes went slightly glassy. The way she looked was exactly how he'd felt for weeks after he and Sarah split. Why don't you try to sleep, he asked. I promise you can trust me with Calvin, and my mom will be awake in an hour, and I'll call her and get her advice. But I really think you need to sleep. I'm so sorry. For being tired? Come on. For dragging you over here, to my house, to Palm Valley, to work on a project I'm suddenly ghosting. That's the tired talking. Sleep. But... Please, it'll make me feel better, even if it doesn't make you feel better. He suspected she might be willing to do it if she thought she was helping him, even if she wasn't willing to do it for herself. Finally, she nodded. Thanks, I'll sleep for an hour, then you can go home. Sleep until your alarm goes off, it's fine. She climbed off the sofa like a pile of bricks was weighing her down but eventually she trudged up the stairs and disappeared. He looked down at Calvin and smiled, although Calvin wasn't paying him any attention. His little mouth stretched in a grimace as he writhed and grunted. 
What do you need, buddy? He got a whimper. Diaper? Bottle? He glanced around. Swing? Let's try the swing. But when he'd settled him in and started it swaying, Calvin still fretted. He tried making faces and silly noises like his brother did with his kids, but it didn't help. He was relieved he could stop those because they made him feel dumb. But so did Calvin's fretting, which wasn't getting any better. Maybe he wanted to swing more. He tried pushing the swing harder to give it more momentum, but it was designed to move at a predetermined speed, not respond to pushing. It made sense, he thought grudgingly. That way, mischievous older siblings couldn't come along and set the swing going too high or fast when parents weren't looking. If he had a little more time and no baby to worry about, he could take it apart and figure out how to disable that feature. But as Calvin squawked and his lip quivered, Ethan abandoned any tinkering plans and tried to look for a more immediate solution. He'd been way overconfident in thinking he could handle this any better than Tessa had. The baby seat caught his eye. The handle was locked in position flush against the seat itself, but he scooped Calvin from the swing. I have an idea. For a split second, he stopped fussing as Ethan swooped him up and toward the carrier, which made Ethan optimistic that his next idea might work. He settled Calvin into the carrier and triple-checked his harness, moved the handle to carrier position so that the whole thing looked like a basket. Then he stood up and swung the carrier in a wider trajectory than the swing allowed. Calvin fussed. He sped up. The fussing subsided for a minute, then started up again. But Ethan smiled. I understand, he said to Calvin in the carrier. He made his passes long and fast, turning himself into one of those amusement park rides that looked like a giant, swinging Viking ship that eventually did a full revolution. But instead of screaming like those riders did as his vessel went higher and higher, Calvin settled right down. After a couple of minutes, Ethan was satisfied that it wasn't a fluke. Calvin's eyes peered at him on each pass but he didn't fuss. Ethan was pleased until a couple more minutes passed and he realized how tired his shoulder was getting. The baby and carrier had felt so light when he picked them both up, but muscle fatigue didn't care about how something felt after 30 reps. He'd spent enough time in the gym after the breakup to know that all too well. It was not the gym where her trainer was he told Calvin, but Calvin only watched him quietly. Unfortunately, his eyes didn't look a bit sleepy yet. Ethan switched arms. How long could he keep this up? Even switching back and forth, he could only swing the baby for so long before his shoulders would quit cooperating and the crying started again. His phone buzzed in his back pocket and startled him. Now what? Was Tessa calling him from upstairs? But when he pulled it out, the caller ID display read, Mom. I'm fine. It was always best to start this way when she called unexpectedly. You are not. Tell me what's wrong. Are you hurt? What happened? There is no such thing as ESP, Mom. I'm fine. It's not ESP. It's mother's intuition and you can just have an argument against it in your own engineer brain, because you'll never convince me. Now tell me what's up. There's nothing wrong. The last time she'd called him insisting her intuition was flaring, he'd been sitting on his sofa, two hours post-Sarah cheating bombshell, reeling from the sudden crater where his heart used to be. No one has cheated on me lately. There's no car accident or burn or flu. Nothing. Those were all reasons she'd called in the past. He didn't believe in woo-woo intuition, but there was no denying she had a history of impeccable timing with these calls. 
Calvin cried and he hurried to start the swinging again, not realizing he'd stopped. Calvin quieted. What was that? His mom demanded. The TV? He only said it to tease her. She was a veteran of babies, and she could pick a real cry from a million fake TV ones. Son, who do you think you're talking to? The baby whisperer? Truth is, I'm glad you called. I was going to call you in about a half hour anyway. I knew it. Mother's into... If you tell me how to get him to stop crying, I'll admit ESP exists. You're getting coal in your stocking. I haven't believed in Santa since... ever. He shifted the phone to his other ear and Calvin to swing on his other side. Then who puts the giant Twix in your stocking hat that you are definitely not getting this year? His mom demanded. But I love the giant Twix. Then say it. He sighed. Santa's real. Do I get my candy bar? Not until you tell me why I just heard a baby crying. Well, it's complicated. I didn't have a baby, but my friend Tessa got a baby. Define got a baby. Her tone had taken on the same sharp interest he felt inside when he faced a new engineering problem. She may have taken no interest in formal STEM work, but he knew exactly where he'd gotten his analytical mind from, despite her insistence on the existence of intuition. Isn't Tessa the person who convinced you to move out there? Yeah, I reported to work on Monday. She showed me around and helped me build some IKEA stuff, and then she got a phone call that her sister was at her house. I don't really know what's going on there. But the punchline is that when Tessa woke up on Tuesday, her sister had left her kid behind with a note for Tessa to take care of it. Poor girl. It's a boy. I meant the sister who left him, but the baby too. Leave it to his mom to feel sorry for the woman he and Tessa could cheerfully string up. I'm more worried about this little guy right now. Why is he with you at 2.30 in the morning? I'm not dating her. She sputtered for a second. I don't know what that has to do with anything. You trying to tell me you weren't about to fish to find out if there's something with me and Tessa? There's not. She's never been into me. He'd thought for a little while in college that there might be some interest on her side. No, not some. A lot. But he'd been wrong. And then he'd met Sarah. Unfortunately. But that was a long time ago. Let's see, his mom said, stopping his meander down memory lane. You moved 600 miles to work with her for a month, and you're watching a baby for her in the middle of the night. She paused, and he knew she was going in for the kill. His lips twitched in an almost smile as he waited. Yeah, can't imagine why I think there's something going on with you two. Got it all out of your system yet? She made a non-committal sound. You said you were about to call me anyway. I can't get him to stop crying. I was hoping for ideas. Might be withdrawal. Was the mom using? Tessa doesn't think so, and I ran through a list of symptoms with her but she says that a lot of that sounds like what all babies do, and she wouldn't know if it was normal or not. Why'd he stop just now? I'm swinging him, but he's in his little carrier thing, and my arms are going to give out soon, even if I keep switching sides. She asked him a few more questions, still trying to suss out if it was withdrawal. Finally, she said, It doesn't sound like drugs. It also doesn't sound like it's a food issue since there's not projectile spit-up. I think he's sad. Isn't that why everyone cries? Ethan asked, befuddled by the response. Usually his mom offered more practical feedback. No, he could be crying because he's hurting or hungry. I don't think he is. At this age, he should be sleeping more at night, about six hours at a time. But if he's waking up, eating, getting a fresh diaper, and still crying, 
I don't think there's anything physically wrong with him. I think that poor little man is missing his mom. A sense of helplessness washed over Ethan in direct proportion to how tired his shoulder was growing. He paused for a second to shift sides and got Calvin going again, just as another little cry started up. But he subsided when Ethan found his rhythm. I can't do this all night. I wish I could, but my shoulders say no. Any ideas? Tell me what else you've tried. He complied, and she thought for a minute. He's missing his mama, and there's not much you can do about that. But it sounds like the reason this swinging works and the baby swing didn't is because it distracts him. He forgets for a minute that he's sad. Sometimes we drove babies around in the car and that calmed them down. Sometimes a walk will work. Like just putting him in a stroller and walking around? There's a stroller here. You got anywhere good and safe to walk around there in the middle of the night? Yeah, there's a paved footpath that runs around the complex. He'd been meaning to explore it. Guess life was making time for him since he had a bad habit of not making time himself. Then yes, I'd say try taking him for a walk. See if that helps. What if he cries the whole time? I can't drag a screaming baby past a bunch of people's windows in the middle of the night. Then you bring him home, she said, in the patient tone she used when he was missing the obvious. Right. Okay, I'll try that. Call me again, or better yet, have Tessa call me so I can get a better description of his behavior. Maybe I can come up with more specific suggestions. He wasn't fooled by her innocent tone. I'll call you and let you know how it's going, or if I have any more questions. You'll have questions. Don't sound so smug. That was an easy prediction. Talk too soon. Love you. Love you, he answered, before hanging up. He kept the swinging going and looked around for the stroller frame thing, spotting it leaning against a wall. He made his way over in an awkward swing-step-swing-step swing, step rhythm and studied it, not wanting to put the baby down in case Calvin cried too loud and woke Tessa. He eyed the different hinges and components and decided he could snap in Calvin's seat and get the whole rig out the door before the baby could fuss too much. Except he'd want to let Tessa know where he was. A text might wake her. He'd leave her a note so she wouldn't freak out if she woke up and came down to an empty house. But that meant a longer window for Calvin to cry. He considered the options and settled on a plan. He didn't see any loose paper anywhere, but he was 100% sure Tessa would have a stack of paper takeout napkins lying around. And sure enough, he found them in a kitchen drawer that contained other sensible odds and ends. Pens, pencils, a measuring tape, screwdriver, thumbtacks, antivenin. He blinked at the antivenin, but took the pen and napkin out and set them on the counter, ready for him to write all the while still swinging Calvin. He didn't want to stick the note to the fridge with one of the myriad restaurant magnets that covered it, because he doubted she'd check there first. That meant taping it to the door so she'd see it as soon as she came down. But although he'd hoped to find a junk drawer with tape, the rest were either empty or full of more paper restaurant napkins and plastic utensils. He considered what to do next, how to leave a note that she would see without tape. He checked the cabinets and found one full of jars of marinara sauce. Perfect. He carried five of them over to her small dining room table, which was situated a few feet to the right of her front door, one at a time, and built a three-level tower of jars. That would capture her attention when she came down. Next, he set Calvin down beside the stroller frame for a minute and popped it open, pleased when it worked exactly as he expected it to. These makers of baby stuff had some good ideas. He snapped Calvin and his carrier into place, 
and as the little guy's face began to screw up for a cry, he hurriedly pushed it toward the kitchen. It put Calvin on pause. Ethan found that encouraging, but unsurprising. If his mom thought a stroller ride would work, it would probably work. In the kitchen, he rocked the stroller back and forth with his foot as he scribbled a note to Tessa. Took Calvin for a walk. Be back soon. He set it beside his totem of marinara jars, eased the stroller out her condo, down the lone front porch step, and set off for the footpath. Calvin stayed quiet through it all. Ethan wasn't sure why this was working when there was less to see in the dark night than there was even in the condo, but he was glad it did. He walked the loop, a distance he estimated at a third of a mile, four times before he glanced down and saw that Calvin had fallen asleep. Tension ebbed out of him and tiredness flooded in, the lateness of the hour finally catching up to him. Good idea, kid, he whispered. I wish I could sleep too. He'd bring him back to Tessa's and see if he could grab a few Zs on the couch. Calvin stayed asleep on the short walk back to her place, even when Ethan jostled the stroller trying to get it up the porch step. He slipped inside with a sigh of relief that turned to a smile when he realized that Tessa had crept downstairs to the sofa, but exactly like her nephew, was sound asleep. He pushed the stroller to rest beside the couch and grabbed a blanket to cover her. She'd curled up in a corner, her hand tucked beneath her chin, with the takeout napkin containing his note crumpled in her fist. He sank to the other end of the couch and angled his long frame awkwardly, so he could stretch his legs on the coffee table and rest his head against the sofa arm. He hoped for a doze, but he doubted. Something warm and soft burrowed against his side, and Ethan slowly blinked awake. What was... He glanced down. Oh. The gray half-light of early morning leaked through Tessa's curtains to pick up the glints in her honey highlights in her deep brown hair, hair that was splayed across his lap. He'd fallen asleep, and so soundly that he hadn't even noticed Tessa migrate over at some point to settle her head in his lap to sleep. Nor had he noticed the growing stiffness in his neck and legs as he'd slept. He should move. His muscles would hate him if he didn't, but he didn't want to wake Tessa. Six years ago, they had shared a similar moment. He wondered if she would remember. It had always stuck in his mind because it marked a turning point for them. It just hadn't turned the way he'd expected it to. He glanced over at the stroller where Calvin was still out like a light. Tessa stirred and he froze, hoping she wouldn't wake yet. He wanted to soak in the moment a little longer, and he didn't think too hard about why probably just because he hadn't had a woman snuggled against him since Sarah. Tessa settled again, a breath that was almost a snore escaping her, and he smiled, even as her movement against his leg made his knee twinge. Maybe he wanted to soak it in because this was Tessa, and she was cool, and it was as simple as that. He'd always thought she was cool, she had caught his eye when she joined his thermodynamics class, an unfamiliar female face in his male-dominated major. But he'd have noticed her even if there were a hundred other women in the room. It wasn't even that she was beautiful. She was pretty on any scale someone might use. Her dark brown hair set off delicate features, high cheekbones, and a fine straight nose. She was almost petite, but most people felt that way next to his six-foot-two frame. She was probably average height for a woman, around five-six, maybe a little under. But her bones had the same delicacy as her face. Bird bones, he wanted to say, though it probably wouldn't sound like a compliment to her. It was her eyes that had really captured him. Big and hazel, they were clear and present in a way he didn't see much in his major. Engineering types were often either laser-focused on the project in front of them, 
while the rest of the world fell away, or they were lost in their own thoughts, working through technical problems, sorting and discarding possibilities. In either case, their eyes all held that faraway look as they obsessed or puzzled. Tessa's presence had struck him. Not the way she physically occupied space, but her awareness of it. As if she herself were fully present in any moment. It was a sharp contrast to their classmates. And as he watched her watching, always watching, he wondered what she thought about everything she observed. He sensed she was filing it away, and he wondered for what purpose. Curiosity? Simple information? He'd made a point of trying to find out, gradually moving his seat nearer to hers, eventually striking up a conversation. He wasn't great at small talk, but he didn't have to be with her. He'd asked what she was thinking about doing for her senior project the following year, and she'd animated like Jesse from Toy Story and begun talking to him about some clean energy ideas she had. It had delighted him that she shared his passion on the subject, and they immediately fell into habits of long lunches and study dates. He'd never been great at dating. He didn't seem to know how to communicate that he was interested in a girl without a blunt, I like you. In high school, that had sent a couple of them skittering in the other direction. But other times, he'd noticed if he fell into a friendship, some girls would eventually make it clear they wanted something more from him. They would need to say, I want you to invite me to prom and make it splashy. Or something equally direct for it to sink in. He'd found that very helpful. And he'd asked his older siblings a lot of questions and read a lot of articles that helped him figure out when a girl was sending signals, and maybe even more importantly, when she wasn't. At first, when he and Tessa had begun hanging out, he hadn't seen any of those signals. His brother Liam had told him that interested girls would laugh extra hard at his jokes. But that didn't help him, because his jokes were funny. So why wouldn't anybody laugh? He couldn't tell if Tessa was interested or just had a decent sense of humor. His sister Megan had told him that girls would deliberately leave stuff with him as an excuse to see him again. A sweatshirt or earring, maybe even a purse or her phone. Tessa was organized to an almost scary extent. She always knew exactly where all of her stuff was and kept to her schedule, which he'd glimpsed once over her shoulder and it was both packed and meticulously planned. She never left anything with him accidentally on purpose, so he decided to take that as neutral. It was Liam's wife, Andy, who had given him the most helpful clue. She said to watch for Tessa to touch him. When he asked her in what way and how often, she'd said, if it would seem really weird for a guy friend to touch you the same way she does, then she's flirting with you. Nothing like that had happened for a long time, but toward the end of the semester, Tessa had begun to nudge him with her shoulder when he made a pun or give him playful pushes as they walked to the student union. Once, when they were studying on one of the couches in the Woodruff Lounge, she'd propped her feet on his lap and leaned back against the sofa arm to get more comfortable. Somehow that had sent a stronger zing up his spine than even the first time he'd made out with a girl after senior homecoming. It had unnerved and excited him all at once for such a simple touch to put all his senses on high alert. And it was finally the sign he'd been looking for, a clear one if Andy was to be believed, and she was pretty smart about such things. More moments like that had followed and Tessa didn't work up to them anymore. She simply climbed onto a sofa beside him and settled her legs across his lap before she dived into her NCEES licensing prep book or worked on differential equations. He'd ached to make a bolder move, but he let her set the pace, sensing that she would bolt if he moved too fast. He went home over Christmas break feeling optimistic that they'd be on new footing when they came back in January. 
At first, they were. They'd made sure to register for the same senior seminar class and planned their graduating project together. They fell right back into their routine of studying together all the time, Tessa's legs across his lap, their books and papers strewn about them. The night before their first exam in fluid mechanics, she'd fallen asleep and eventually twisted and wiggled so much that she flipped directions on the couch and settled her head in the spot her feet normally took, sound asleep the whole while. It had been the best night of Ethan's life up to that point, until she woke up. Even then, when she'd gathered herself together, disconcerted and blinking awake, he hadn't realized that everything was about to change between them. But she'd mumbled an embarrassed apology. He'd made a weak joke about her not needing to feel bad about enjoying the lap of luxury. And then she'd gathered her stuff and gone home. It was the last time things were normal between them. After that, it took a couple of weeks for him to recognize that she was brushing him off for every invitation to eat at the student center or study in the science building. But while he could be a little obtuse about girls, he wasn't completely clueless. He'd finally caught on and left her alone, interacting in a friendly and distant way on their seminar project, but never beyond that. Sarah had come along when he was feeling the sting of Tessa's quiet rejection, and he'd fallen into a relationship with her that had lasted for almost six years. Looking back, he'd say it was about five and a half years too long. He smoothed a strand of Tessa's hair that had fallen against her cheek, worried that her breath would stir it and tickle her awake. She was the same Tessa in so many ways, driven, focused, excited. In other ways, she was different. She was more polished now, which he guessed everyone sort of was so many years out of college. She'd also grown into her body more, acquiring softer curves and nicer clothes than the jeans she'd lived in. He didn't know much about women's hair, except that he'd always liked Tessa's. But it seemed a little different now, sleeker, maybe and not always in a ponytail. His fingers itched to touch it again after brushing it away, and he dared to wrap a strand of it around his finger. It slipped from his skin like silk. For a second, he wondered what it would be like to have her undivided attention now, the way he once had, whether the pull she was reasserting over him would work both ways this time. But it didn't matter. He had Kleber and the job of his dreams in Switzerland waiting for him. And even if they had agreed to a mutually satisfying fling, he suspected that opportunity existed in a different timeline that had ended when her sister dropped Calvin on her doorstep. Calvin gave a soft grunt in his sleep now, and Ethan glanced over at him. Cute kid. He hoped for both his and Tessa's sake that her sister pulled herself together and came back soon. He'd rarely been privy to the details of the women whose babies his parents had fostered for days, sometimes even weeks or months, until a suitable relative could take over, or until the mother could prove that her arrest or disappearance was all a big misunderstanding. But he knew enough to know that while the mothers often desperately wanted the babies returned, the other adults in the room rarely thought they were ready or able to take over again. There was no telling when Tessa would be free and clear, but she definitely wasn't in the position for a fun and temporary entanglement right now. And he wouldn't ask it of her. Not when he couldn't be sure that he wasn't just falling into it because she was here right now and he'd been hurting ever since Sarah. He knew himself well enough to know that a big part of the temptation here, beyond Tessa's curves and the tilt of her lips when she smiled, was the built-in expiration on the whole situation stamped on his Air Swiss ticket. That didn't mean he couldn't soak in this moment on the sofa for as long as it lasted, but he really was going to have to find a way to slide upright without waking Tessa or his back and knees would rebel. As carefully as if he were handling molten tungsten, 
he eased one foot from the coffee table and then the other. She slept on and he breathed a sigh of relief. But when he inched his way upright, she stirred. He froze, waiting for her to settle. Instead, she bolted upright. What? She blinked, a panicked look in her eyes as she scanned the room, her posture only relaxing the tiniest fraction when she spotted Calvin in his stroller. He's okay. Yeah, Ethan said softly, and she startled as if she hadn't even registered that he was there. Ethan. Hi, he fell asleep on his walk. You were passed out on the sofa when we came back. I meant to go home, but I sat down for a minute, and I think I fell asleep in about two seconds. She settled back against the sofa, not seeming to realize how close they were sitting, barely a foot between them. Then she turned toward him and leaned into his chest. I'm so tired. She had to be. She'd never sought such a direct physical connection to him before. But this was exhaustion speaking. Every word out of her mouth dripped with it, and it rose off the drooping lines of her body almost like waves. He put his arms around her and let her rest. Fine if it meant she fell asleep again and trapped him in another uncomfortable position while he waited for her to wake. After a minute or two, her hand slid up his chest and rested against his neck, her fingers brushing the hair at the nape of his neck. Goosebumps popped out from his hairline all the way down his arms, and he sent up a prayer that this would be the only way his body betrayed him, even though he'd never been a praying man. I'm so tired, Ethan, she said in a small voice. You're not sleeping enough. It's not just that. He kept quiet, leaving her space to explain if she wanted to. But he also wasn't sure he could have spoken as her fingers continued to softly tickle above his collar. Thank you for being here, she finally said, her voice almost dreamy. Did she realize what her fingers were doing? Her half-asleep state could mean that she wasn't even aware that she was touching him. Like the way he sometimes caught himself drumming his fingers idly, but then her hand stilled and slid up again, this time so that her thumb brushed against the corner of his lips, and she raised her head again, staring at his mouth before she leaned up, her lips clearly about to replace her fingers. Oh, man. He watched her carefully, stunned and grateful that the moment he'd just discounted ever experiencing with her had suddenly arrived. He'd ached for this for months back in college, and now that it was here, he wanted to absorb every second of it, from the soft, maddening rasp of her thumb against his lips to the look in her eyes. Wait, they had the glazed look of someone who wasn't fully present, and whatever else Tessa might be, she was always, always present. Carefully, he captured the tip of her wandering thumb in his mouth, sucking on it the tiniest bit to test her awareness. Her eyes flew open and she let go, straightening again, and this time when she blinked, Tessa was all the way back, alert, and now looking wary. What was that? she asked. I was wondering the same thing, he said. He should probably feel embarrassed that she looked so appalled, but the sudden pinkening of her cheeks made him fight a smile instead. He decided to savor the taste of her while she gathered her wits. He quietly watched her, waiting. You shouldn't, she started, and then trailed off before trying again. Why did you? But she stopped there too. Then she heaved a heavy sigh. Sorry. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. I was out of it. That too might have bothered him, except now he knew that when her defenses were down, she wanted him. And he was going to savor that right along with the taste of her skin and the warm weight of her against him as she slept. No problem, he said, proud of himself when his voice came out evenly. 
I really shouldn't have. But he didn't want to hear her regrets. It was his turn to make a move. So he did. Knowing she was fully awake and aware enough to pull away if she wanted to. He leaned toward her, giving her room to retreat, keeping his eyes locked with hers so she could read his intent. Instead of pushing him away or scrambling from the couch, her eyes fluttered closed. He wondered if she could feel his satisfied smile against her lips when he brushed his mouth against hers in an invitation. She stayed completely still, and when he pulled away the tiniest bit, in a silent communication meant to ask if this was what she wanted, she closed the gap again. This time, his kiss asked no questions as hers insisted that the kiss deepen, and he obliged, nearly sunk by the wave of feeling that crashed over him as he tasted her. She answered with a tiny groan, and it was more than he could take. This confirmation that even if he'd completely misread her all those years ago, she very clearly wanted him now. She twisted and rose to her knees to face him more fully, and he wrapped his arms around her waist to make it easier, pulling her into his lap as she melted against him. He could barely think over the rush of heat in his brain, across his cheekbones and through his chest. Whatever he thought had simmered between them, he couldn't have imagined this, a fire that flashed white hot and burned all the way through, growing hotter when she whimpered against his mouth again and pulled away to kiss her way down his jawline and taste him where his neck met his jaw. He bit back a curse at suddenly discovering it was one of the most sensitive parts of his body. How had he not known that after 28 years of living? And how had she found it in 30 seconds flat? He was angling to return the favor as her breaths came deep and fast. But a cry erupted from Calvin. They both froze. Then Tessa scrambled off him and nearly flung herself at the baby, fumbling to loosen his seat harness like both their lives depended on it though his cry seemed to only have been a warning shot, and he subsided. Tessa, hang on. She fussed with the harness longer than necessary and finally lifted Calvin to rest him against her shoulder, bouncing and shushing him though he still hadn't cried again. Ethan slid to the edge of the cushion and rested his arms on his knees as he watched her, which he could safely do without her catching him since she wouldn't look his way. Tessa, he finally repeated. Yeah? Still no eye contact. Do I owe you an apology? That got her attention. No, she said, almost sharply as her eyes flew to his. She took a deep breath. No, of course not. I think it's the other way around. You definitely don't owe me an apology for anything. I owe you at least a dozen by my count. That kiss better not be one of them. His eyes narrowed despite himself. It's the top of the list. He was surprised by how much that stung. Forget it. Seriously, I started it. Her eyes fell. I wish that were true. It would make this easier, but that was on me. I shouldn't have. What did she think she shouldn't have done? Burrowed against him, sleep flushed and irresistible? I had no objections. I wasn't thinking, she said. He smiled to know that he'd overloaded her circuitry enough to shut off her brain for once. He guessed it didn't happen often. It's not funny, she said, catching his smile. I dragged you out of the mountains to the desert thrown you into a huge project with a do-or-die deadline, abandoned you the day you show up only to haul you out of bed in the middle of the night to babysit, and now I'm mauling you. It all read so differently to him that he would have laughed if she didn't look so close to tears. Instead, he said, I volunteered for every one of those things. I was sick of standard labs and Helios is a much better way to pass time until my contract at Kleber starts. I know my way around a machine lab and Mary answered any questions I had. 
I offered to take a middle-of-the-night shift with the kid, and I kissed you first. Somehow that last point was the most important to him. He'd learned to let women make the first move so he could be sure of what they wanted. But he had initiated that kiss, and he was taking full credit for one of the greatest ideas he'd ever had. It was wrong. She said it to the baby. It felt very right. She closed her eyes and bounced Calvin a little faster. He's hungry. Do you mind making him a bottle? Sorry. He rolled his eyes, knowing she wouldn't see him. If she apologized to him one more time, he was going to kiss the word right out of her mouth. Sure, he said. He guessed she wanted time to pull herself together. So he made the bottle, checking the formula's temperature against his wrist before bringing it to her. I'm sorry I kept you here so long, she said, accepting it and cradling Calvin so he could drink more easily. Thanks for helping out. You should go get ready for work and I'll see you there. I'll swing by and get you. It's fine. I told you yesterday that I'd drive myself. It felt like the least efficient way possible for her to handle the situation. But her voice was tight, so he didn't push the carpool issue. Why don't you at least let me feed him while you take a shower or something? She met his eyes now, studying him for a few seconds. Why are you doing this? Because it's what I grew up with. When a baby needs help, you help. That hasn't changed even though I haven't lived around one since high school. She shook her head. Thanks, but you should go take care of yourself. You look like you slept in a pile of dirty laundry. She softened the insult with a smile, and he let her get away with it. Not the insult, which was more like an accurate statement, but with her change of subject. All right, he said, heading for the door. But we're going to talk about this later. Can't wait, she muttered. And it sounded not a little sarcastic as he closed the door behind him. Chapter 9 Oh no, oh no, oh no. How could she have been so stupid? Tessa dropped her head against the shower tile and let the water beat on the back of her neck for a minute, before she realized that she only had until the baby finished his bottle to get clean. She only shampooed her hair, not bothering with conditioner, did a quick wash of the rest of her, and did her best not to think about Ethan and her stupidity, as she scrubbed at dry spots like they had personally offended her. When she was done, she poked her dripping head out of the shower door to peek at the baby in his carrier. He was still working on his bottle, which she had propped up on a folded towel at exactly the right angle for him to eat. She could have conditioned after all, but she didn't bother, stepping out to give herself a vigorous toweling and change into work clothes. Maybe she'd eventually figure out the rhythm on this stuff and find time to condition her hair again. But for now, she'd have to make do with a French braid. It made her feel like a teenager again. But she'd be working with the CNC router today, and it was the easiest way to keep her hair completely out of her way. Calvin finished his bottle before she finished her braid, and she kept a wary eye on him as she raced through the plating and secured it with an elastic, ready to tie it off early and pick up the crying baby. But he merely watched her, and she scooped him up to burp him. He wiggled against her a few times, nestling into the crook of her neck before he gave a loud burp. She sighed that it was so easy until she felt a warm splash against her skin, and she whirled to examine her reflection in the mirror. It showed an impressive amount of spit-up dripping down her back, into and over her blouse but the baby looked happy. At least you're smiling, she said. I should have put a towel on my shoulder. That was my fault. Hang out on my bed for a second while I change. She laid him in the middle of her queen-sized bed, which dwarfed him. But when he didn't complain, she hurried to her closet to switch out her white button-down 
for the first blouse she came to. A plain turquoise one that looked better with necklaces or something to make it interesting. But what did she care? It's not like anyone noticed in the lab. Although Ethan might. Her hand drifted toward a purple one that always got her compliments from strangers. But she snatched her hand back and changed into the turquoise one. Thinking about Ethan is exactly how she'd landed in trouble this morning. Delicious trouble. Knock it off. She fetched the baby from the bed and discovered that he needed a new diaper, a new onesie, and her bedspread would need a thorough washing. She groaned and moved him to the floor. He kicked and protested, so she fished a clean pair of bald socks from her drawer and handed it to him to play with. He gummed it happily, and she quickly stripped the blanket from the bed ran downstairs for new pajamas and a diaper, and got him ready to go again. I'm going to have to wash all your clothes again tonight. You've only got one set of clean clothes after this. Don't poop on them, okay? He kicked like he agreed with this plan. By the time she hauled all his gear out to the car and got to work, she was wishing she'd just endured the mortification of dealing with Ethan and accepted his offer to carpool again. She pulled into the parking lot more than 20 minutes late and had to text Mary. Can you come play Sherpa and help me get baby and gear inside? The answer was quick. Yep. But it wasn't Mary who came out. It was Ethan. And before he could even rest his hand on her car trunk, she said, I don't want to talk about it. The look he gave her suggested that he thought this was a very dumb thing to say. Mary asked me to come and help, so I came to help. I wasn't planning on a conversation. Good. Yet. She scowled at him, but he ignored her and hefted the swing and the stroller onto the concrete. She set up the stroller, then transferred the baby into it. He'd been relatively quiet this morning and she'd noticed that other than wanting to be fed or needing a diaper change, it was usually his quietest part of the day. He does okay in the mornings, she told Ethan. He glanced at her as he scooped the swing over his shoulder. That's great. He sounded unsure of why she might be telling him this. I think it means we might get a lot of work done before he gets fussy again, if we're efficient. She thought he mumbled something about efficiency under his breath. But when she glanced over her shoulder, he was only maneuvering the portable crib into place beneath his other arm, so he could carry them both at once. Where did that bounce seat thing go? He asked. He seemed to like that. She winced. I forgot it. It's still in my garage. But that's okay because I forgot to wash it, and it kind of, sort of, really needs to be washed. He wrinkled his nose, and it made him unreasonably adorable. I remember. I have to wash a lot of stuff tonight. It was her turn to mutter as she pictured the growing pile of soiled linens and clothes in her bathroom. What was that? Nothing. They shuffled toward the building with their hodgepodge of stuff in tow. The receptionist and security guard both glanced their way but said nothing leading Tessa to believe that Mary must have already set them straight about their new infant co-worker. It was a quiet, awkward elevator ride down, but Tessa was thankful for it, because it was better than Ethan making good on his threat to bring up her throwing herself at him in the throes of her exhaustion. Although she'd been pretty awake once he'd nipped her thumb, that had shot like electricity straight down to her toes. The second the elevators slid open, she pushed out ahead of Ethan and parked the stroller against the far wall. Sorry I'm late, she said to Mary. There were some incidents trying to get out of the house this morning. It's fine. Tessa was grateful once again that Mary wasn't a micromanager. So long as the work got done, Mary didn't worry over much about the details. Can you set up the swing by my desk? 
she asked Ethan as he set the crib down beside the stroller. Sure. He didn't even look offended by the barely disguised order. It was one of the reasons she'd been so comfortable with him compared to other guys in their program. Her tendency to take charge not only didn't faze him, but he seemed to respect it. That had worked well, because the more stressful her life got, the more she tended to take charge of things. She'd been the worst right around midterm and finals, and an absolute nightmare by the time their senior project was due. But even at her worst, when he'd finally had to intervene, he'd talk to her diplomatically, as if her constant barking at him hadn't offended him in the least. She buckled the baby into the swing and booted up her computer. She'd changed her password the day before, something she always did in the grip of strong emotion, because there was something cathartic about typing out Rachel is the worst X10 several times a day. It reminded her that she had another unpleasant Rachel duty to attend to, and she fished her phone from her work bag to send her a text. Have you been using drugs? At this point, she doubted it, or at least she doubted that the baby was suffering withdrawal. He had long stretches of calm, and that didn't seem symptomatic of someone suffering the kind of withdrawals she'd witnessed in movies or TV shows. But really, what did she know about babies or drugs? Nothing. A few minutes later, Rachel responded. And while she was shocked that her sister had bothered, her emphatic no didn't surprise her. Tessa believed her, mainly because she knew what an addict looked like after being raised by one. Rachel had seemed exhausted and even depressed, but not high. Tessa knew what high looked like all too well. When are you coming back? She typed and sent it fast, so there was no way Rachel could pretend she hadn't seen it. The typing dots appeared and disappeared a few times, before they disappeared completely and her screen went dark. Rachel wasn't going to answer. Tessa wanted to pick up something and throw it. At home, she might have even let herself scream into a pillow. But that wasn't a luxury here. Instead, she typed her passcode again, striking each key much harder than she needed to. I need to get a chassis in here to run a sim, Ethan said. You're ready to do that? She'd expected it to take him until next week before he was ready to test. He shrugged. I will be by Saturday. Then, realizing that wasn't a workday, he frowned. Or I guess it can wait until Monday. No, if you are willing to come in Saturday, let's do it, Mary said. Sanjay nodded and Tessa turned to see how Darius felt about it. But his seat was empty. She looked around until she spotted him by the 3D printer. We're going to work Saturday, Darius, she called. He wouldn't care. They'd been doing that a lot lately. He gave her a thumbs up over his shoulder, but didn't look up from what he was doing. The baby still seemed fine, so she turned to her work and dove in, researching cadmium. It was one of the most frustrating things about green technology. Sometimes the solution to one environmental problem created a new one, like how wind farms generated astonishing amounts of electricity in places like Texas, but also decimated local bird populations. She was facing the same dilemma. Cadmium was the best material to use for the battery cells embedded in the solar road panels. But over time, it leached into the soil, which wasn't good for the surrounding ecosystems. She was lost deep in an article about battery recycling when one of her favorite scents in the world tickled her nose. Melting plastic. Ethan sniffed the air at the same time, and they both rose and headed to the 3D printer without a word. Sanjay trailing behind them. She examined the thin lines of plastic the 3D printer was laying down. In its simplest form, a 3D printer worked by feeding it a spool of plastic that it melted and squeezed out in the shapes the operator programmed it to. 
building it layer by layer from the base up. The melted plastic came out in precise strips a few degrees above melting. Too hot and it wouldn't hold its shape. She was thrilled by the precision with which the printer balanced temperature against form, and she could watch it for hours. In fact, she had several times during the project so far. Staring at it while her mind had worked through some of the thorniest parts of the road panel design, she guessed it helped her reach the same zen that Buddhist monks sought in monasteries. It reminded her of childhood, when she would drown out the chaos around her with marathons of how it's made, soothed by the precision and orderliness of the processes that produced everything from men's socks to kayaks. She'd admired the episodes where items required a human touch, but she'd loved the ones where pieces of food or plastic or aluminum progressed through a series of machines, each doing a tiny part of a larger job that generated a perfect product. Rolling off its assembly line and headed for inspection and packaging, Sanjay slipped in past Ethan, forcing him to step back from the 3D printer so Sanjay could see. What is it, Darius? Tessa asked. She couldn't figure out where the emerging component would fit in any of their current designs. An I.O. port, Sanjay asked. Grind connector? That was from Ethan. Power box cover, Tessa said. No, Darius said. And that was all he said. Tessa and Sanjay knew his silences well enough to know they wouldn't get an answer until he felt like giving them one. So they returned to their desks. Ethan watched for a few more minutes and eventually wandered back to his computer too. The baby began to fuss mid-morning, and before she could even kick herself for not having a bottle ready, Ethan said, I'll make his formula if you want to hold him. Sure, she said. She didn't want to have to accept his help again, but if she didn't, she'd either have to try to make the bottle while she held the baby, something she knew she was terrible at, or let him cry while she made it and risk him disturbing the whole lab. Number two nipple, Darius reminded Ethan, as he dug a bottle from the diaper bag. Uh, right. Thanks, man, he said and peered more carefully at the nipple before he hurried to the break room. Tessa took the baby out to the hall and bounced and walked him until Ethan stuck his head out and waved a bottle at her. She accepted it and went back to her seat, waiting for Calvin to finish. When five minutes had passed, with only about an ounce gone, she sighed down at him. Aren't you hungry? She whispered to him. I got something! Mary announced over her shoulder, startling her into popping the bottle out of the baby's mouth. She hurriedly replaced it when he gave a short cry of protest. I'll come check it out as soon as he's done, Tessa told her. No, it's for the baby. It's in baby quad. Come see if it works. Okay. Tessa had no idea what this was about but she dutifully followed Mary, who led her to Calvin's carrier. It now had a frame over it, a double set of PVC pipes with two elbow joints that looked like a miniature pair of gymnastics parallel bars. Each bar had a loop of dangling plastic like tiny nooses, or the chains one might find in a medieval dungeon for hanging prisoners on walls. Mary looked at her expectantly, But Tessa was a little afraid to ask what it was, so she shrugged and gave her an uncertain smile. It's a feeder, Mary said. These loops are adjustable, and you can put the kid in the carrier, situate the frame, load the bottle, tighten the loops on either end of it, shorten the length of the back one to create an angle, and then boom, kid can feed himself and free you up. Oh, Tessa said, interested now. She could see how it would work. This was what she liked most about Mary. She wasn't just a manager like some of the people Tessa had worked under. She was an engineer in her own right, 
and her solutions were usually clean and simple. Wow, if this works, it'll work. Mary didn't even wait to see if she was right, which meant that she was probably exactly right. She returned to her desk, and Tessa settled the baby into his carrier, then quickly removed his bottle and settled it into the straps. He fussed for a few seconds when it didn't automatically reappear, but it took her less than a minute to make sure the bottle was secure and slide the frame so that the nipple was level with his mouth. He latched onto it greedily, and she adjusted the back to make sure it flowed. Then she realized she had to set it all up by her desk so she could keep an eye on him, and he complained as she picked up his carrier and the contraption to relocate them. He settled down as soon as he got his bottle back. Nice, Ethan said, coming around to examine the setup. He inspected it closely, then returned to his desk and dove back into whatever he was doing on CAD. She barely resisted the urge to sneak a peek at it, but she hated it when people looked at her schematics before she was ready to share them. Ten more quiet minutes passed. And then she heard the soft whistle of a bottle sucked dry, and she leaned down to loosen it from its moorings. Ethan appeared again, and it was beginning to spook her, the way he kept appearing out of nowhere. He started to unbuckle the baby, saying, I'll burp him. No! Her tone was sharper than she'd intended, and his hands flew up, releasing the latch. Sorry she said when Ethan glanced at her, startled. I can do it. She got the baby out herself and settled into the nearly familiar burping routine. A sense of relief whispered through her that she was beginning to understand what she needed to do next. But sadness followed on its heels. The fact was that no matter how well she learned, she shouldn't know any of it because it was Rachel's job. But Rachel had broken the way she always did when things got a little tough. So here Tessa was, once again left with the pieces. The baby gave a small burp. You're good at that, she told him. Thank you. She didn't change him right away. He followed every feeding with a wet diaper a half hour later, so she'd just check in then. In the meantime, it didn't seem right that he should go back into his seat. Again. Or the swing. Again. Were babies supposed to do anything besides sit in chairs? All these experts said sitting too much was the next worst thing to smoking cigarettes. Granted, the little guy wasn't going to get up and train for a 5K anytime soon, but surely he was supposed to do something besides sit. She sat at her desk with the baby still against her shoulder and did a search for baby exercises. She got thousands of articles about everything from doing water baby swim classes, which wasn't doable in a lab, to exercises she was supposed to do for muscles she didn't know she had after she delivered a baby. She X'd out of that one in a hurry. The most common theme seemed to be tummy time which meant setting the baby on its stomach. That didn't seem like much exercise, but apparently it would help babies strengthen their necks by trying to lift their comparatively giant noggins. We'll try it, she said to the baby, but you have to go back in the swing for a minute. He did without complaint, and she pulled a blanket from his diaper bag and set it on the floor and laid him on his tummy. He didn't do anything for a few seconds. And then his head came up a little, and he peered around. She wondered what the lab looked like from floor level. He stayed that way for several seconds before his head bobbed up and down several times. And it occurred to her a split second too late that his neck was getting tired. And his head smacked the floor. The concrete floor. Oh no, she said, scooping him up immediately. The very deep breath he was drawing meant an ear-splitting scream was coming, so she hurried for the lab door, not quite making it before he let loose with the angriest yell she'd heard from him yet. 
I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, she murmured as the door latched behind her. But she doubted he could hear her. She couldn't even hear herself. Not that he would have understood her anyway, but she murmured it again and again while trying to check him for injury. There was no blood, but his whole face was flushed such an angry red that she couldn't be sure if he had any other marks on him. I'm so sorry, she said again, wishing the ability to kick herself was a literal thing so she could do it a couple of times. I should have thought that through. I didn't realize you didn't know how to let your head down softly. The door opened behind her, and she turned to tell Ethan to go back inside and let her deal with it. But it was Sanjay who stepped out, and right behind him, Darius. Ethan was right on their heels, and even Mary's head craned around the door. What happened? she asked. I tried to do tummy time, and I put him on a blanket, but it was thin, and he banged his head on the floor because his neck is a toothpick and I don't even understand how babies can do anything. She was glad his cries drowned out the end of her sentence, because her pitch had climbed to hysterical bystander levels. She reverted to shushing the baby, and she didn't know if she was trying to soothe him or herself. I, uh, I think we should let her handle it, Ethan said over the howls and shushes. Sanjay and Darius looked at each other with baffled expressions and shuffled back into the lab. Mary followed and Ethan stepped out. I'm not here to help, he said, as if he expected her to object. And she would have. The only thing worse than the baby's howls was causing them by her own stupidity. And the only thing worse than that was Ethan witnessing the whole thing. Then why are you out here? To... He stopped talking, like he couldn't come up with anything. Instead, he stepped closer to look at the baby. Maybe to check him for injuries as if she hadn't already thought of that. But this was a case where it was definitely better to be safe than sorry. So she bit back any protest. Finally, he leaned down and placed his mouth near the baby's ear. Was he talking to him? Asking him to assess his pain level and assign a number to it? Point to his owie? But within seconds, the baby's cries grew softer, and Tessa realized Ethan was singing. A few moments more and the baby's cries were gone altogether, his color returning to normal as he settled down to shuddering hiccups. And now Tessa could hear the words to Ethan's tune. Was he... Was he singing about popcorn on an apricot tree? What in the world? You're going to have to teach me that song, she said to Ethan, as even the wet hiccups slowed down. The baby seems to like it. Ethan nodded, but kept singing until the baby's eyes drifted closed. When they'd stayed that way for a couple of minutes, he stopped singing and straightened watching cautiously to make sure he didn't need to leap into lullaby action again. You never say his name, he said, as he turned to open the lab door. What? That made no sense. You call him the baby, or sometimes the little guy, but you never call him Calvin. That's not... The door was already closing behind him, so she didn't finish the sentence. But it wasn't true. I call you Calvin, she said quietly to the sleeping baby, except it felt awkward on her tongue because of underuse. She didn't even really think of him as Calvin in her own mind. It was always the baby there too. Great, one more thing she wasn't getting right. I'm sorry, she said. I'm sorry, Calvin. Pressure built through the back of her throat and in her sinus cavity, and it had been so long since she'd cried that it took her a minute to realize that it was the threat of tears. Dang, she hated being sleep-deprived. She took a few deep breaths and carefully shifted Calvin so she could pinch the bridge of her nose until the tears receded. When she was sure they weren't going to sneak up on her again, she walked into the lab 
hopeful she could ease him down for a nap. Four heads turned her direction when she stepped through the door, and not one of them was where it was supposed to be. Instead, clustered over something in baby quad. What's going on? She mouthed. Mary straightened. Darius made you something. Tessa walked over, curious now, and they parted to reveal the baby carrier again, also with a PVC frame hanging over it, but a single one this time, with several objects dangling from its crossbar. What is it? She asked softly. They were shapes, she realized as she reached it, all flat black plastic shapes, all simple. An X, square, triangle, circle, and diamond all hung from zip ties. I read that babies this young like strong black and white graphic shapes, Darius said. I thought if he gets fussy this afternoon again, he might like to look at them. Wow, she said. I didn't know that. Is that what you were printing? He ducked his head in answer. This time, she couldn't help it. A tear slipped out. One that apparently hadn't dried up in the hallway under the sheer force of her will. Thank you, she managed. Now nobody looked at her, probably feeling as uncomfortable as she did when someone else cried. Except for Ethan. Instead of looking away, Ethan came to her with his arms outstretched to take Calvin. And she let him, watching as Ethan settled him into the waiting crib before she fled to the ladies' room to pull herself together. Chapter 10 I want to offer to help tonight, but I don't want you to kill me, Ethan said to Tessa as they packed up Calvin and all his stuff for home. She didn't say anything as she wrangled the swing closed. So how about if I take a shift? Call me when you're ready to go to bed. Her eyes flew to his, scandalized, and he winced. That came out very, very wrong. I meant I could come over then and crash on your couch and tell his middle-of-the-night feeding or crying, and you can finally get a true full night of sleep. She shook her head before he even finished. Thanks, but no thanks. He dropped the offer in favor of helping her pack up, and they made the trip to her car with baby in gear. He loaded the trunk and shut it as she straightened from buckling Calvin in. What if I promise not to bring up the kiss? Would you let me help then? Ethan, she said. That was it. She followed it with a tired-sounding sigh and an attempt to shove her fingers through her hair. One of her thinking habits he remembered well. But her braid stymied her, and she let her hand drift down to her side. I'm not trying to get anything from you, he said. You're doing a hard thing. You're my friend. I want to help. Until I recruited you for this job, we hadn't spoken in six years. Were we friends and I missed it? A distinct edge of anger ran through the words, and it surprised him. Was I supposed to reach out? He asked, genuinely confused. You made it pretty clear during senior seminar that you wanted nothing to do with me outside of the project. A few different expressions flickered across her face, and he wasn't sure what to make of them, other than it looked as if she was having an argument with herself. You're right, she said. I wanted to keep things strictly about work then and I want to do that now. I need you to back up, give me some space, and quit reading so much into things. I need your whole brain for work, but I don't need anything for this. She nodded toward Calvin. Reading so much into things, he repeated. She at least had the decency to look away. Must have been someone else who climbed into my lap and wrapped herself around me this morning. Her mouth tightened, and she shut Calvin's door softly, but every line of her body screamed how much she wanted to slam it. She went around to her side and started the car, as regret washed over him. That hadn't been fair of him to say, or maybe it had, but it had been the wrong moment, and the last thing Tessa needed was to deal with anything between them, 
on top of trying to take care of Calvin. He hurried to her window and knocked. She ignored him and put the car into gear. It's about the baby, he called through the window. She tightened her hands on the steering wheel, turning her knuckles white before she relented and lowered the window. I talked to my mom. She said he's not showing withdrawal signs. I know. Rachel said she wasn't using. She said he's missing her. Rachel, that he probably feels it the most in the middle of the night. She said the only thing you can really do for him if he wakes up crying again and nothing else works is to distract him so he forgets for a minute why he's so sad. She turned her head toward the passenger window, and he was treated to a view of the back of her head for several seconds, lost as to what she might be thinking, without being able to read her face. It was easy to see what she thought and felt written across it, he realized. That wasn't his experience with most people. Sarah had often gotten on him for not reading her better, in fact. When Tessa faced him again, she said, Thanks, I'll keep that in mind. She rolled up her window and he stepped back. She pulled out without glancing his way. He stopped by the grocery store on his way home for enough ramen packs to get him through the remaining five weeks in Palm Valley. It definitely wouldn't take a Costco case, and that caused a weird pang in his chest. At home, he set up his desktop computer because he preferred working on a larger monitor when he did anything in CAD. He slurped his noodles because Sarah wasn't around to tell him not to, and he toyed with the design for the relay that would need to run between the Prius they were using and the road surface. Sanjay's job as their electrical engineer was to find a way to make that energy transfer efficient, or it would cost far more to run the car than a gasoline engine would. But Ethan had to figure out a mechanical design that would withstand the constant friction, something durable but cost-effective that, when manufactured, didn't create a new environmental problem. It was hard work. Breakthroughs were rare, but when they came, they truly changed things. Mines, communities, sometimes entire countries when they embraced the new technology— the Helios project was a chance to be part of a giant leap forward, and they were close, but not quite there. He had only four weeks to help them close the gap or lose their shot for the foreseeable future. This was a rare opportunity, and even if Tessa didn't feel like she could count on him for his experience with babies, he could at least prove his worth here because it had been a long time since he'd felt worth anything to a woman, and he wasn't going to blow this chance. Two hours later, he'd run and discarded several designs for the relay, and his brain needed a break. He wondered how Tessa was doing, and if Calvin was letting her get anything done. He glanced at the time on his monitor. Almost nine. Maybe they were both asleep. It would be the best thing for them, Tessa had been unusually emotional today. Or no, not that unusual. She'd always struck him as having big feelings running beneath her surface. She'd been unusually expressive of those emotions. They'd both been prone to working out their frustrations on their senior seminar project in curses, not crying. And that single tear she'd let slip had unnerved him. Sleep would help her with that but that all depended on Calvin. He opened a browser and checked the state CPS website again for specific information he could give her the next day that might help. He knew nothing about her sister or how long it might take her to pull herself together and return, but Tessa couldn't possibly maintain the stress of the Helios deadline and a sudden infant indefinitely. There had to be some compromise here, something that could help her. Soon he was lost inside this new problem. He might not be thrilled with Tessa refusing to talk to him about the intense moment they'd shared on her sofa that morning, but she was fraying, bits of her temper and composure coming undone, and she and Calvin both deserved better, even if she didn't see it yet. 
He'd help her to see it, though. He'd fix this, and then they could get back onto the comfortable footing they'd had for the 12 hours on Monday, before her sister showed up to ruin everything. Most of all, Tessa's life. Chapter 11 We hate buckles, don't we, Calvin? Tessa whispered, as she removed him from his carrier and placed him carefully on her bed. He'd fallen asleep on their walk, and she should have let him be until he woke on his own. But she'd made up her bed again with linens fresh from the dryer, and it had brought back a rare happy memory from childhood. Her mother tossing a fresh from the dryer sheet into the air, and letting it drift down to settle on Tessa and Rachel as they giggled, over and over again. Settling him in the middle of fresh, warm sheets seemed so much better than leaving him in his carrier. He was already stuck there so much. That needed to change. I'm going to get ready for bed, then I'll come back and fold your clothes. It was almost ten, earlier than she usually went to sleep, but her pillow had been luring her for an hour already. When Calvin had fussed even after dinner and a diaper change, She'd tried Ethan's trick of a walk, and sure enough, Calvin had settled right down and conked out shortly. She should, too. She eyed the laundry basket full of newly washed baby clothes beside the bed, waiting for her to sort and fold. Maybe those could wait? A jaw-cracking yawn escaped her. Yeah, they'd have to wait. She needed sleep more than anything right now. In the adjoining bathroom, she quickly did her night routine, unbraiding her hair so that she didn't wake with a headache. She was just applying her moisturizer when a shriek tore through the air and she bolted into the bedroom. But there was no Calvin. What the? She ran to the empty bed as another, far more muffled cry sounded from her laundry basket. And there he was, face down in the laundry, screaming. Oh no, oh no, baby, oh no, she said, even as she scooped him out. She set him on the bed again, running her hands over him lightly to check for any injuries. This time he had an angry red lump on the side of his head. No, no, no. Wasn't his whole head a soft spot? What if he were seriously injured? Panic shocked every one of her systems into wakefulness but the jolt didn't clear her thinking at all. A flood of what-ifs tore through her brain while she tried to figure out what to do next. But Calvin kept screaming, and she couldn't think. Could. Not. Think. So much crying. She grabbed her phone and dialed the only person who'd had any answers up to this point. When Ethan answered, she babbled. Come over here, please. Now. I hurt him. Please just come. Tessa, what's... But she threw the phone toward the head of the bed, away from Calvin, who she left lying in the middle, never taking her eyes off of him as she slid down the wall, her hand over her mouth, horrified that she had hurt him again. A few minutes later, the door opened, and Ethan called her name, but she didn't answer. Calvin's screams would let Ethan know where to find them, and within 30 seconds, his footsteps pounded upstairs and he burst into the room, wild-eyed. What's going on? he asked, but she closed her eyes, too ashamed to tell him. There was a rustle and some shushing as he picked up Calvin. Tell me what happened, Tessa, Ethan said over the cries. I can't help if I don't know. He rolled off the bed and hit his head when I was washing my face. Then, unable to tolerate the sounds of Calvin's cries, the ones she had caused, she crawled to her closet and slipped inside, pulling the door shut behind her. This had been far more common in her childhood than freshly billowing sheets. Crying, chaos, and her hiding with Rachel until the chaos subsided outside. Her mother and current loser boyfriend either tired out or having taken off, one chasing the other to get the last word in, or, more often, 
her mother chasing the man, begging him to come back. After a couple of minutes of soft murmuring from Ethan, Calvin's cries settled down, but she didn't want to come out. The last thing he needed was for her to take over again. Tessa? It was Ethan, and it sounded like he was right outside the door. Yeah? Can I open the door? Yeah. He did, and sat down outside of it facing her, the baby having settled down and quiet again. I think the fact that he's crying is probably a good sign. The carpeting probably cushioned his fall. He didn't fall on the carpet, she said. What? She cleared her throat and spoke louder. He didn't fall on the carpet. He fell into the laundry basket and he hit his head. She forced herself to meet Ethan's eyes. Here, she said, pointing on her own head to where he could find the lump on the baby. He shifted Calvin so he could look, and she knew the moment he spotted it, his brows furrowing. Just a second, he said then got up and walked out, probably to call CPS on her, which is what should have happened days ago. She wrapped her arms around her knees and waited. A few minutes later, he came back. I FaceTimed my mom and showed it to her. She says that she's seen worse and there's no lasting harm. I was right that him crying is a good thing. He's going to be fine. Don't worry. How can I not worry? she said, her head flying up so she could glare at him. This is the second time in one day that he's hit his head on my watch because I don't know what I'm doing. I had no idea he could move himself out of the center of the bed, and he got really hurt because of it. I shouldn't be doing this. I can't do this. Hey, 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 he said, his tone as soft as the one he used to soothe Calvin. You're doing your best here, and that's what matters. It's not good enough. She dropped her head back to her knees. It's better than a lot of babies get. Trust me, I saw dozens come through our house. You're doing fine, and you won't make the same mistakes twice. No, I'll just keep making new, worse ones. He didn't answer for so long that she looked up again. He was bouncing a completely quiet Calvin his own expression far away as he chewed on his bottom lip, in the universal sign of someone working something out. Hold him, he said, and crouched and handed Calvin to her. She accepted the baby on instinct, but then immediately tried to hand him back. No, you take him. Give me a minute, he said. I have an idea. I'll be right back. A few minutes passed, and she stayed stiff still sitting in the closet holding the baby, afraid to breathe too hard in case she jostled him. I'm so sorry. She said it so softly it was almost more like mouthing the words than whispering. Where was Ethan? He needed to come and take the baby. Her heart rate slowed as Calvin grew warm and heavy in her arms. The lump already looked smaller, and while sometimes he slept with a pinched look around his eyes, at the moment he looked peaceful. She wondered if she should worry about that, but his breaths were strong and even. She couldn't give the baby away to Ethan. What was he supposed to do? Haul Calvin with him like a puppy for three weeks until he left for Switzerland, while she hoped Rachel came back? She heard Ethan's footsteps on the stairs again then the creak of the floor in her room. She couldn't see him around the corner of the dresser next to the closet, but lots of rustling, and a few minutes later, he appeared again at the closest door. Can I have Calvin for a minute? And you should come see this. She handed the baby off to him and rose, feeling stupider by the second for fleeing to the closet like she was still six years old. I made this. I think Calvin had the right idea. He emptied the laundry basket onto her bed, and she looked away from the jumble of her lacy underwear, mixed in with all Calvin's pajamas. What was a lingerie show-and-tell at this point in a long line of humiliations Ethan had witnessed in the last 48 hours? 
Ethan pointed to the bottom of the basket, which now had a cushion. He obviously needs to be kept in some kind of restricted space to sleep, or who knows where he'll creep or roll. I thought you could use this as a temporary solution until you can get a more permanent crib. She walked closer, still too embarrassed by her meltdown to meet his eye, and examined the rig. What's this cushion? she asked. It was firm, but felt more like a mattress than the bottom of his portable crib did. I took the seat cushion off your chair downstairs and cut it down to fit the basket. Then I borrowed one of your pillowcases to cover it like a sheet. Babies aren't supposed to sleep on something as soft as a pillow because of... He trailed off when his glance caught her expression. She wasn't even sure what it looked like, but he changed the subject. Basket cribs like this are called bassinets. They're meant to stay by your bed. You can buy fancy ones, but they're pretty much the same thing. I'll order some foam and fix your chair. Is he asleep? She nodded. Let's try this. He gestured toward the basket. Carefully, as though he were China, she laid Calvin in the basket. He had several inches between his head and feet and the ends of the basket, and even a couple of inches on either side. He didn't stir, and Ethan nodded. He'll sleep all right, which means that it's time for us to talk. Really, Ethan? Because I appreciate you coming over here, but do I look like I'm in any condition to talk right now? Her insides felt like they'd been wrung like a washcloth, and she was ready to collapse. She wasn't sure she'd be able to sleep while she worried about Calvin, but she was sure she couldn't stay upright for another minute. I didn't mean about us. I meant about your sister. Rachel? She must be even more tired than she thought, because this conversation was making less sense by the sentence. There's nothing to say. She's not using drugs. She'll pull herself together and come back soon. The end. She wasn't so sure, though. Now that she'd seen how hard it was trying to take care of Calvin for three days, she understood a tiny bit better why Rachel had said, I'm tired inside my bones. How long would it take Rachel to recover from four months of exhaustion? Soon was feeling naive. But... Stop. Her voice was sharp, and Ethan flinched, but she was too tired to find a nicer way of saying it. I can't. I'm so thankful you came over to help with this, but I just can't. Ethan nodded. All right, I'll see you at work tomorrow, but call me if you need anything else. He was almost to the door when she said his name again. I do need something. I need to know why you're doing this. When you're leaving in less than a month. He paused, toying absently with the strike plate on the door jam. Why did you kiss me this morning? Because you're leaving in less than a month? It was both completely true and part of a bigger truth. She'd needed the comfort in that moment, but she wouldn't have let her guard down enough to kiss him if there wasn't an exit built in. He was leaving, and there weren't any consequences to taking comfort in the moment. Were there? That had seemed to be the gist of her fuzzy dawn thinking, now, in her fuzzier, sleep-deprived brain, she couldn't decide if her reasoning had made any sense. She wasn't even sure she remembered what reasoning was. Had she ever been capable of reason? She sank down on her mattress, and Ethan left with a soft promise to keep his ringer on. She crept beneath her covers and closed her eyes, but she still lay awake for a long time, listening for Calvin and cursing her sister. Ethan was right. It was time to talk about Rachel. But how was she supposed to explain the biggest failure of her life? Chapter 12 Ethan's phone didn't ring again that night, and when his alarm went off without an SOS from Tessa, he didn't know whether to be worried or relieved. Did it mean everything had gone all right, or just that she wouldn't call him if it didn't? It had been so hard to leave her last night. 
she'd stopped his breath for a minute when he'd opened her closet door. Her straight hair was a wild mass of waves, probably from the tight braid she'd kept it in all day, and she looked untamed in a way that tugged on something in his gut. But the panic and exhaustion on her face had tugged even harder at his heart. He texted to ask if she needed help getting Calvin into the car, but she didn't answer. He hadn't really expected her to. He dressed and decided to skip breakfast and head into work early. Maybe he'd beat someone in besides Tessa for once, but he also wanted a chance to talk to his mom on the drive. Hi, honey. Something wrong? She asked when she picked up the phone. Why does something have to be wrong for me to call? He asked. There doesn't if it's your usual Sunday night call, but it's Thursday morning. So... He sighed. Fine. Tessa needs help. It's more than I can give her. I'm willing to help her as much as I can while I'm here, but I'm only here for 24 more days. So what do I do? How are you trying to help? She asked. He explained about the baby scooting off the bed and how he made Calvin a bassinet. He explained how he'd begged Tessa to call any time she needed a break, offered to take over middle-of-the-night feedings, and tried to talk to her about Rachel. She doesn't listen, Mom. She doesn't, or you don't. Her tone was gentle, but the subtle criticism still stung. She doesn't. No matter what I say or how I try to say it, she shuts me down. Won't talk to me about anything. Maybe it's because she's not sure you will listen, because you're doing a lot of talking. I get it. You're a problem solver. I am too. I've learned not to rush in with solutions all the time. But you called me for advice, so I'm assuming you're interested in a few solutions? Yeah. I'm at a loss here. Well, that was your first solution I just gave you by example. Ask if she wants you to solve the problem. Maybe she doesn't. Maybe she just needs to know she's not alone. But she's making a really big deal about doing this alone. It sounds like that's exactly what she wants. That's because you're very literal-minded. Remember all our conversations about subtext? Subtext. She'd worked on the idea of subtext with him since he was a teenager, trying to explain to him that much of what people actually meant wasn't in the words, but under them. Sometimes he got it. In the early years with Sarah, he'd worked hard on reading her subtext, learning when, I don't really care where we eat, really meant, I'm testing to see if you remember my favorite restaurant and suggest it. And nothing's wrong meant you said or did something wrong and now you have to guess what it was. He'd failed so often that he'd finally gotten to a point of taking her literally again, forcing her to be verbal and specific about what she wanted or needed. I'm out of practice, he admitted. It's hard, his mom said. Sometimes people tell us things in subtext that they don't even know they're saying. That might be what you're running into here. But that... Makes no sense, she finished for him. It doesn't make logical sense, but it makes perfect emotional sense. Do you have any idea why Tessa doesn't seem to trust offers of help? Is it something about her past? That might help you make more sense of her. Not really, he admitted. She's always been pretty independent, to the point of stubbornness. She never mentions her parents, and it sounds like Rachel has a history of being wild. So I'm guessing an unstable family life growing up? I don't know. Find out. That's my advice. Don't offer any solutions. Just sit and listen. He was quiet for so long that his mom asked if he was still there. Yeah. Aren't you going to tell me not to wade in when I'm leaving so soon? Of course not. Helping for three weeks is better than not helping at all. Figure out why she doesn't want help. Then ask her to tell you how you can help anyway. 
Sounds like she needs it desperately, but then beats herself up every time she asks for it. You're smart, Mom. Just lived long enough to figure out some stuff. Hang in there, son. He pulled into the BBMJ lot, which was a quarter full, even though he was a half hour early this time. But when the doors to the lab slid open and he spotted only Sanjay and Mary, he was almost as pleased with himself for beating Darius into work as he was when he got his first interview with Cleaver. How early do I have to get here to beat you? He asked Sanjay as he passed him. Sanjay blinked. You can't. Mary shot him a wry smile. It's true, no one has ever gotten here before Sanjay. He threw a look at the other man. What if I slept here? I'd beat you in then. Sanjay gave him a slight smile and turned back to his work. Spooky, he said to Mary. She shrugged. Five minutes later, Darius arrived and bustled over to his station, dropped his work bag, then headed straight to Baby Quad. What was that about? But it wasn't any of his business, so he settled into his own work, already deep into it when Tessa pushed Calvin's stroller from the elevator at 8 a.m. exactly. She looked more like the Tessa he'd seen Monday night before her sister had upended everything. The skin under her eyes wasn't puffy, and her hair looked brushed and smooth, though a small part of him missed the wild and untamed mane of the night before. It was as if her hair had revealed a layer to her that he hadn't seen before. But if she was feeling as pulled together inside as she looked now on the outside, then that was the best outcome of all. Sanjay rose from his chair and went back to Baby Quad which Darius had deserted. Going to see building, Darius said to Mary, hefting a reusable grocery sack over his shoulder. Back in 20. Mary nodded. Tessa headed to baby quad too, locking the stroller wheels and detaching Calvin's carrier. I made him this, Sanjay said, and Ethan glanced over to see what he'd come up with this time but all he could see was them bent over and studying a square of cloth on the floor. Tessa smiled and patted his back, and Sanjay proceeded to drag whatever it was over to the empty space beside her desk while she unhooked Calvin's safety buckles. What is it? Ethan asked as Sanjay settled the fabric. It was about three feet square and looked like a thick blanket with clamps around the edges. Baby Matt, he said. Then he went back to his own desk. Curious, Ethan climbed out of his chair and went over to examine it. Sanjay had taken a floor mat, like the ones beneath the larger lab machines for absorbing the vibrations, so they wouldn't shake the rest of the floor. He'd covered it with one of the thin blankets Mary had bought, and she'd bought five packages of thin blankets a sign that even unflappable Mary had panicked in the superstore baby aisle. The clamps were rubber-tipped, avoiding the pitfall of sharp edges. Sanjay's engineering was blunt and pragmatic, but while he didn't make beautiful things, the solutions themselves were elegant. He doubted Calvin would care about the utilitarianism of his mat, but he would probably find it more comfortable than lying so directly on the floor. How come Ethan hadn't thought of a solution like that? Or Darius's shape mobile that Tessa now set up over him? Do you have the other stuff in your car? Want me to go get it? He blurted to Tessa, anxious to help too. Tessa's lips began to purse, and he could see the no forming. But she pressed them together for a split second, smiled, and said, Sure, that would be helpful. She handed him the keys and told him where she had parked. He smiled when he opened her trunk and saw that instead of the portable crib, she'd brought the laundry bassinet. When he stepped from the elevator a few minutes later carrying it and the swing, Tessa was waiting for him. Thanks for coming to the rescue again last night. You're doing better than you think you are. He kept his reply low. She shook her head, but took the laundry basket and walked with him silently to Baby Quad to leave the new items. 
I'd like to talk later, she said. He almost said, I think that would be so good for you, but his mom's advice overrode his mouth, and he said simply, I'd like to listen. Maybe there would be a chance to tell her what he'd learned about the resources DCS could offer, but maybe he would need to save that for another time. He added only, You look rested this morning. I am. He slept six hours straight before he wanted to eat. I think the bassinet helped. Good. An awkward silence fell between them for a few seconds before she cleared her throat and jerked her head toward her desk to indicate that she'd be returning to it. He followed her, and the next two hours passed quietly, except for the return of Darius, still schlepping his grocery bag, and the clack of keyboards as everyone pursued their work. When Calvin began to get restless, kicking and turning his head more, Tessa went straight to the break room to make him a bottle and had it in his new bottle sling and ready for him right in the middle of his first full cry. Mary hurried over to fuss with the contraption, but when Calvin settled right down to eat, she returned to her desk. It was quiet again for 15 minutes until Calvin finished and needed burping, which he accomplished so loudly that Darius jumped up and ran over to Tessa to give the baby on her shoulder some knuckles and congratulations. Even Calvin's cry for a diaper change was a minor disruption, and when he fell asleep for his nap around 11, Tessa put him in his laundry basket and sat down again with a sigh. You're doing good, Mama, Darius said, before turning back to his computer. But since Ethan watched Tessa more than he did anything else, including his own work, he saw her mouth form a hard line and her shoulders tense. He reached into his work bag and came up with two cups of noodles. I'm going to take an early lunch, and I've got extra. Can I make you some? She shook her head. No thanks. I need to take advantage of his nap. He seems to have one major meltdown a day, and since it hasn't been at the same time so far, I want to get as much as possible done before it happens. He nodded and put the cups back in his bag. He wasn't actually hungry either. Even when he did go warm up his food an hour later, Calvin was still sound asleep, and Tessa had the laser focus he'd been so awed by in college. Constantly scanning her monitor, typing periodically, clicking every now and then, and scanning some more. Maybe she'd feel better now that she was getting her work done. So was everyone else, and Calvin was fine except that he let out a cry right then, and Tessa started the whole feeding, burping, diapering routine over. This time, when she set him down on Sanjay's mat, he cried. Ethan hurried to pull the swing over, but that didn't work either. Sanjay clapped his hands over his ears, but otherwise kept his eyes on his screen. I'm so sorry, Tessa said, pulling Calvin out of the swing but she seemed to be apologizing to the lab at large. She walked and bounced him. That worked after a couple of minutes until she tried to set him down again. Then the wails started back up. I got this, Darius said, coming over with his grocery bag. He set it down and pulled out several of the blankets Mary had bought. Only now they were all sewn together and emerged from the sack like a stream of colorful handkerchiefs from a magician's pocket. What's that? Tessa asked. And Ethan was glad because he wanted to know too. It's for baby wearing, Darius said. Let me guess, Tessa said. And her voice was loaded with resignation, but laced with humor too. You read an article about it. Yeah? and then I went over to C Building and asked them to sew these together, and I watched a couple of tutorials, and it's very smart how the tribal mothers did this, and how lots of moms do it now. Sometimes newer isn't better, he said, nudging the now empty baby swing aside. Can I try? You want to wear the baby? Ethan asked. He hadn't ever really seen anyone do that before, but that didn't mean anything. He'd quit paying attention to baby stuff when he'd left for college. 
Is that okay? Darius asked Tessa. His face scrunched in anxious lines. Won't it make it hard for you to work? He shook his head. Not the way I'm going to do it. Why not, she said, raising her voice as Calvin's crying grew louder. It's not like this is working. Can I do it too? Sanjay asked. Bro, I figured this all out. Wait your turn. But you can help me wrap up. Come over here. Then he handed the blankets over to Sanjay, held out his hands for the baby, and Tessa, not looking at all certain about this turn of events, gave him Calvin. Darius carried the baby in front of him, arms fully extended, back to his computer. Bring the wrap, Sanjay. Sanjay hurried over, and soon they were bent over Darius's screen. The first step apparently involved sticking Calvin's front against Darius's back, in the approximate position of a backpack. Then there was some blanket wrapping around Calvin's back and Darius's torso. And soon there were so many overs and unders of limbs and blankets that Ethan lost track almost right away. But it served to distract Calvin, who was quiet through all of this. And it was probably the only reason Tessa didn't say anything either. Although she watched the proceedings with a worried face. Finally, Darius stood and gave either end of the wrap a firm tug. Come and see, Tessa. She did, checking the tautness of the fabric. The position allowed Calvin to either look around or rest his head on Darius's shoulder, which is what he decided to do now. Seems secure, she said, stepping back. It is, Darius said. Now don't worry, he's going to come with me while I do some component work. Then he headed toward the maker quad to tinker with the 3D printer. Calvin still content against his back. Huh. Ethan and Tessa said at the exact same time. Mary had watched all of this without comment, but now she rose and went to Tessa's desk. Could I talk to you in the break room? She kept her voice low, but Ethan sat too close to avoid eavesdropping. Sure, Tessa said, and although she didn't sound or look any different, he could still sense a shift in her, a tightening but almost like it was coming from inside her. As they disappeared into the break room, Ethan stared after them and tried to ignore the churning in his gut. Was Tessa's barely standing house of cards about to collapse completely? Chapter 13 What's wrong? Tessa asked. Mary had never pulled any of them aside privately before. But Tessa wasn't sure why she even asked when she knew the way she always knew unpleasant things in her bones. This was about Calvin. It's about Calvin. Tessa almost smiled at how right she'd been, except it wasn't like it would have taken a genius to figure it out. I'm sorry he's such a distraction, she said, leaning back against the break room counter. I'll figure out the childcare thing soon. I know he can't be at work. It's not that, Mary said. And Tessa's eyebrows shot up. I mean, it is, Mary amended. But it's not because he's a distraction. I'm fine with him being here. Sanjay and Darius don't seem to care, and they're each making good progress on their components. So it's fine with me. I'm not worried about the baby. I'm worried about you. Me? Guilt swept over her. I'll get my stuff done, Mary. You know I will. No one cares more about getting this prototype working. It's not that either. Mary's interruption was gruff even for her. It's... You don't look right. You can't work this many hours and take care of a baby all by yourself and keep up that pace indefinitely. You're going to collapse. I'll be okay. I found a better way for him to sleep, which means I slept more, and I feel so much better today. And I haven't given up on the idea of finding childcare for him. It's just been busy. 
That plus not having the first clue about where to check next had pretty much ground her search to a halt. But she'd... You'll what? Her common sense snapped at her. You still have no idea how to solve that problem. I looked into it a little bit last night, Mary said. If you're declared his legal guardian, then it makes things easier for you. You get state funds to help with his care, for one. Money isn't really an issue, she muttered. BBMJ hired the best because they could afford to. And since she'd worked in fully endowed graduate programs, she didn't have school debt to pay off. Between her salary and her modest spending habits, she was flush. It's more than that, Mary said. They offer parenting classes and leads for state-licensed child care providers. All of which gets Calvin out of the lab. I get it. She straightened and turned toward the door, the last bit of well-being she'd regained after getting some sleep evaporating. I don't think you do. Listen, Mary said. And this was followed by a pause and a long sigh. I don't know anything about parenting, so maybe I'm projecting how I would feel onto you, but I would be completely overwhelmed without the first clue about what to do, and that would make me feel even more overwhelmed. Of course I want to make sure the kid gets the right kind of help. Of course I do. But honestly, I'm worried about you here, and I'm trying to help you. Calvin can hang out as long as he needs to. I trust you to get the work done. I just worry about the toil it'll take on you while you're trying to figure it out. Okay, I understand. But I don't, so help me. Are you going to contact CPS? No. Why not? I read up on this a lot last night. There is next to zero chance they're going to take the kid from you unless he's the subject of a custodial kidnapping. That sped Tessa's heart rate up as fast as it had when she'd read Rachel's note. She'd taken Rachel at her word that Calvin's father was out of the picture, because it fit every pattern she'd ever seen for biological fathers. But what if Rachel had taken him and the father wanted him? Her panic must have registered on her face, because Mary's eyes widened. I'm sure that's not it. I wasn't trying to scare you. I was trying to reassure you that you could report the situation and keep Calvin with you if that's what you want. But now that Mary had planted the idea in her mind, it was pushing every other thought out of it. Excuse me, she said. She fled straight to her computer, with Mary right after her, to search child abduction plus Florida. Right away, it returned a list of current Amber Alerts, and none of them matched Rachel or Calvin. She took her first deep breath since Mary had mentioned it. You okay? Mary asked. Fine, there's no matching Amber Alerts for my sister or Calvin. Good, so why not start the foster process? Because it could get Rachel in trouble. It could mean that she can't take him back when she wants to. Mary's eyebrow rose. And? And? And it would be one more way Tessa had failed Rachel. But now didn't feel like the right time to explain all that. I need to research all the possibilities before I put us on the radar of social services. They'd been there before, and it hadn't done a thing to help them. Mary nodded and returned to her desk. Tessa looked over to where Darius was working with Calvin on his back. They both seemed fine with the situation, so she did what she always did when she didn't know what else to do. She threw herself into her work. An hour later, she looked up when Sanjay appeared beside her desk, frowning down at her. Hi, Sanjay. It's my turn. I'm sorry? She blinked at him, wondering what she had missed. It's my turn to wear the baby, but Darius will not let me. Oh, well, um, 
She glanced over to Darius, who was bent over the 3D printer, but with the air of someone who was concentrating much harder than he needed to. She rose to check on Calvin. Darius, she said as she got close. He bent closer to the printer, fiddling with a tiny component. Calvin blinked at her and smiled. He smiled. It was the cutest thing she'd ever seen in her life. He smiled at me. Let me see, Darius said, spinning around, which made Calvin gurgle in something that sounded like a laugh. Darius stopped and craned his neck around, trying to see behind him instead. It's my turn, Darius, Sanjay insisted, coming up behind them. But Tessa wasn't interested in the argument. Calvin, you smiled at me. Come here. She tried to lift him out of the wrap, but Darius had him tucked in too snugly. Give him to me, Darius. Darius grumbled but unwrapped the sling a few times until it was loose enough for her to get the baby out. Come here, little guy, she said, settling him against her side to smile down at him. Did you do this? Did you smile? He did it again, and the same dopamine rush she got from sugar washed over her brain. He smiled at me, she called to Ethan, but he spoke from right behind her shoulder. I saw it. Good job, buddy. He likes you. He likes me. It was crazy how good that made her feel. Calvin liked her. I'll wear him now, Sanjay said unwrapping the rest of the sling from Darius. No, Tessa said. I will. Show me how to do this, Darius. And a few minutes later, she settled in at her computer, with Calvin snuggled against her chest as she updated the blueprint on her panel design. He stayed there for another hour before he got restless again, so she did the feed, burp, and diaper routine, before returning him to Sanjay's mat and Darius's mobile. You can wear him next, she promised when Sanjay objected. Right now, I want him to enjoy the freedom your mat gives him. Appeased, Sanjay turned back to his circuit board. As she glanced around the lab, her eyes touched on each of her co-workers. And friends, she realized. They'd never been the type to socialize outside of the lab, but then engineers rarely were that type. She'd had a healthy respect for the genius each of them brought to the project, and she'd assumed they had felt the same toward her. But she liked them, she realized. She felt genuine affection beneath her respect for them. Every single one of them had stepped up to help her in some way today, and it wasn't just so they could get the project done. Every one of them, except Ethan, because Ethan had done that every day, except today. He'd gone to get the gear from her car, yes, but she could sense he was largely staying out of her way. He couldn't avoid her with their desks in such close proximity, but she had a feeling that he would if he could. That was her fault, and she couldn't leave it unfixed any more than Ethan had been able to resist trying to fix things this whole week. She very much owed him another fix anyway, of putting back together what she'd broken by mauling him yesterday morning. He hadn't made it weird between them. She had. When he got up to head for the break room a while later, she seized the opportunity. Sanjay, can you keep an ear out for Calvin? I think I'm going to get some coffee. Okay. She slipped into the break room and found Ethan fishing out a water bottle from the fridge. The break room had always felt like it was a good size, before now. Their whole team could fit at the laminate table in the center and eat comfortably. Cupboards full of paper goods for team celebrations they never had, plus extra paper towels, cleaning solutions, and emergency supplies lined one side of the room. Mandatory information about workers' comp and other regulations covered another, and a fridge and counter with small appliances filled the third. One time, Tessa had caught wind that it was Darius's birthday, 
and insisted they all celebrate it with a generic cake she'd rushed out on her lunch break to buy at the nearest grocery store. Sanjay and Mary had filed in. They'd all eaten their cake, stared at each other in awkward silence, and created an unspoken bond to never do any organized socializing again. That moment still paled in comparison to how awkward this moment felt as she stared at Ethan and wondered what to say. The room also felt smaller than it had, and somehow much warmer than the lab? That made no sense. They were on the same cooling system. Hi, she said. Ethan glanced over at her. Hi. Only now did she realize she'd been hoping he could magically guess what she wanted to talk about and bring it up himself the way he had before she shut him down. A bunch of times. But ESP was stupid, so she sighed and summoned the same courage she'd needed for her thesis defense. We should talk. He straightened and shut the fridge door. He looked at her calmly, then down at the water bottle in his hand. How does a lab space devoted to improving the environment have a fridge full of single-use plastic water bottles? I know, she said. Darius wants us to work on a sink-mounted water filtration system next. Sounds like a good project. Not really. There are already several on the market. He just doesn't like them. Right. This was painful. This was defending her thesis painful. She didn't know how to fill the silence. Finally, she said, We should talk. Again and winced. All right, I'm listening. Should I be sitting down for this? Suddenly, he felt a million miles away from her, and the room that had felt small and suffocating became a big gulf, the kind an action hero would jump over in movies, but that even an Olympic long jumper couldn't clear in real life. It was her fault. That's exactly where she had thought she wanted Ethan. She was wrong. It wasn't where she wanted him, but it was where she needed him right now. Nothing else made sense. Not when Calvin had overtaken her life for the foreseeable future. Not when Ethan was leaving in three weeks to live in Europe and work at his dream job. So while she wanted to cross the room and touch his hand, as an invitation, maybe, or possibly to just connect, she twined her fingers together instead and cleared her throat. No, you don't need to sit down. Now probably isn't a great time. Would you want to come over for a dinner provided by grubmates and served among a stack of clean diapers? He fiddled with the bottle again before he sighed. Sure. Sorry. It stung that he was so clearly reluctant. I'll make it fast. She turned to leave. Wait, he said and she paused at the break room door. You don't owe me any apologies, but I'm not going to say no to an explanation. I'm sorry I sound unenthusiastic. You just feel like a test I keep failing, and I hate that feeling. It's not a test, she said, and you definitely haven't failed. If anyone had, it was her, in failing to realize that she hadn't ever gotten over him after college in bringing him in on this project, in dragging him into this Calvin mess, and most of all, in falling for him harder by dropping the last defense she'd had against him. She hadn't known exactly what it would be like to kiss Ethan or to be kissed in return. She'd wondered for weeks in college, and because the answer had mattered so very much back then, she'd run away rather than find out. Now she knew and that knowledge had shoved her right over the emotional cliff she'd backed away from when she'd been younger and smarter. What was she supposed to do now? Chapter 14 Ethan knocked on Tessa's front door and poked his head through when she called, Come in. Is now good? She had changed into jeans, and she jerked her head toward her table, 
where the marinara jars had been pushed aside to make room for a cardboard box. Yeah, pizza okay? Pizza is great. It was as painfully stilted as every interaction between them had been all day. He wished he knew how to dismantle the wall that had sprung up, but he wasn't even sure what it was made of. So he settled in at her table and took a plate. Calvin was lying on the living room floor, chewing a washcloth. Looks delicious, buddy. Tessa paused in opening the pizza box to glance Calvin's way. Yeah, he didn't want a bottle, but he seems happy to chew on that. She served up their slices and asked him a couple of questions about the relay he was working on. Even trying to give full and complete answers left them with conversational dead ends. Finally, halfway through her second slice, Tessa set her pizza down. I'm not really hungry. Ethan took the last bite of his and wiped his mouth with his napkin. I'm done too. So the reason I wanted to apologize to you... Wait. Sarah hadn't ever been sorry for anything, not even cheating. She'd tried to make it his fault, complaining about his emotional unavailability. Which to her was things like not wanting to go shopping at the mall every time she felt like doing retail therapy. Or not wanting to watch her Real Housewives marathon. He'd done those things sometimes, but not enough. And that's why she slept with her trainer, if Sarah was to be believed. But she'd proven she was the last person who should be believed. Now, here Tessa was with the exact opposite problem, apologizing for everything. Even things for which she owed no one apologies. How could he get that through to her? He tried to explain one more time. Tessa, you're in a hard situation, and you're making the best out of it that you can. If anything, I apologize for being one more thing you have to manage, okay? When she gave a slow nod, he added, That being said, I don't need any apologies, but I wouldn't mind a couple of explanations. She bit her bottom lip, tugging at it with her teeth so long that he wasn't sure he'd get any kind of answer. But finally, she asked, About the kiss? Sounds like a good place to start. What he really wanted to know was how to get her to do it again, but he kept his mouth shut. It kind of has to do with Rachel. That is not what I expected you to say. That was an understatement. What did her sister have to do with Tessa giving him the hottest kiss of his life? That got a small smile out of her. It's kind of all one big thing, I guess. Do you have time for a story that begins, When I was a little girl? because that's where this one starts. He settled himself into his chair. Go ahead, shoot. I'm three years older than Rachel, and we're wired so differently that it seems weird to me sometimes that we're even related. I was ready to move through the world like a grown-up by the time I was eight, and Rachel always floundered, I guess is a good way to say it. My mom named her after the Rachel on Friends, but my sister is kind of like, if Rachel never grew past the first season and got her life together. My sister ran away from home the day she turned 18, and she was exactly like she was as a kid. Impulsive, fixated on impractical dreams but never real goals, starry-eyed, boy-crazy, which sounds harsh, I'm sure. Ethan shrugged. Engineers called it like they saw it. Not really. Anyway, my mother was no help, and both of our fathers were loser drunks, according to her. We never met either of them, so I'm guessing she was right. She gave a hard smile here. When I got older, I wondered how my mom made the same relationship mistake, not twice in a row like with our birth fathers, but over and over again. We dealt with a long string of loser guys. They were usually using her for a convenient place to crash or her crappy hamburger helper meals that sucked. But hey, they were free. 
She stood and walked over to Calvin, standing and staring down at him. Ethan stayed seated, not wanting to do anything to pull her out of the story she was telling. I wanted to get out of our town so bad. It was every stereotype you've heard in a Florida man news story. Florida man busted driving a mobile meth lab. That happened in our trailer park. Florida man illegally breeds pythons in Lehigh Acres trailer. That was my trailer park, too. She snorted. Even living in a trailer park was cliche. Sometimes I think that's what I'm maddest about. My mom didn't even have the creativity to give us a more interesting backstory. She crouched over the baby now, squatting to watch him but not touching him. Ethan couldn't see her face well, but the tone of her voice didn't match her words. Those were biting and mean. Her tone was tired and sad. I wanted to get out of that town the second I graduated, but there was no way I could leave Rachel. She had three more years of high school, so I stayed. I had a full ride to Georgia Tech already. Now she looked over at him, and he nodded. I didn't. My parents paid for school, but I would have given anything to go there. It must have been hard to give up that scholarship. She shrugged like it didn't matter, but the heaviness in her words betrayed exactly how much it did. Yes and no. It's not like I had to think about it much. It was easy to make the decision, hard not to resent Rachel for it. Not your mother? She shook her head. My mom was a hopeless case. She was never going to change. I know it's who deserved the blame, but at the time, I was frustrated with Rachel. She's smart and funny, and she had potential. But she was also wild and undisciplined, more interested in parties and boys than books and school. Since she seemed like the one who could change if she wanted to, I got mad at her for not living how I thought she should. But really, I was just mad because she was standing in the way of what I wanted. She picked up Calvin and murmured something into his neck. His legs kicked. I missed that last part, Ethan said, and he didn't want to miss any of it. She was unfolding a portrait of her past that he never would have guessed. And while she probably thought that she was painting herself in a terrible light, she was wrong. Dead wrong. He was seeing her with new eyes, ones that saw her with even more respect. I said Rachel hated me. She hugged Calvin for a second. I deserved it. She thought every time I would yell at her about going out or ditching class that I was just taking out my anger on her. Maybe I was. We had a state university 20 miles away, and I couldn't even go to that. Didn't have a car. Had to go to the community college for two years because I could ride my bike there and because I could live at home to keep an eye on Rachel because for damn sure my mom wasn't going to do it. She would disappear for days at a time. Was I supposed to leave my 15-year-old sister behind while I went off to school and ate three meals a day, all covered by scholarships she didn't have a prayer of earning? He made a noise in his throat, something that must have sounded like swallowed rage, because it was, and it drew her notice. I know, she said. I knew it then. I knew that what I felt wasn't fair or right. So I'd try to make up for it by earning as much money as I could so she could have what she wanted. New clothes, stuff like that. I never cared about the stuff, but she did. So I made sure she had cute shirts and makeup and a full fridge, even if we were always on a coupons at Walmart budget. We got food stamps. That helped. She looked at him over Calvin's head, defiant. I hated being on welfare, but it saved us more than once. You're talking to a guy who was raised by bleeding heart parents. I'm glad you got the help you needed. Nothing wrong with food stamps if your mom wasn't feeding you. My mom didn't do anything but come home drunk, sometimes with a guy we never saw again, or scream at me to give her my tips so she could go out, because we were hard and she needed a break. I'd give her a 20 sometimes to buy us a night off from her, but most nights we just fought about where I was hiding my cash. 
She stroked Calvin's barely there hair, even brushing her cheek against it once. Ethan wondered if she even realized she was doing it. I hid it in the one place she wouldn't think to look, in a bank. And I made good money, more than my mom ever did. I worked as a server at an upscale steakhouse near the golf course. Had to ride my bike 10 miles each way to get there. You're amazing. He didn't know what else to say because there was no other way to describe her younger self. She shot him a sharp look. I'm not. I was angry and impatient and bitter. So bitter. Calvin made a restless sound, and Ethan rose and went straight to the formula on the counter. Will he eat? He asked, even as he unscrewed the cap from a bottle and began measuring the water. Maybe. It's almost eight. He might take a bottle and go to sleep. When Ethan had the bottle ready, he crossed to Tessa and crouched beside her. I can feed him. She shook her head. Tessa, he said, keeping his voice gentle. Now that he had more of her story, he had a feeling he understood her resistance better. You didn't fail Rachel then, and you don't have to make it up to Calvin now. You're not a bad person if you let someone else step in and help. She hesitated, then let him take Calvin. He settled onto the couch with the baby at a comfortable angle for his arm, and Calvin went to work on the bottle immediately. Where is your mom in all of this? She died four years ago. I'm sorry. She just shrugged, and it was the saddest thing he'd ever seen. Do you want to tell me more? Want to? She scooted back to lean against the wall across from him, her head tilted back, eyes closed. No, but it feels like it all wants to spill out anyway. Why haven't you told me how to fix any of this yet? It was such a validation of his mom's guess about Tessa needing someone to listen, not fix, that he vowed to send Leslie Bedford the biggest, most expensive box of Swiss chocolate he could find for Christmas. But aloud, all he said was, I'm just sitting here feeling grateful you're willing to trust me with your story, and I want to hear more of it, if you're okay with telling me. She didn't open her eyes, just sighed and picked up the thread of her story. So the job at the steakhouse, I got that during college. It was the first job to ever pay me well, and it's where I met my first boyfriend, which will also explain why I got kind of weird with you in college, and yesterday morning. Now I'm even more interested, he teased. She did open her eyes for a second to flash him a smile, but then she closed him again. I can't look at you while I tell you more about how I was an idiot. Maybe still am one. All that plus a boring story about my first heartbreak. The pizza's just a bonus. I didn't come for the pizza, he said. Quit worrying about me. I promise if I'm bored, I'll plop Calvin in your lap and walk out. Fine. My first heartbreak was also indirectly linked to Rachel. First, you kind of have to understand that I didn't date in high school. I was not always the snack you see before you. She gestured down the length of her, like there was a problem with her t-shirt advertising a famous burger chain, or the makeup smudges under her eyes. He didn't know what she meant by snack, but she looked like a feast, and he was glad her eyes were still closed, so she couldn't see him redden for even thinking something that corny. I met Dylan there. Ethan had a visceral flash of jealousy. And we got along really well. He was a sophomore at the nearby State University, and he was struggling with his earth science class. I offered to help him figure out a lab after our shift one night. Then I tutored him for a test, and then studying turned into dating, which, like I said, was a whole new experience for me. Between being invisible to the guys at school and too busy between my honors classes and cashiering at a local truck stop five days a week, I somehow never managed to fit in a social life. Dylan was cute, and I thought he was into me. He'd corner me in the stockroom for makeouts or text me constantly when we weren't working the same shift. He'd acted so interested in everything I said. I don't know. 
I hadn't even really had any close friends after my best friend moved to Texas in seventh grade. And Dylan would always listen to me talk about how hard Rachel was. Because Rachel was being extra hard right then. Ditching classes, acting erratic, stumbling in during the wee hours of the morning. Once, she even disappeared for a whole weekend. Dylan would listen and tell me that Rachel was an idiot and I was doing great. I wasn't, but it was nice to hear someone say it, because it's not like my mom was around to handle her. Calvin gave a small fuss, and Ethan realized that he'd pretty much forgotten he was even feeding the kid, who had spit out the empty nipple and was now annoyed that it was bumping his face. Ethan set the bottle down and shifted the baby over his shoulder for burping. Rachel was halfway through her senior year, but she said she was over it. I begged her to reconsider, but she ignored me, passed the GED instead, and left a note behind saying she was heading to Nashville to start her singing career. Which was odd, because she only sang okay. I finished out the semester, but when it was obvious Rachel wasn't coming back, I transferred to Georgia Tech the next term, and they still offered me a scholarship, so I've put my head down and run straight at my goals ever since. I have thoughts, but mostly missing connections, like what happened to Dylan? And what did it have to do with her confusing signals during college? But he definitely wasn't going to ask that out loud. Dylan, right, she said, finally looking at him again. As soon as his semester ended and he passed with a B, he decided that all my stuff with Rachel was too hard. I only talked about her in school, and he wasn't looking for a serious relationship with that kind of baggage. So he dumped me and ignored me every time we worked a shift together, and I couldn't quit because the money was too good. He was beginning to suspect how this all related to him in college now. Did you deal with that a lot when you got to Georgia? Did a lot of guys try to coast on your work for their grades? He had a feeling that wasn't the problem. It was the part about dealing with her hard stuff. But Tessa wasn't forthcoming at the best of times, and he didn't want to push her too far by asking straight out. No, Dylan was a hard lesson, and one I won't forget. I wouldn't have given any of them a chance to do that. But all the guys in our program were smart enough to earn their own grades, so that wasn't much of an issue. I just vowed I wouldn't give anyone else a chance to fail me in my life outside the lab. The first year it was easy, then you and I started hanging out. She quit talking and picked up a fork, examining it so long that he realized she wasn't going to say anything else. I'd like to hear the rest of that thought, he said. Calvin burped in agreement. I thought we had chemistry in college. Was I wrong? Obviously, she said, and the answer startled him. We had engineering together, not chemistry, dummy. Tessa, that cuts really deep. Because you didn't think of the joke first? Yes, he said, grinning at her. It was pretty good. She gave him a very self-satisfied smile. Was I wrong, though, about us having a connection in college? Please don't make a bad electrical engineering pun. No, you were right. I think I was even more into you than Dylan. Dylan was into me? She laughed, which had been his goal. He wanted to keep the mood light enough for her to feel comfortable to keep talking. Dylan who? Then she sighed. Maybe if I'd been able to forget him then, I wouldn't have gotten so squirrely with you. But every time I started to feel comfortable with you, I would just remember him bailing and how dumb I felt. And worse, how I felt even more alone than I had before he'd acted like my boyfriend. To be honest, I haven't been great at relationships since. It's good to know it wasn't my imagination. It was true. Tessa had confused him so much back then that he'd begun to wonder if everything he'd learned from his sister-in-law was wrong. In hindsight, it was also easy to see why he'd fallen for Sarah so easily. She'd come along when he was in the trough of self-doubt, and her signals had been clear and easy to read, so he'd gone with the path of least resistance. 
definitely wasn't your imagination, Tessa said. I've always wondered what would have happened if I hadn't turned chicken. And I guess not enough sleep makes me as stupid as too much wine. So I decided to maul you on my sofa. That didn't feel like a mauling. He sensed she was trying to keep the tone light, but it didn't sit right with him to have her dismiss that kiss so flippantly. It had tasted of possibility and second chances. I could get used to it, easily. She flickered a look toward him and looked away again. No, you can't. You're leaving. I don't think I'm built to do casual relationships. If you were sticking around, you'd make sure to never come over and build my furniture or eat meals with me? Probably not. I've made a habit of avoiding that kind of thing. What? Friendships? Friendships with people I want to kiss. The answer shot straight through his gut, making him aware of how much he wanted to kiss her too. I didn't mind. I wouldn't mind. He let the clear implication dawn on her, and she began to blink rapidly as his meaning sunk in. Bad idea. Counterpoint. Excellent idea. You're leaving in three weeks. What's the point? You have to pick a lane, Tessa, because it seems like you're saying you wouldn't have anything to do with me if I was staying. So shouldn't that mean that you're fine with something happening between us because I'm leaving? I... She stopped and scowled at him. Don't try to confuse me. I'm teasing, a little, but not trying to confuse you, I promise. It sounds like you're basically asking for a fling. He jerked his head back in surprise. No, I'm not. I'm not a fling kind of guy. Then what do you call it when two people decide to get involved for three weeks, knowing it's going to end? Fun? But he smiled to let her know he was teasing again. I guess that didn't really sound great, did it? I'm not a fling kind of guy, he repeated. It was so important to him for her to understand this that he added, But I'm your friend, Tessa. By the time you beat me putting that chair together on Monday night, it was like we'd never left college. Everything felt as easy with you as it always did. Until, you know, you made it weird back then. She finally met his eyes and smiled. And made it weird again yesterday morning. Maybe it's only weird if we let it be weird. He leaned toward the coffee table and drew an imaginary line down the center with his finger. Line in the sand. We're friends. I'll do everything I can to help you with Calvin and Helios until I have to go. This should all work out fine if we set a boundary, right? She rose to her knees and shuffled on them over to the other side of the coffee table, inspecting the invisible line. I guess I'm obviously going to have to call you in to help me with something baby-related every two hours because I'm clueless. So maybe I should just admit that and believe you when you say you're fine with it. Very fine with it. She stared at the coffee table for a few more moments before nodding. Okay, I'd like that. One question, though. He used the side of his fist like he was erasing a whiteboard full of equations and scrubbed it along their invisible line. I used to imagine what it would be like all the time to kiss you back in college. You know make the first move. Can I do that once before the line goes up? You want to kiss me? Her voice had gone soft, and her eyes fell to his lips. He nodded once. Afraid of how much his voice would give away if he spoke, and kept his eyes on her face, looking for her answer, she braced her hands on the coffee table and leaned toward him slightly her eyes falling half-closed in the hungry look her nephew so often wore. But as he leaned forward to meet her, to explore the softness and heat of her mouth again, to test whether her kiss could shut down everything but his nerve endings, the way she had the morning before, Calvin gave a small, sleepy grunt. Tessa blinked and straightened. Ethan stayed where he was, hoping she'd come back. Instead, she gave a short shake of her head. That was the best bad idea you've ever had, she said, her voice slightly husky. But I really need this. 
and she redrew the imaginary line between them. Chapter 15 Tessa staggered into work. It wasn't the weight of the carrier that was the problem. It was the weight of her own exhaustion. Calvin had had a rough night again, and she was missing about three hours of sleep she really needed. When the elevator doors slid open, Sanjay was standing right in front of them, so close that she took a step back in surprise. Hi, Sanjay. Hi, can I wear the baby? Yeah, sure, let me get situated. He took the diaper bag from her and she smiled at Ethan as Sanjay followed her to Baby Quad, where she freed Calvin from the carrier. Sanjay had already set down the diaper bag and now stood waiting with Darius's blanket sling. I'm glad you're here, Mary grumbled. He was making me anxious, pacing back and forth in front of the elevator like that. Sanjay ignored her. I'll wear him on my back today. If you hold him in place, I know the rap. She heard Darius give what sounded like a pretty irritated snort, but she settled Calvin into place, and Sanjay quickly and efficiently looped and secured the blankets. He turned to face Tessa, Calvin peering curiously at her over Sanjay's shoulder. Now you go work. Okay. She turned and started for her desk, then stopped and turned back. Are you taking him because you want me to work or because you want to hang out with him? Go work, Sanjay repeated, and he headed for one of the work benches without glancing her way again. When she slid into her own chair, Ethan held his hand out. Keys, please. I'll get the other stuff. She handed them over without complaint. He returned with the swing and bassinet and took his seat again. Rough night, he asked, when she tried to thank him but yawned instead. He did one of those long, crying things in the middle of the night. Nothing worked, so I took him for a walk, but he still wouldn't settle down. So then I drove with him because I didn't want to wake the neighbors up. It took about a half hour, but then he fell asleep. Brought him home, and he woke up as soon as I got to the top of the stairs. Went driving again, and that finally worked after an hour. She paused for a big yawn, and he stayed asleep, but then he woke up an hour early. You could have called me. I know. And she did. It felt good to know it. But I was okay since I got enough sleep on Thursday night. If he does it again tonight, I'm definitely calling you. A surprised look crossed Ethan's face, and he glanced down at his watch. It's Saturday. I think so. No, it definitely is. She shrugged and reached for her mouse. Okay. Everybody's here. Why do you sound so surprised? We get overtime. Is that why you all do it? She studied him. You didn't even know you'd get overtime and you're here. What's your reason? I'm a little obsessed. After a slight pause, he added, with the project. Us too. We're on the verge of talking BBMJ into a billion dollar investment. We can't screw it up. Same, he said. Guess we better get back to work she said, turning to her monitor. The lab settled down to its usual quiet hum, broken by little baby grunts and much larger yawns from her. Finally, mid-morning, after another jaw-cracking yawn, Ethan shook his head. I'm going to get you a cup of coffee. You're making me yawn and I slept enough last night. You don't have to. But she broke off at the level, patient look on his face. This is what friends did, she supposed. Thanks. No problem. He disappeared into the break room. Tessa stared after him, then back at her screen, where the numbers and lines swam a little. She tried to blink the sleepiness away, but it wasn't helping much. She was extra grateful he'd gone to fetch her coffee, she decided. 
she could get used to a friend like that. Well, maybe not too used to him, but she'd make a point of appreciating him for the three weeks he had left. Tessa, he called from the lab door. Can you come over here? She nodded. Maybe moving would wake her brain up. What's up? She asked, following him into the break room. Uh, there's really no other way to say this. He held up his phone. It's my mom. She wants to talk to you. Your mom? She was so tired, his words weren't even making sense. Yeah, I called her to see if she had any more ideas of what to do with Calvin when he has those episodes. She's asking to talk to you. It's on mute. I can tell her you're tied up with work. No, it's fine. I'm taking any advice right now because my ideas all suck. He tapped a key on his screen and extended it to her. Her name is Leslie. Hello, Leslie? Hi, Tessa. Ethan says Calvin had a hard night. Want to tell me about it? I might have some suggestions to help. His mother's voice sounded exactly like the color yellow would, if it could talk. Ooh boy, maybe Tessa had slipped from tiredness into flat-out sleep deprivation if she was imagining talking colors. Tessa? She realized she'd already zoned out. Sorry, you were saying something about suggestions to help Calvin sleep? Yes, give him the same routine every night. It might take a few days, but he'll love it. I'd give him a warm bath first. Tessa's stomach flipped. Oh no, I've never given him a bath, and he's been here four days already. Hey, 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 Leslie said in a soothing voice. Tessa wondered how panicked she sounded to the other woman. You're fine. Do you wipe him down with baby wipes at all? Yes, that's great. You're doing great. You probably don't have a baby tub, right? I don't. Oh no, she was the worst aunt ever. They don't just go in a regular bath? They don't, but a nice clean kitchen sink will do fine. I'd put a little bit of lavender oil in the water too. Then get him out, put him in a fresh sleep sack, and give him his dinner bottle. A sleep sack? The pitch of her voice went up. It's kind of like a baby nightgown, but it closes at the bottom. When he's done eating, put him in his crib with no blanket. That's what sleep sacks are for. That way he doesn't get too hot and wake up because he's uncomfortable. And don't worry about finding any of this stuff. I'll send Ethan by the store after work and he'll bring it over for you. Thank you, but you think Calvin is waking up because he's too hot? Leslie sighed, and it sounded small and sad. I don't. I think he's waking up because he's missing his mama. The best thing you can do if he's waking up sad is distract him. Keep the lights off, put him in bed with you, snuggle him, and sing him some songs. I don't know any kids' songs. He doesn't either. Sing whatever you want, just in a soft voice. Keep cuddling and see if he goes back to sleep. If he does, put him back in his crib. You don't want him to sleep in your bed. Too many accidents happen like that. What if it doesn't work? That's when you try a walk or a drive. And sometimes you have to let him cry and hang on anyway. It'll help him to know you're there. You can do this, Tessa. Tessa was quiet for a long moment. I'm not so sure. You absolutely can, Leslie said firmly. Look at how much you're doing for him already. It's not enough. It's more than his mom could do for him. Her voice sounded sad again, but without any judgment. Trust me, you're doing great. But, but what? It can take a couple of weeks, sometimes even longer, for babies to quit missing their moms in the middle of the night. Are you up for it? At this precise second, Tessa wanted to say no, but she thought about how she felt with even six hours of sleep, and she took a deep breath. Yes, you sound surprised. 
I am, kind of, Tessa answered. I think it's because I'm accepting that Rachel isn't going to show up any day now, or maybe ever. That leads me to my next point, Leslie said. Ethan says you haven't been willing to contact CPS about Calvin. I don't want to get Rachel in trouble. That's admirable, but there's going to have to be some accountability from her. If not, then you still need to make something official so that you can make any medical decisions for Calvin, plus a million other things. It is a tedious process, but it'll help you in the long run. And I have a lot of experience navigating the foster system. I could help you. Thank you. She considered it. She hadn't even thought about the medical thing yet. What if Calvin got really sick? She didn't know what she didn't know. And the evidence of her ignorance was mounting the longer she talked to Leslie. Not that Ethan's mom was trying to make her feel bad. On the contrary, her voice stayed patient and warm, and Tessa could practically feel her concern radiating from the phone. I absolutely don't have time to get tied up in red tape until this project is over, but I promise to go to CPS when it's done and start making things more official. How long is that going to be? Three more weeks? Can you keep up this pace for three weeks? Leslie's voice was gentle. Even with Ethan helping out, and he'll help as much as you let him, and probably more, that's going to be tough to handle. I mean, he says your whole team is in there on a Saturday. It's not really a choice. I have to take care of the baby. I have to get the project done. Understood. I just worry, honey. And the sound of the endearment spread exactly like honey through Tessa's chest, warm and sweet. Just promise that you'll check in with CPS after this project is done. I'll do some research for you on California's laws and figure out exactly what you'll need to tell them and what kind of help you can get. Thank you, Miss Bedford. Call me Leslie. Thank you, Leslie. Hang in there, Tessa. You're doing great. Her vote of confidence did more to clear Tessa's head than caffeine could have. But just for extra measure, she handed Ethan back his phone and took a sip of the coffee he'd made for her. Through the conversation, he'd sat at the table, quietly eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich while he listened. I have to do the thing I hate to do most in the world, she finally informed him. What's that? Call a work meeting. I've got a problem bigger than I can solve, and it's going to take a team. Fifteen minutes later, Ethan had shepherded the other engineers into the break room at her request, so she could finish her coffee and get her synopsis firing faster. By the time the other engineers filed in, the caffeine was starting to work. I'll make this short, she began. Good, Mary snapped. I promise it affects the whole project. She glanced over to Calvin, who was wiggling against Sanjay's back, or trying to. You guys have been so patient with me bringing Calvin to work this week, but it isn't fair to you. It's not going to work anymore. We like him here, Darius said. He's fine, Sanjay said. Are you quitting? Mary asked. No, Tessa said, almost before she finished asking. I'm not quitting, but I think I need to ask for help. We've been helping, Darius pointed out. We'll just keep helping. We don't mind. You guys have been amazing, Tessa said. But there are limitations. What happens when we need to go out and road test? He can't come with us. What are we supposed to do then? We can't spare a single one of us, and it won't be good for Calvin to be out in the desert air. And it's not going to look very professional to the feasibility team. Darius and Sanjay exchanged glances with each other, but neither of them seemed to have a counter-argument. I'm hoping you guys have connections I don't for a babysitter or nanny I could hire to help with Calvin. I don't know many people in Palm Valley, and I'm not sure any of them have kids. 
I'm prepared to randomly start asking them if they do and if they have any suggestions for childcare. But I'm hoping you guys know of someone who wouldn't mind a babysitting job for a month or two while I get things straightened out. I'll pay the going rate, maybe even extra if they can start right away. This time, all of them looked at each other with helpless or blank expressions, clearly coming up as empty as she had. All of them except Ethan, who studied her with a furrowed brow. It was his problem-solving face, but as much as he'd already done to help her, there wasn't much he could do about this. Just think about it. I'm going to start sending emails to the few people I know and join some local social media groups for parents to see if I can get recommendations or ideas. If you guys think of anyone, let me know, okay? They all nodded. Back to work, Mary barked, and the sharp tone startled Calvin, who jerked against Sanjay's back, then wailed. I'll get him, Ethan said. It's probably time for a bottle and a mid-morning nap, right? That's my guess, she said. He was already helping Sanjay unwrap. Then I'll handle it while you send your emails. It's my turn to wear them after, Darius said. No way, Sanjay argued. You got him way longer yesterday. It's still my turn. No, man, Darius insisted, as Mary waved them out. I saw this new wrap hold, and I'm going to try it. Settle down, gentlemen, she heard Mary say as they headed into the lab. I'll make a spreadsheet. The rest of Sanjay's comment faded as they left the break room. You're part of a good team, Ethan said. Yeah, you sure you don't mind doing this? Happy to. All right, then I'm going to go do babysitter research. Thanks. She left him with Calvin, and before she could even go fetch the diaper bag with the formula and bottle, Mary was already halfway back to the break room with it. She really did have such a good team, and Tessa felt the familiar thickening in her sinuses of impending tears for the second time in three days. She sniffed until the pressure went away. She might be getting used to the idea of letting her team help her, but she refused to get used to crying. It had been unpleasant the last time, and she didn't care to repeat the experience. Opening her email program, she sent requests to all her friends, explaining that she had temporary custody of her infant nephew and was looking for a babysitter, then found some online parenting groups and requested to join them, posting the same question there as well. When there was nothing left to do but wait and hope, she went back to problem solving, and she was deep into an inspection of their panel prototypes when Ethan emerged from the break room with the baby and mouthed, he's asleep. The rest of the day followed the strange routine they'd all fallen into, Ethan and Tessa trading off any feeding, diapering, or burping that needed to happen, Sanjay and Darius fighting over who got to wear Calvin, or keep him by their desk on the playmat. In late afternoon, Ethan got up and started gathering his things. I'm going to run an errand, but I'll come to your place and check on you guys tonight. Sure, sounds good. Within a couple of hours, everyone else had decided that dinner time was late enough for them to work on a Saturday, and the packing up began. Darius helped her carry the baby stuff out to her car, and she drove home trying not to feel discouraged that her requests to friends and social media hadn't generated any leads yet. She got Calvin inside and set him on the floor to chew his favorite wash rag, then changed into her sweats and set to work scrubbing her sink so she could try Leslie's bath suggestion. She hoped that had been Ethan's errand, getting the lavender. A knock sounded at her door as she wiped down the sink one last time, and she hurried over to it, sure that Ethan would be there on the other side of the door with Lavender. He really was the best. Hey, she said, opening the door with a smile. There was no use in pretending she wasn't happy to see him. He knew how she felt, even if they were making the smart play of not acting on it. It was Ethan on her porch, all right, 
but not with lavender. Not unless lavender was the slender woman in the comfortable-looking knit jumper standing next to him. Hey, Tessa, he said. I'd like you to meet my mom. Chapter 16 Tessa stared at him, her mouth half open, total confusion wrinkling her forehead. Can we come in? He hoped this hadn't been a bad gamble. I thought, don't you live in Maryland? Tessa asked his mom. I do. So you're here to visit Ethan? Kind of. His mom answered. Can we come in? Tessa stepped back with a jerky motion, like she'd only just now remembered how to welcome guests. Sure, sorry, yes, come in. They followed her to the sofa, but while Ethan sat down, Leslie knelt beside Calvin on the floor and smiled at him. He sure is cute. Yeah, Tessa agreed, while shooting Ethan a look that begged for an explanation. We just came back from LAX, he said. Well, I'm a stop by the store to get this. He dug a small vial from his work bag and handed it to her. Lavender oil, and there's a baby tub in the car. Why didn't you tell me your mom was coming? I mean, not that it's my business or anything. Because I didn't know until I texted her during the meeting you called. I asked if she could fly out to help for a few weeks, and she said her suitcase was already packed. Literally. Tessa looked surprised. It's this thing she does, and she thinks it's ESP. Let's not dwell on it too much. We should dwell on the fact that I was exactly right as usual, his mom interjected. Anyway, he continued with an eye roll, she caught the next flight out of Baltimore. That's why I left work early, to get her. We picked up an air mattress and some baby stuff, then came right over. You can't make your mother sleep on an air mattress, she said, her tone horrified. That's for me. She'll get the bed. I don't feel bad about it either, his mom said from the floor. But go ahead and tell her why I'm here. She's here because... He started, but his mom interrupted. Because we haven't had a baby in the house for seven years unless his brothers bring the grandbabies and I needed a fix. Tessa stared from him to his mother and back. He didn't know how to read the expression on her face now, because it kept flickering through so many different emotions. He tried again. What I'm saying is that she's here to help until the project is over, if you're okay with it. She can take care of Calvin while you're at work. He waited for her to decline. She'd do it politely, he had no doubt but she hadn't accepted any help up to this point unless she'd asked for it. And she'd only asked so far when she was at the end of her rope. You said in the meeting that if we had any relatives who might help, maybe reminding her that she had asked would make her more likely to say yes? I didn't mean for you to drag your mother across the country to deal with my problems. The note of horror was back. No one was dragged his mom said. And this is a baby, not a problem. I've been trying to talk Ethan into letting me come for two days, and now I can't stand it anymore. Can I pick him up? Of course, Tessa said. His mom scooped up Calvin like he'd seen her do with countless other babies, and settled him in her lap to smile down and croon at him. He's darling, she pronounced. And I'll do more checking, but I have a feeling his developmental markers are all fine. She looked up at Tessa and fixed her with a gaze that Ethan knew all too well was impossible to break. It was a look that said she was reading all things you weren't saying, and so there was no point in giving her anything but the honest truth. You are doing remarkably well considering what you've been thrown into. I don't know if you've decided what you want to do long term, but I can help you either way. I'm keeping him. The words seemed to burst out of Tessa. His mom gave her a small smile. That's good. 
I can help you figure some stuff out and teach you stuff. Why don't I help you give him a bath right now? Ethan, go get the bathtub. He went out and fetched it, knowing Leslie Bedford would only continue to make Tessa more comfortable while he was gone. He took his time getting it from his trunk, and when he came back, his mother had taken over his spot on the couch, and she had Calvin over her shoulder and one of Tessa's hands in hers. My baby is leaving for a foreign country in three weeks, his mom said. I wanted to visit before he left, but he told me he'd be working too much. Then he asked me if I'd come help with Calvin, and it's working out even better, because now I'll have something to do all day. She nuzzled Calvin's cheek, and he nestled against her. As long as you're comfortable with it, that is. Tessa nodded, a slow, uncertain nod. If you're sure. Of course. My grown baby and a fresh from heaven baby all in one trip? It's the perfect vacation. Shall we give him a bath? Yes, please. I have no idea what I'm doing. Let's go. And that set the tone for the rest of the night and every day after it. Tessa was determined to handle Calvin on her own at night and wouldn't call. But for the first three mornings, she reported which song would eventually put him back to sleep. Usually a softly sung Green Day classic. And by the fourth morning, she said as soon as she started singing Basket Case, he'd fall back asleep. By the next week, Calvin was sleeping six hours straight at night. And Tessa was opening the door to Ethan and his mom each morning, looking well-rested. Not just well-rested, gorgeous. All this time with her was killing him in ways he hadn't expected. Now that she trusted his mom to handle Calvin all day, Tessa's mind was fully on her work again, and it was brilliant. The project, sure, but even more so the mind it sprang from. He'd always known that about her, but watching her now was a whole new level. He'd been convinced by his third day in the lab that there was no way for them to finish Helios on time. But now that Tessa's concentration was fully on working out the last of the problems, she was hurtling over kinks and obstacles like Usain Bolt. She only broke for lunch when his mom would meet them in the lobby so Tessa could give Calvin his lunch bottle. Then after the baby was fully fed, burped, and changed, he and Tessa would return to the lab, where she only stopped again in late afternoon for a FaceTime check-in on her nephew. After work, they spent far more time at Tessa's place than his own, with his mom tutoring Tessa on how to navigate the CPS system when she was ready, and helping her prep for the CPS home visits once she'd decided to make things legal. As sexy as he found Tessa's total command of the lab and the project at work, it was her awkwardness with Calvin that really got to him. She was so clearly out of her depth, but so willing to learn and try, determined even when she looked overwhelmed, like the night his mom had shown Tessa how to trim Calvin's fingernails. Tessa had done it, hands trembling, lips pressed tight, until his scratchy baby nails were safely clipped, and Tessa swooped in to drop kisses of relief all over his fuzzy head. Ethan had wanted to do the exact same thing to her, except kiss her soft, full lips. Oh, man. He was both more resentful and thankful every day for their invisible line. And every time he was sure this was the time he couldn't resist reaching out and hauling her in to taste and explore her just one more time, he'd glance at her coffee table and then think hard about invisible lines and computational geometry proofs instead. Sometimes he caught his mom watching him watch Tessa, a small smile playing around her mouth. You thinking of staying? She asked him one night after Calvin had fallen asleep and Tessa had looked ready to topple after him. They were walking back to his place and he glanced at her in surprise. No, the demo is in five days and then I fly out that Friday for my dream job. 
He said it so forcefully that he wondered who he was trying to convince. And then what? His mom countered. You marry some Swiss woman and I get boxes full of Ricola every Christmas but never see my grandbabies? You're being dramatic. I don't like Ricola. I don't even know what that is. Swiss cough drops. You think I'm going to get married and send you boxes of cough drops every year? Not if you stay here. Mom. My intuition says you should. Normally, this would be where he laughed at her, but this time he paused for a second to consider this. It does? His mom sighed. No. Yes, I don't know. It's hard to say because I hate the idea of you being so far away. I'm never going to get another opportunity like this. I can't turn my back on it. You're right about that, she muttered. Why do I think we're not talking about the same thing? That's probably your intuition talking. Mom. He narrowed his eyes at her. Look, I signed a contract. What do you want me to do? Her face softened. The right thing. For you. Whatever that is, honey. You know I'm always on your side. She stopped and pulled him into a long hug. Go to Kleber. They're going to be so lucky to have you. Lucky. He mulled the word as he hugged her back. He'd felt pretty lucky when he got the job. Why didn't he feel that way anymore? Chapter 17 Are you nervous? Mary asked, as they eyed the desert landscape outside of Barstow. No. It wasn't bravado on Tessa's part, either. She felt ready. The tests had gone great in the lab, and they'd built a quarter-mile short track on site at BBMJ the previous week and run over a hundred tests on the systems. The panels looked as good as new, and Ethan's relay had worked perfectly every time. Tessa had driven out the night before so she could walk the full one-mile track that Mary had supervised construction of for three days. She hated leaving Calvin behind, but Leslie had shooed her out. The desert isn't fit for any human, but definitely not for babies. He'll be fine for one night, and so will I. Go take your victory lap. Leslie didn't know what they were working on because she didn't have security clearance or a non-disclosure agreement. So the aptness of her victory lap metaphor startled Tessa. Ethan might think his mom's intuition was unscientific coincidence, but Tessa was learning not to doubt it. Your inverter is about the prettiest piece of engineering I've seen in years, she said to Ethan. Sanjay cleared his throat on her other side. Or more like tied for first with Sanjay's motherboard. Darius cleared his throat next, and she added, and Darius's cell conversions. You all did great, Mary said, her voice flat. But you can quit handing each other trophies until corporate gets here and signs off. Because otherwise, this is the world's most expensive science fair project, and we'll all be in our old divisions by next week. Except Ethan. Darius added unhelpfully. He's off to Zurich on Friday either way. Tessa didn't want to think about it, and at the moment there was so much else to worry about that she could not afford to. It was a relief, since Ethan's impending departure had preoccupied more and more of her thoughts lately. Right now, though, she could only think about Helios as she climbed into Alpha Car, the one they'd been testing at the lab pushed the ignition button, and turned on Bluetooth. Ready? Mary asked when she answered. Ready. Tessa had already walked the entire track at dawn, checking all the seams and joints on the solar road, but now she drove it and watched her display. The levels on the battery charge rising instead of depleting, like they did on her Prius. The car was storing energy instead of spending it as she drove. 
When it was full, she returned to the command station and parked, then waited as Darius came out with his voltmeter and got the precise read. It looks good, he said, showing her the numbers. She grinned at him. We did it. We did it, he agreed. Let's see what corporate says. Ethan had rolled on a mechanic sled under the beta car, the one they would start with only enough charge to go five miles, so that the observation team could see its full capacity as it charged while driving. As he rolled out again and smiled up at her, she caught her breath for a second at how sexy he looked, his eyes bright, a streak of dirt across his cheek. Pull yourself together, she ordered. She gave herself that lecture often, a reminder not to be drawn in by his warm eyes and soft smiles. She doubted he even realized that each one of them looked like an invitation to kiss him senseless again. He was leaving in two days. There was no point. Looking good, he said. What? Ugh, how could she still be getting distracted by his cuteness? He kept short-circuiting her systems. She wished it was a wiring issue that Sanjay could correct, but this was a problem of chemistry, not electricity. At least, not the literal kind. The inverter armature. It's going to be great. Of course it is. I wasn't going to recruit a dummy to work on it. They're coming, Mary said pointing to the distance where two large black SUVs were bearing down on them. Ethan held out his hand for Tessa to pull him up, and she did, holding on to him a few seconds longer than she needed to. He gave her hand a small squeeze before letting go as they turned to study the approaching cars. A few minutes later, they pulled up beside the field station trailer, and five men and two women climbed out. They'd been smart enough to forego suits, opting for sensible shoes and business casual slacks and collared shirts. But there was no mistaking the air of authority and privilege rising from them like heat waves. These were decision makers, and they were there to determine nothing less than the future. Not even just Tessa's future, the future of transportation, carbon reduction, and the entire United States highway infrastructure if BBMJ backed this project. You ready? Ethan asked quietly. Can you ever be ready for your dreams to hang in the balance? Ethan gave her a soft smile. What? Why are you looking at me like that? He did that to her sometimes in the evening if she nodded off on the sofa while he played with Calvin. Nothing, he shrugged. You don't usually talk about dreams. Plans, blueprints, schematics, even goals, but not dreams. What's the dream here? Revolution. Her reply was instant, and when he didn't laugh or look uncomfortable, she had a sudden and deep sense of preemptive loss. She would miss his calm and steady influence in the lab. At home. With Calvin. It was going to hurt. She turned her attention back to the visitors who were conferring with Mary. If this goes well, and it will, then BBMJ will give us the funding we need to develop this and pitch this to the state of California. I know you know that, but I'll tell you a secret. I don't just want a new division devoted to this solar road concept. I want green tech to become BBMJ's future to watch them play at the level of current big energy, in there with the oil and auto guys and scaring them into change. I want a research and development budget that dwarfs anything we've seen come out of SpaceX or SunTech, and then we're going to make more and more things to change the world. You think it'll happen? He asked. It felt like total arrogance, but she looked him in the eye and said, Yes. His gaze dropped to her mouth, and her cheeks warmed. He cleared his throat and met her eyes again. I wish things were different. They weren't talking about solar roads and green futures anymore. They were talking about their future, the one that didn't exist. 
You're going to do amazing things at Kleber, she said. You're going to change the world on your side of the Atlantic. I bet they passed up a thousand applicants to hire you. I'm going halfway around the world for an opportunity that you're creating for yourself here. She glanced over at the corporate big shots. Maybe. You did it, Tessa. His voice was as sure and steady as it was when he settled Calvin down. You're brilliant, and it's all going to happen. It will, she agreed, feeling it in her gut. It was a complicated feeling, not the unfettered joy she'd expected when they'd met their deadline. The last time she'd felt this kind of bitter sweetness was when Rachel had run away to Nashville. She'd recognized in the same moment that while she'd failed her sister utterly, her own future had just opened up. No matter what happened next at BBMJ, Helios would always be the reason she'd fallen in love with Ethan. She'd known it for a while now, that her feelings for him had spiraled far beyond friendship or even attraction. Bringing him here for Helios would mean her greatest professional triumph and her greatest private pain. But she couldn't keep Ethan from following his own dream the way she'd been able to here. As Mary waved her over, she gave Ethan one last smile. She hoped he knew that it meant, thank you and I love you. And from the smile he gave back, she almost thought he did. Then she squared her shoulders, took a deep breath, and strode toward Mary and the future, even if it shone a little less brightly now that Ethan wouldn't be in it. Chapter 18. Three Months Later Ethan's phone sounded with the FaceTime alert as he was leaving work for home, which could only mean Tessa at this time of day. California was nine hours behind, which meant that she'd be leaving home for work soon. They used to talk all the time in the mornings. It had started about a week after he'd landed in Zurich when he'd come home after his first full week at Kleiber and been so overcome with homesickness that he'd called her to see how she and Calvin were doing. They'd fallen into a pretty regular routine of calls, but mornings were hectic for her with the baby, so eventually they'd switch to calls during her lunch hour. And he'd quit pretending his calls were about seeing Calvin, who was nowhere in sight. But sometimes she called in the morning, and it was always Calvin-related. Hey, he said, answering when she smiled at him from the screen. What's up? You have to see this, she said, her eyes crinkling in a happy smile. Look! She turned the camera around so he could see Calvin sitting on her bedroom floor. He's doing it by himself. He tried for a few days and would sort of slump over, but he's totally doing it by himself. Good job, Calvin, he cheered. The kid is so smart. Well, Tessa said, dropping her voice, to be honest, every baby should be sitting up by seven months, and a lot of them do it before that but I'm really proud of him. Is he still eating like a champ? Yeah, I added sweet potatoes yesterday. He loves them. Bananas are going to blow his mind. Ethan listened as she chatted some more about the baby and everything he was up to. He kept his smile in place, but each new development felt like a tiny pinprick in his heart. He kept expecting this part to get better listening to everything that was happening in Tessa's life and being happy for her. Instead, every new thing made it worse. He'd hated not being able to help her prep for the first home visit with the social worker. He'd wanted to be there to lend a hand with the baby proofing and nursery painting. He hated not being there for her first court appearance when she was so nervous about what to say or to celebrate with her when the judge granted her legal guardianship. So far, they could only connect in the margins of their day, like now, before she left for work, or on her breaks now and then. He'd started getting up an hour and a half early in the mornings so he could talk to her at night before she went to sleep, 
lying and saying he was a morning person, so he didn't mind the early call even when he yawned his way through work until his second cup of coffee kicked in. Pretty great, right? she asked, and he realized he'd lost the thread of the conversation. It looked like she'd perched the phone on Calvin's changing table while she bustled around his nursery getting his diaper bag ready for the daycare center. Sorry, the connection glitched for a minute. What was that? Corporate greenlit Darius's new project. The whole house solar battery? He asked. He's really excited. Does he get a team for it? Is lab space going to get tight? No, that's the best part. They're giving him a new lab, so he's growing his team out the way we're growing this one. I'll miss working with him directly, but he'll just be one floor up. She'd kept him up to date on the new hires and intercompany transfers, as each one joined Helios. He hated it, though. Hearing about the new people, digging into the project to scale it up, felt exactly like it had when his parents had driven him past the home they'd lived in until he was in sixth grade, and they'd found it repainted with a new garage built onto it. It was changing a fundamental memory for him, and it made him itchy. Marcus has really run with it, Tessa was saying. He gets the sparkies whipped into shape so that Mary can stay on top of us gearheads. She'd mentioned this Marcus guy a few times now, and there was a different note in her voice each time she said his name that Ethan didn't hear when she said any of the others. There was an extra level of... admiration? He hoped it was only admiration, but he'd been growing increasingly nervous that it might be interest. That nervousness had been gnawing on his guts lately, and he wasn't sure he could stand it anymore. This Marcus guy sounds like he's been a real asset. Totally, she agreed. I can't tell you how much easier it makes life to have someone like him walk in and take charge of the electrical engineers. Someone like him. What did that even mean? Handsome? Capable? Both? He decided to ask. Do you like him? Yeah, I wasn't sure about getting an intercompany transfer for his position, but he's been great. He cleared his throat. I mean... Do you like him? He had her full attention now. She stopped packing long enough to stare at him directly. What kind of question is that? A really, really stupid one, but he didn't care. It was almost killing him not to know. The kind of question friends ask each other? She picked up the phone and sat in the glider he'd had delivered to her when she'd moved into a bigger condo and begun creating Calvin's nursery. You want to know who I'm dating? Sure. No, definitely not, but also yes. He didn't understand his own masochistic mind. A look of hurt crossed her face, and he wasn't sure why. It's not what he'd meant to do, but as he assessed the possible reasons it had bothered her, he could only come up with one— one that gave him a weird sense of hope. Should I not ask that? He pressed. She chewed on her bottom lip for a few seconds as she studied him, like she was trying to pick apart his brain with her gaze. He wondered how she would feel if she knew that every synopsis in it was on full alert every time they talked, or if he even just thought of her. He had it so, so bad. This was not homesickness. This was... I wouldn't want to know. Her statement interrupted his train of thought. Know what? I wouldn't want to know if you were dating someone else. You wouldn't? No, so never tell me. Okay. She chewed on her lip again. No, you should tell me, but not details. Just let me know. I'll need to know. Why would you need to know? So I could fix my brain. What does that even mean? It means... It means it needs some rewiring. He tried to hear the subtext. It sounded like she was saying she was jealous and had feelings for him, 
and she'd need to rewire all of those feelings if he were dating someone else. And Marcus is old, she said, startling him with the change of subject again. Like, 50? Maybe? I don't know. But not someone I date. That's weird. I need to go. Bye. She hung up abruptly, which wasn't how they usually did things. They did normal goodbyes. By now, he'd reached his station, but when he settled into the train car, instead of settling in to read as he usually did, he made another call. Hey, Mom. Hi, honey. How are the Alps? Still Alpine. Hey, I just talked to Tessa. Is she okay? Is something wrong with Calvin? I talked to her yesterday and everything was... She's fine, Mom. The baby, too. We just had a weird conversation, and I don't know what to think about it. All right, tell me. So he did, concluding with, I feel like I messed up, but I'm not sure how exactly. Why did you ask her if she was dating Marcus? Because I wanted to know. Because you have feelings for her. He didn't say anything, and she correctly took his silence as agreement. That girl is crazy about you. If she thought, wait, you think she's crazy about me? It was exactly what he'd hoped she would say. Can you hear how hard I'm rolling my eyes at you? She has been since the second I showed up on her doorstep, probably before that. But that's the first time I saw her for myself, so I can guarantee it was at least by then. I knew we had... Chemistry? Son, who taught you about hormones? Yes, you had chemistry. Have chemistry. Why else would you two be talking every single day? You don't even talk to me that much. Calvin. Calvin is a precious baby angel on this earth, but he has nothing to do with why you two can't leave each other alone, even with oceans and mountains between you. Mom, I messed up. She didn't even bother disagreeing. Damn right you did. And if you think it's only that phone call you just had with her, then you have not been paying attention. I have to go. You're going to call her back? That's good. No, actually. I need to make a different call. But I think I'm about to fix something big. Her eyes softened as she watched him from the screen. I better be the first call you make when you do. Of course, Mom. Although my intuition will just tell me. He groaned. Mom. It never lets me down. Then I guess I don't need to call and tell you anything. Ethan James Bedford, you had better. But he grinned at her and gave her a small wave as he ended the call. The person he most needed to speak to in the world was about to arrive at her desk any minute now and he planned to be the first order of business in her day. Chapter 19 All right, buddy, I'm going to take you to see Miss Becky, and we're going to have a great day, Tessa told Calvin as she buckled him into his car seat. He was fussy this morning, not his usual smiley self, but she hoped getting him to the daycare would settle him down. Finding the Little Stars child care program had been worth the CPS red tape all by itself. The social worker assigned to Calvin had pulled strings for Tessa to get him into the center within a week of Leslie leaving for Maryland after helping Tessa navigate her guardianship claim through CPS. Leslie had stayed two weeks after Ethan had left for Zurich just to make sure everything went smoothly for Tessa and Calvin, and it had. Calvin seemed happy enough to go to Miss Becky every morning, but then he was pretty happy with most people. He was a much different baby than when he'd arrived on her doorstep. Maybe that was a result of him being four months older, but she liked to believe that she had something to do with it. This morning, though, he was back to the fretful cries that had characterized his first month with her, often seeming to come on for no reason. Is it because Ethan didn't call again? She asked Calvin. Maybe it wasn't why he was bothered, but it really bugged her. 
Ethan's calls had been shorter lately, and this morning he hadn't answered when she'd tried him instead. He didn't owe her. She knew that. Maybe he was busy. Maybe he was losing interest in their lives as he settled into his own life in Zurich. But she missed him. And she suspected Calvin did too, even though their morning check-ins were always short and breezy. She drove Calvin to Little Stars and felt better when he stopped fussing and smiled at Miss Becky. But it confirmed her fear. He was missing one of his favorite people. Maybe it was time to talk to Ethan and tell him that it was better for Calvin if he didn't call anymore. The kid had endured more abandonment than anyone should before he could even talk. It meant confronting the reality that Ethan would probably fade from her life too with fewer phone calls, farther between, until he was gone altogether. A smarter woman would sever everything now, cut him off, wish him well, and throw herself into parenting and work until his absence didn't hurt so much. But in this one way, Tessa recognized that she was very, very dumb, because she would absolutely take every second she could get with him, even over 6,000 miles, nine time zones, and an entire ocean. Dumb, dumb, dumb. At BBMJ, she walked into the lab with a smile on her face, maybe to convince herself she was okay. Well, she walked into lab one, she corrected herself, as she noticed Darius's empty desk. She'd have to get used to calling it Lab 1 now that the second one was about to come online. They'd known it would be soon, but soon looked like it was today. Darius was packing up the last of his Ghostbuster figurines for his move to Lab 2, while two maintenance guys boxed up his computer. They found a project manager? Tessa asked. Huh? Um... He darted a look at Mary, like he was seeking her permission, who nodded. Yes. What was that all about? Darius had decided he didn't want the annoyance of managing a large team, preferring to be free to focus directly on the details. So the hunt had been on to find an appropriate project manager in his place. Everyone knew that, so why was he looking at Mary, like he didn't know if he could say anything? So today's the day, huh? I hate to see you go, but I'm happy for you. I wish you would have told us so I could have gotten you a cake or something. He ducked his head. That's why I didn't say anything. I don't want to fuss. I'm just a floor above you. It's not a big deal. That might have been true for her a year ago, but over the last several months, she felt the absence keenly when people she cared about moved on. Ethan. Leslie, now Darius. Still, she didn't want to make him feel any more awkward. So she smiled and said, You're right. I'll come up and visit Jane Holtzman every now and then. She loved the brainiac gadget queen from the Ghostbusters reboot. You don't have to. He handed the Holtzman figurine to her. I'll come down and visit her. Tessa accepted it with the reverence the gesture deserved holding Holtzman gently in her palm. She wouldn't insult him by protesting. Thank you, Darius. I'll make sure she's in a good spot. Good. And then with a nod at Sanjay and Mary, Darius followed the maintenance guys to the elevator and disappeared. Lab One had been changing weekly for two months. Baby Quad was gone, overtaken with desks, eight new transfers from other divisions and rechristened Think Quad. Actually, it didn't really make sense to call them quads anymore because Think Quad took up almost half the room now, and that was just bad math and poor naming. Her unsettled feeling grew. She hated changes in routine. First, no call from Ethan, now Darius leaving. She needed to get a grip. And the best way to get over her irritation was to jump into work. She took her seat, settled Jane Holtzman into prime real estate on her desk, pulled up her latest report on cadmium sourcing, and dove in. Around 10 a.m., the elevator dinged, and Tessa glanced up startled. 
Normally, there wasn't much coming or going until lunch. That's for you, Mary said, a split second before the door slid open. Ethan stepped out, his eyes going straight to her. Hi. She half rose, sat back down, then finally stood. Ethan? But of course it was Ethan, tall as ever, shoulders as broad as ever, smile as sweet as ever, but also more mischievous than she'd ever seen it. What are you doing here? she asked. She turned to Mary. What is he doing here? Mary only winked and leaned back in her chair like she was ready for a show. I work here. You what? Her eyes fell to the belt loop where he'd always clipped his work badge. And there it was, complete with the green stripe across the top they'd all gotten, indicating that they belonged to the new clean energy division. What's going on? She was paralyzed by conflicting emotions. Confusion, definitely. But also a strong desire to fling herself at him and kiss his stupid, wonderful face. Maybe we could talk in the break room, he suggested. Nah, Mary interjected. You've got the day off, Tessa, and you're not officially starting until tomorrow, are you, Ethan? You knew about this? How long? Tessa asked. Since he called me a month ago asking if there was room on Darius's team for him, it was a no-brainer to hire him back. I called her the morning Calvin sat up. It just took a while to get everything in place, Ethan said. But what about Kleber? Tessa turned to Ethan in a daze, completely unable to put the pieces together. As much as we'd all love to hear the answers, maybe you should take advantage of your day off and have this conversation elsewhere, Mary suggested. And Tessa suddenly felt the weight of a dozen gazes as everyone else in the lab watched them. Right. She grabbed her work bag and headed toward the elevator. Ethan followed behind her without a word, and when the doors slid closed, he turned toward her, an apology written all over his face. I think I miss Cal. Before he could finish, she did exactly what she'd wanted to the second he'd stepped into the lab and threw herself at him her arms wrapping tight around his neck until his own came around her waist and he pulled her close, neither of them speaking. She held on and rested her head against his chest. Right over his heart, which thumped with a strong, steady beat beneath her cheek. She let him go when the doors dinged again, and they stepped out into the reception area in silence. But when they exited the building, he slid his hand around hers and she let her fingers lace between his. They hadn't held hands before, she realized. It was strange to think that she was madly in love with this man, and they'd never shared even this simple intimacy. I'm so glad I'm home, he said. Not quite. Um, I guess I should drive since I'll need the car seat later. Where am I taking you? Are you moved in yet? Should we go to my place? It was the least important of the hundred questions she wanted to ask him, but they crowded out anyway, her mind still buzzing too loudly to figure out how to ask them in an orderly way. I moved back into my same unit. I never let the lease lapse. You didn't? He shook his head, and she added a new question to her list. Why not? She decided to use the drive home to think through everything she was wondering. My car is over there, she said, pointing in the right direction. It's okay, I can drive, and I have a car seat. She only had one question, she realized, as they reached the parking lot and stopped beside a Tesla sedan. With a new car seat installed in the back. The most important question. Why did you come back? Instead of answering, he turned to face her letting go of her hand to run a finger across her cheek, the bridge of her nose, her lips, studying her as intently as she'd ever seen him study a schematic. How's Calvin? he asked. She blinked at him, not expecting the question. Calvin? He's fine. 
at daycare, but why? She trailed off when he shook his head softly. He's good? He's great. I mean, you've seen him almost every day until recently. Sorry about that. It was hectic trying to get everything ready to move back, and then I flew all day yesterday. Did he miss me? He looked worried, not like he wanted his ego appeased. She nodded. He did. But he's still doing fine? Yes. Is it really hard, doing this by yourself? Yes, but I have more resources than I expected to. Darius and Sanjay babysat for me on Saturday night so I could eat out and catch a movie. By myself, she added when his face fell. Sounds busy, he said. Exhausting, but somehow okay. Do you think you have the room and energy for another guy in your life? Permanently? He watched her, his eyes intent and hopeful and worried all at once. Is that why you're here? For Calvin? He shook his head. He's a bonus, but I came back for you, Tessa. I never should have left. I think I fell half in love with you in college, but it took me about a day to fall the rest of the way when I saw you again. Everything I could ever want is right here. A job as good as the one I left at Kleber, the sweetest baby in the world, a time difference that doesn't drive my mother crazy. But even if the only thing I had here was you, it would still be everything I ever wanted. He slid his arms around her waist and lowered his head to hers. She answered with a kiss that said everything she'd ever wanted to, and he answered in kind, his mouth hungry and sweet. She slid her arms up higher, desperate to pull him closer, hold him tighter, and he responded with a soft groan and deepened the kiss. Everything around her contracted to that moment, and she existed only where they touched the heat flooding her veins with a honey warmth that had her leaning against him for support. Tessa, he said, lifting his mouth from hers, and she murmured a wordless objection and sought it out again. Tessa, he said with a smile in his voice, I think we have an audience. She looked over her shoulder where a small group of people stood in front of the building A doors. Marius giving Sanjay a happy hug and Darius high-fiving a half-dozen people she didn't recognize. She quickly stepped back. This is slightly mortifying. They don't seem to mind. I guess that's one way to meet my new team. Your new team? Meet their new project manager. She stepped back and waved toward the car. Let's go. You have a lot to tell me. He smiled and opened her door for her, but she caught his wrist before he could close it again. I have one big thing to tell you first, she said, smiling up at him. I love you, Ethan Bedford. And when he leaned down to kiss her senseless again, she didn't mind in the least when more cheers broke out. Epilogue Ethan sat against his living room wall and settled Calvin between his outstretched legs. You can do this, he said. Go see Tessa. Tessa sat on the other side of the room. Is your phone ready? Leslie will kill us if she misses this. It's ready. He kept one hand beneath Calvin's arm and held up his phone with the other. Let's do this. Come here, buddy. Tessa called to Calvin, come see Auntie, walk to Auntie. Ethan let go, and Calvin bounced in place a couple of times. That's a good happy dance, buddy. Now walk over to Auntie and dance. Come on, little C, come see me. She stretched her arms wide, ready to give him one of the dozen hugs she gave him daily. Tessa's phone began to buzz, and she ignored it. Calvin took a step forward, then another, and when he was still standing instead of plopping on his diapered bottom as usual, he took a few more. Six, seven, eight. Ethan counted for his mom's benefit on the video. That's his record. Nine, he's going to do it. Come on, Calvin, I've got you. 
Auntie's got you. His little legs picked up some speed as Calvin got closer to his favorite person, and Ethan was ready to call it. He's officially walking. Yay, baby! Tessa cheered as she scooped him into a hug. You are the smartest, best-walking baby in the world. Her phone quit buzzing, and Ethan wondered if she'd even noticed in the excitement. Ethan grinned. At 15 months, Calvin was well behind the average age for walking. But the pediatrician had reassured Tessa that lots of kids didn't walk until 16 or 17 months. His mom had told them that his brother hadn't walked until 15 months either. He stopped the recording and crawled over to scoop them both into a hug, dropping a kiss on each of their heads. Go, Team Fuller! Tessa's phone rang again, and this time she wiggled her arm out of his embrace to scoop it up. Then she froze, before scrambling out of his arms completely, leaving him with Calvin patting his cheeks and babbling. T.T. His version of auntie. It's Rachel, she said. He froze too, and they both stared at it like it was a scorpion ready to strike. The phone stopped ringing, and Tessa met his eyes, hers full of fear. What do I do? He didn't know. All he could feel was an overwhelming urge to snatch the phone from her hand and chuck it into the wall with enough force to obliterate it. Before he could answer, it vibrated again with another incoming call from Rachel. He took a deep breath. I think you have to answer it. She stared at it as it rang two more times. Then she pressed the answer button. Hello? He watched her carefully as she listened and shot him another glance. This one both worried and confused. I'll be right there, she said and hung up. She's at my house again. Do you want me to come with you? He asked, already climbing to his feet with Calvin. She shook her head. No, let me see what she wants. I'll call you in a little while. For the next 15 minutes, he played with Calvin on the floor and tried not to go out of his mind. What was going on over there? A few times, he couldn't help picking up the toddler and hugging him. A sense of fear deeper than anything he'd ever known gripping him until each time Calvin patted his cheek or shoulder and said, Tintin! which was the closest he'd gotten to Ethan's name so far. Finally, a text came in from Tessa. Everything is fine. Come over and meet my sister. Ethan walked over with Calvin on his shoulders, the toddler's favorite way to travel. Normally, Ethan loved it too, but now every footstep felt so heavy. What was he walking into? What was he walking Calvin into? Only his faith in Tessa kept him moving forward. He shifted Calvin into his arms when he reached her door and walked in without knocking the way he had for months now. Tessa was perched on the sofa arm waiting for him and smiled when he walked in. A young woman sitting with a death grip on the armchair fixed Calvin with an apprehensive stare. Meet Rachel, Tessa said. Rachel, this is Ethan. Hi, he said. He didn't really understand the vibe in the room, so he shot Tessa a questioning glance before asking Rachel, Do you want to hold him? No, I just wanted to see him. Calvin didn't even glance her way, and part of Ethan was secretly pleased that Calvin didn't seem to recognize her. But the better part of him ached for Rachel in a way he couldn't explain given how angry he'd been for Calvin when she first left him behind. So, what's going on? He tried for a casual note, but it was a loaded question. Rachel, Tessa started, and then her voice grew thick and she quit talking for a moment. I asked her to adopt him, Rachel said. She'd relaxed her grip on the chair and even leaned back a little keeping her eyes on Calvin the whole time. She was dressed casually in jeans and a blouse, but neatly. 
her hair well-brushed and her skin clear and healthy-looking. He'd always somehow imagined her as emaciated and drawn. Adoption? His eyes flew to Tessa. She nodded, still speechless, but a growing smile was taking over her face as she reached for Calvin, who went to her with a cheerful, T.T. and more cheek patting. I needed to see him to make sure I was doing the right thing, Rachel said, reaching for the purse beside her on the floor. She withdrew a folder and set it on the coffee table. These are the termination papers for my parental rights. They're already notarized. If you file them with family court, you should have no problems. I did a lot of research to make sure. This is... Ethan trailed off, not sure what to say. But even more sure, it wasn't his place to say anything at all. I said yes, Tessa told him. I said it really loud. Yes, yes, yes. She punctuated each one with a kiss on Calvin's cheek. Rachel rose. Thank you. It wasn't fair for me to drop him on you like that. But I just didn't know what else to do. If you need me for anything with the paperwork, just call. She gathered her purse like she was going to leave. You don't have to leave, Tessa said. Stay. There's a lot to talk about. Rachel shook her head. There's not. Not really. I don't feel toward him like a mother should. Once I left him, I slowly started to realize I had postpartum depression, and I thought I would feel differently when my hormones got back to normal, that I'd want to come back for him. She sighed. My mind is clearer now. I got an antidepressant that helped, and I'm working as a desk clerk at a big hotel in Vegas. I'm even starting the management trainee program next month. The pride was clear in her voice. But I'm also positive that I don't want to be a mother. Seeing him only makes me sure of that. I see you with him, and it seems like this is how it always should have been, Tessa. It's the only thing that keeps me from hating myself. I don't know how I can love him so much and still be so sure that this is what I want, but I am. More sure than I've ever been, of anything. But that doesn't mean I'm not sad. I think I'd rather go, but I promise, if you call, I'll answer. I won't ghost you again. She stopped by Calvin and dropped a soft kiss on his head. Bye, baby. You have the best mama now. Then she brushed past Ethan, wiping a tear from her eye and slipping out the door without looking back. Ethan looked back at Tessa, who had her face buried in Calvin's neck her arms wrapped around him so tightly that he gave a short squeal and began to squirm. Wow, Ethan said, and Tessa relaxed her grip on the baby and smiled at Ethan. I know. You ready for this? Not at all, but maybe nobody is. All I know is that this is the happiest I've ever been, and I'm trying not to feel guilty about it because that feels really selfish. There is nothing selfish about adopting a baby, Ethan said. Your sister sounds like she's in a good place to make this decision. You guys will have some details to work out about how much you tell Calvin and when, but she sounds like she's ready to have those conversations whenever you are. His phone buzzed and he pulled it out to glance at the screen, then stared at her, torn between laughing and groaning. It's my mom. She grinned at him and said, ESP, at the same time as he did, which made them both laugh. Go ahead and tell her, she said. In a minute, I need to grab something. I'll be right back. He raced back to his house, made a pit stop at his nightstand, and ran back to Tessa's place, where he found her dancing around the living room with Calvin, singing, Mommy and Calvin sitting in a tree. H-U-G-G-I-N-G forever. May I join this dance? He asked. Tessa answered by opening her hug to include him, and Ethan settled his arms around both of them and waltzed them around the room as Tessa hummed and Ethan laughed at Calvin's drooly grin. I think this is our first dance, he said over her humming. She stopped, paused, 
It can't be, is it? It is. So that makes this our song. What was it again? She nudged them all back into their waltz. Mommy and Calvin sitting in a tree. H-U-G-G-I-N-G forever. Is there room for a daddy in that equation? He asked quietly. What? She asked, stopping and giving him a confused smile. Calvin patted her cheek. I asked if there's room for a daddy in that equation, he repeated. Her smile faded, and he had her full attention now. He walked over to them and got down on one knee, pulling the ring box he'd been holding onto for the last two months from his pocket. Tessa and Calvin Fuller, will you marry me? Tessa's mouth dropped open. Calvin clapped. Titi, Tintin! Tessa gave a slow shake of her head, and Ethan's heart stuttered. No, Calvin. Mama. Then she knelt in front of Ethan and pressed a kiss against his lips. And Daddy.